Max. The Dukedom's Secret Series Book 3, written by Edith Bird and published by Starfall Publications, available on Amazon and free with Kindle Unlimited. Enjoy. Chapter 1 London, England, 1816. And you're certain it was Lady Sandra Allington you saw with the stable hand, Lily said, holding her quill poised as the maid nodded. That's right, miss. I knew it was her. I've seen her in the mews before. She always wears red. I think it's their sign. He came straight out and beckoned her into the stable with him, the maid replied. Lily smiled. This would make a tantalising story for her readers and be worth enough to keep her in new dresses and fine living for a month. She scribbled down the details in her pocketbook, nodding as the maid continued to divulge the unfolding scandal of one of London's richest bells and a stable hand who worked in the stables of the Duke of Bicester. And you saw her come out, did you? Lily asked. The maid, whose name was Ellen, shook her head. That's the thing, miss. She stays the whole night, right there in the stables, the two of them together. It's wicked, she said, even as she left no detail of what she had seen untold. Are you certain? They sleep there in the stable, Lily exclaimed, her eyes growing wide with delight at the thought of the slanderous things she could write about Lady Sandra Allington. Lily was always interested in scandal. She made it her business to be. It was her business. Her days were spent collecting titbits of gossip, salacious stories about dukes and duchesses, earls and countesses, and even princes and princesses. Her sources were numerous, a network of maids, footmen, grooms and carriage drivers. Lily would pay them handsomely for whatever information they could provide her with, and she, in turn, would write it into the scandal sheets for the various editors who were willing to pay large sums for the downfall of aristocratic men and women. My bedroom looks out onto the mews, miss, and I can hear the gate being opened. It squeaks terribly. I saw her go in, and it wasn't until the early hours I heard the gate squeak again, long before the other stable hands came to see to the horses, the maid said, looking pleased with herself. They were meeting in a coffee house, Sloanes of Mayfair, and it was here Lily conducted much of her business. She was always discreet and few knew her true identity. She used false names, played her informants off against one another, and was always careful to give just as much information as was necessary so as not to divulge her sources. Poor Lady Sandra, or rather poor Lord Frederick. He's going to be quite upset when he reads about his betrothed's infidelity, Lily said, shaking her head as she closed her notebook. You'll ruin her then, miss? Ellen asked. She had a glint in her eye and it was clear she had relished this opportunity for revenge. That was often the reason information came Lily's way, a dismissed lady's maid, a scolded footman, a carriage driver made to wait in the rain. There were many reasons why Lily's informants did as they did, but Lily's own purposes were purely financial. She did not care whether her words were enough to break the betrothal between Lady Sandra and Lord Frederick, and blackmail was never something she engaged in. Lily wrote facts, and if the facts were harmful to those to whom they related, so be it. I won't publish immediately. I need something else. Keep an eye on the muse, see who comes and goes. I'd not be surprised if she'd told her friends about the stable hand's services, Lily said, smiling, as the maid nodded. In Lily's experience, where one scandal lay, others were waiting to be unearthed. A woman like Lady Sandra would not wish to share her prize, but men were fickle, and if the stable hand could boast of one aristocratic conquest, he could surely boast of others too. I'll keep watch, miss, but I'd need further compensation, Ellen said, and Lily smiled. She reached into the pocket of her dress and took out her purse. Everyone had their price, and Lily was fortunate in being able to offer considerable incentives for the rendering of her informant's services. She held out ten shillings and Ellen's eyes grew wide. Will that be enough? I want you to keep watch, Ellen. Tell me every coming and going. Record how many times Lady Sandra makes her nighttime rendezvous with the stable hand, but watch for other young ladies too. There's bound to be some. I'm going to keep an eye on Lord Frederick too. 
Perhaps Lady Sandra isn't the only one of the pair to be otherwise engaged, she said. The maid smiled, taking the ten shillings and rising to her feet. I'll return at the same time next week, miss. You won't be disappointed, I promise you, she said. And nodding to Lily, she hurried out of the coffee house. Lily smiled, writing the last of the details in her pocketbook and beginning to compose the opening sentences of her next scandal page. Lady Sarah Allington and the stable hand know the lady amidst the horses. Or perhaps an equine scandal, she thought to herself, finishing the last of her coffee and collecting her things together. The afternoon was drawing on and Lily had everything she needed to begin composing her next piece. Ellen would add further details next week and the piece would be worth anything up to ten pounds, enough for Lily's expenses and to help her father in prison. Poor father, he's been treated so unjustly, she thought to herself as she paid for the coffee and stepped out onto the bustling street outside. Her father was in prison, sent there over a dispute at a gentleman's club involving the fixing of cards and dice. He had always protested his innocence, and Lily knew the aristocracy had been responsible for his downfall. They had conspired against him, the gentleman of the club, and because her father was a good and noble man, he had taken the punishment others deserved. It was for this reason, amongst others, Lily wrote her scandal pages. She wanted to take revenge on the society responsible for her father's downfall, and she had brought about the ruin of many men and women, whose secrets she aired in the pages of the penny periodicals in which her work was published. But enough for today, I've got everything I need. Lily said to herself as she hailed a carriage to take her home. Lily lived with her mother in a house close to St Paul's. They lived a comfortable life, thanks in no small part to Lily's earnings. Her parents were separated, and Lily's mother had nothing to do with her father, blaming him for so many of her woes. Lily found herself in the middle of their dispute, but she had always sided with her father, much to her mother's discontent. But there was little her mother could do or say about it, given her reliance on Lily for the roof over her head and the food on her table. I don't like you writing those awful gossip pages, she would say. But Lily would merely shrug and wave her hand dismissively. It was not easy for a woman to earn a living through independent means. A novel might be written, or a painting sold. But a woman was so often dependent on a man, and given Lily had no intention of marrying, this was not an option. She had fallen into her current occupation quite by chance, a stray word from a lady's maid about her mistress's affair with a count from Florence having given her the idea of writing about it. But now she could not imagine doing anything else. And why shouldn't I? She thought to herself, relieved to have some way of making money as the carriage pulled up outside the home she shared with her mother. Having paid the carriage driver, Lily made her way up the steps and let herself in. It was early summer, and the hallway was pleasantly cool. She was met by the maid, Jar, a young girl of just fourteen whom Lily's mother had taken sympathy on after her own mother had died, who took her coat and informed Lily her mother was in the drawing room. I'll have some tea, Jean, Lily said, and the maid bobbed into a curtsy as Lily made her way through the hallway to the drawing room. Her mother was sitting by the window reading, and she looked up at Lily, raising her eyebrows, as Lily took out her pocketbook and went to the writing desk in the corner of the room. Must you write those awful pages in here? she asked, without so much as a greeting. Those awful pages ensure we've got a roof over our head and food on the table, mother. What else am I meant to do? Lily replied, shaking her head. It was always the same. Her mother did not seem to understand the precarious nature of their position. With her father unjustly imprisoned, they could not rely on any man to provide for them. Lily had wanted only to be a dutiful daughter, and she was determined to do whatever it took to ensure she provided not only for herself, but for her father too. It's not nice, Lily. I worry about you, travelling all over London to gain your information. And what happens if you're discovered to be the one writing all these dreadful things, her mother said, shaking her head. But I won't be. No one ever connects my name with any of the things I write. I'm careful about it, mother, Lily replied, 
taking a piece of paper and dipping her quill into the inkstand. Careful, I'd call it devious. You're becoming more and more like your father every day, Lily's mother replied. This was always her trump card. Lily's mother liked to play the victim. She had married Lily's father when she was young, but the marriage had not been a happy one. I regret the day I ever married you, Lily had once heard her mother shout, and her father had retorted in kind. And I regret it too, Emily, he had exclaimed. Who was in the wrong and who was in the right was a matter of debate. Lily's father was often absent, away on business or with friends, and Lily had grown up hearing her mother lament his absence and curse him for leaving them destitute. But Lily's father told a different story. Her mother was a drinker and could even be violent. She spent the money he gave her on gin and was often drunk, making her intolerable company. That's why I was always away. I wanted to take you with me, but it just wasn't possible, Lily's father had explained, and in this atmosphere of division, Lily had felt torn between the two. Her mother was still a drinker, secreting gin around the house, and when she was drunk, which she often was, she would throw things and rant and rage about Lily's father. He drove me to this, he did this to me, she would say, and Lily would retreat to the safety of her bedroom, locking the door and writing her next scandal sheet. This was how they lived. But as time went on, Lily had come to favour her father over her mother, siding with his explanation of what her mother was like. She was determined to see her father freed from prison. And until that day came, she would continue to take revenge on the society responsible for his incarceration. You can't trust any of them, Lily, and you owe them nothing. They'd spit on you if they passed you in the street. I should know. I've spent my whole life around such people. They're treacherous, self-serving, and concerned only with their own interests, Lily's father had said, shaking his head angrily. Lily knew her father had been badly treated in the past. He had been the land agent for a duke, a wicked man who had made his life a misery, and his imprisonment now was the result of just such aristocratic arrogance. The nobility were all the same, and Lily despised just like her father. I'm more than happy to be like my father, mother. What's the alternative? Lily replied, and her mother scowled. He lies to you. He lied to me, and he's lying to you too. I know what he's really like, and I can see the same in you. I don't want you to be like him, Lily, making a business from ruining other people's lives, her mother said. But Lily had heard enough. It was not she who ruined the lives of those she wrote about. They had already done so by their actions. Lily was always careful to check her facts, and she never published anything without a corroborating source. As far as she was concerned, those involved had brought it on themselves. They were responsible for their own downfall, and if the fact brought it about, so be it. My father didn't ruin anyone's life. They ruined his, Lily retorted, even as her mother rose to her feet, her face flushed red with anger. She threw her book across the room and pulled out a handkerchief, dabbing at the tears running down her cheeks. Oh, Lily, can't you see what he's done to you? the same as he's done to so many others, too. It's not true. None of it's true. He tells lies. He manipulates. He's driven me mad. Quite mad, she said. You're drunk, mother. Go to bed and leave me alone. I've got writing to do. Or would you prefer it if we lived on the streets? Then where would you get your gin from? Lily said. Her mother fell silent, shaking her head as she left the room in tears. Lily sighed and dipped her quill into the inkstand. She would write up her notes from the day, the beginnings of her scandal sheet now forming in her mind. But first, she wrote to her father, just as she did every day. Her mother was wrong about him, and Lily trusted him implicitly. He had never lied to her, and she was certain he never would. My dear father, what a day it has been, she began, writing down the details of the things she had discovered and asking her father's advice as to how best to proceed with the information she had learned. Her father always knew the best way to use whatever she had come to know, and there were times he advised her to hold back on publication, waiting for just the right moment to strike. I'll see them all ruined, all of them, Lily thought to herself, knowing the price of her information was high. 
But as she finished writing to her father, Lily could not help but wonder what the future held, knowing the true prize still lay ahead. The Duke of Lancaster, she said to herself, knowing it was he her father wanted revenge on and feeling determined to see it wrought. Chapter 2 Lancashire, England, 1816 Be quiet! We'll wake the whole household! Maximilian hissed as he fumbled for the key in his pocket. It was late at night, and the full moon above cast a silvery light over the forecourt of Burnley Abbey. Maximilian found the key in his pocket, his young companion standing giggling at the bottom of the steps. Am I really to be allowed into the house? I've always wondered what it's like. Could I be the Duchess? she said, as Maximilian was still fumbling with the lock. Oh yes, you can be the Duchess of Lancaster one day, as long as you kiss me very nicely. But keep your voice down, we don't want to get caught, do we? he said, finally finding the lock and turning the key with a grating noise. The sound echoed in the still night air, and the door creaked open as Maximilian almost fell through it. He had been drinking for most of the day in the village inn, and Elsie, or was it Clara, had kept him company. It's so dark. I can hardly see a thing, she said, following Maximilian into the hallway. Maximilian was used to navigating the house at night. Even in his drunken state, he knew to step over the third stair on the staircase to avoid its creak, and that the butler, Mr. Gregson, never retired before midnight. Take my hand and watch out for the table in the middle of the hallway, Maximilian said, reaching out in the darkness but finding only empty space. Where are you? Elsie or Clara said for with the door closed, the hallway was plunged into darkness. Wait there, I'm coming back, Maximilian replied, but as he stepped back he stumbled, falling into a suit of armour, one of three displayed in the hallway. The crash was enough to wake the dead, and Maximilian found himself sprawled on the floor, struggling to regain his feet. The girl screamed, a piercing scream echoing around the hallway. What's happened? she exclaimed, as footsteps now came hurrying on the landing above, and the light of a candle appeared from the door leading to the stairs down to the servants' hall. Who's down there? came a voice from above. It was Maximilian's father, Ralph, the Duke of Lancaster, and now the face of Mr. Gregson loomed over Maximilian, peering down at him with a look of disdain. Lord Maximilian, your grace, he said, as a cry of exasperation came from above. Get off me, Gregson, I'm quite all right. I just fell, that's all, these stupid suits of armour. Maximilian exclaimed, stumbling to his feet as the butler held his candle aloft. The light illuminated the figure of Elsie, or was it Clara? And now the butler raised his eyebrows as the Duke himself came hurrying down the stairs. He was dressed in his nightgown and he glared angrily at Maximilian who stood sheepishly in front of him. What's the meaning of this? Where have you been, drinking? I can smell it on you. And who's this? The Duke demanded, turning to the girl who looked terrified. Elsie Greenwood, Maximilian muttered. He was sobering up now, angry at having been caught and angry at being treated like a child. He was twenty-two years old, and yet his father treated him as though he had not yet reached any kind of maturity. Clara Greenwood, the girl said fixing Maximilian with an angry glare. From the village, I suppose. Well, you're not the first, the Duke said, and Maximilian scowled. Clara looked indignant. He told me he'd never invited any woman to the Abbey. I was the first. I was going to be the Duchess, she exclaimed. The only thing you'll be, Clara, is disappointed. Now I suggest Mr. Gregson sends for one of the footmen. He can walk you home. As for you, Maximilian, get to bed. We'll talk about this matter in the morning, the Duke said. Maximilian had no grounds for protests, and as the butler led Clara away, he stalked upstairs, ignoring his father's further words about his rakish behaviour. I don't care, he exclaimed, rounding on the Duke, who had followed him to his bedroom door. If you want to inherit the dukedom, you'd better start caring, Maximilian. You're behaving like, like the worst kind of man, Ralph said, shaking his head. 
Maximilian did not reply, opening his bedroom door and stepping into the darkness. He slammed it behind him, leaning heavily back and sighing. It was always the same. His father was disappointed in him, and he would go on being disappointed in him, whatever Maximilian did to try to make amends. Just because I'm nothing like William, Maximilian said to himself, as he lay fully clothed on the bed, his mind racing, unable to sleep, and wondering what the morning would bring. Maximilian slept late the next morning. He had no desire for the inevitable confrontation with his father, and it was only when a gentle tapping came at his door, after he the clock had struck the eleventh hour, he summoned the strength to move. I don't want any tea, go away, he called out, groaning as he sat up on the side of the bed. He assumed it was a maid, but the voice of his mother, Miriam, the Duchess, now came from the corridor. Maximilian, your father wants to speak to you, but I thought you might like to speak to me first. Can I come in? she asked. Maximilian sighed. Whilst he and his father existed in a perpetual state of opposition, his relationship with his mother was less strained. He got up and went to the door, opening it to find his mother standing outside. She was a pretty creature, with long auburn hair and bright green eyes, similar to Maximilian himself. She smiled at him, rolling her eyes and sighing. I don't want to speak to him, Maximilian said, as he stepped back to allow his mother to enter his bedroom. It was messy, his clothes strewn over the floor and open books and papers lying on the table. The bed was unmade and only one of the curtains was drawn. I heard all about your antics of last night. What were you thinking, bringing a girl from the village here? Can you imagine if word got out, the Duchess said, shaking her head. I don't care. I've brought plenty of girls from the village here, Maximilian retorted. His mother's eyes grew wide, but she made no immediate reply, crossing to the window and pulling back the other curtain. You can't go on like this, Maximilian. Your father's at his wit's end. We're worried about you. You get drunk, you neglect your responsibilities, you do nothing to make amends for your behaviour. What's going to become of you? she said. Maximilian threw himself back onto the bed with a sigh. He had no interest in responsibilities. His father already considered him a lost cause, and Maximilian was not about to make any effort to change. He was happy enough, or so he told himself. I'm going to inherit the dukedom from my father. Isn't that what's going to happen to me? I thought that was the point of hereditary titles. It doesn't matter what I do. It's mine because of birth. I don't care, he said as his mother came to sit on the bed next to him. But I care, Maximilian. I care about my son, and I fear for the future. I'm worried about you, and I want you to be happy, but I can't imagine you are, not living like this. Where's your passion? she said. Maximilian did not like it when his mother used such tactics on him. His father would be angry with him. He would shout at him and Maximilian would shout back. But it was different with his mother. She was more subtle and would speak instead of disappointment rather than anger. Maximilian did not like to think of her as being disappointed in him, and he sat up and sighed. Mother, I... I don't know what I'm expected to do. I know how it's going to be. I'll go downstairs, we'll shout at one another, and my father will end by telling me I'm a disappointment because I'm nothing like William. Maximilian said. His cousin William was, according to the Duke, everything Maximilian was not. He had proved himself as the Baron of Mowbray, a worthy inheritor of the title the Duke had bought him as a safeguard for his future. William was married to Anne, and she had just given birth to a baby boy, whose name was Jacob. William was hard-working and diligent. He had come from nothing, and discovered himself to be the son of Maximilian's uncle, the deceased Duke of Lancaster, after whom Maximilian was named. The relationship of the two cousins was not widely known. William was the Duke's godson, and it was said he had favoured him with the barony because of this. In their youth, Maximilian and William had not seen eye to eye. They had often been at odds. But their relationship had mellowed in recent months, and Maximilian now counted William as a friend albeit one his father often compared him to. 
That's not what he thinks, Maximilian. Your father loves you, and he wants what's best for you. As do I, the Duchess replied, but Maximilian shook his head. He knew his father had always favoured William. The Duke felt a particular affinity towards his nephew, one he had expressed in the education he had provided him with and shown in his gift of the barony. Maximilian felt second best and often compared himself to his cousin. It was for this reason, amongst others, Maximilian indulged his rakish behaviour. He had no intention of changing now, and his father would simply have to get used to it. To be left alone, that's what's best for me, mother. I'm going to the garden. I'll get some peace there at least, Maximilian replied, rising to his feet, as his mother sighed. Won't you speak to your father? He wants to help you, Maximilian, she said. But Maximilian shook his head. He wants to shout at me, mother. If it wasn't about this, it would be about something else. It's the only thing he knows, Maximilian retorted. He had not bothered to undress before bed, and now he left his bedroom, making his way along the corridor to the landing and down the stairs to the hallway. He was making for the rose garden, his one solace in an otherwise miserable existence. Maximilian loved the rose garden and tended it with great care. He had cultivated all manner of different varieties and found a sense of peace and solitude amongst the blooms. But as he crossed the hallway, the door of his father's study opened and the Duke appeared, beckoning Maximilian inside. I want to talk to you, he said. The words were not an invitation, but Maximilian shook his head. I don't want to talk to you. We'll only argue, you know that, he said. But to Maximilian's surprise, his cousin now appeared at the study door. William smiled at Maximilian, shaking his head as he did so. Have you recovered from last night? he asked. Maximilian knew what they were doing. This was a three-pronged attack. His mother's weep-on had been to use an air of disappointment, his father's would be anger, and William's would be understanding. There was nothing to recover from, Maximilian replied. He was more than able to handle his drink and would gladly have returned to the village in that very moment if it meant escaping from his father and cousin. There was everything to recover from. You disgraced yourself, Maximilian, the Duke exclaimed, but William now stepped forward. If I may. Perhaps Maximilian and I should spend some time together, he said, fixing his gaze on Maximilian, who shrugged. Don't we do so already? he replied. William had been appointed as the land agent and rarely went by when he was not present at Burnley Abbey, advising the Duke or discussing some matter of business. Maximilian's father insisted Maximilian take part in these meetings, but the pair rarely saw eye to eye, and William was often the arbiter of disputes between the two. We do, but not in the way you might benefit from, William replied. Maximilian laughed. And how might I benefit, cousin? I spend my time drinking and carousing. Isn't that true, father? I doubt you'd wish to lower yourself in such a way, Maximilian replied. His cousin smiled. There are different ways of drinking and carousing, cousin. Some are more respectable than others. We could go to one of the gentlemen's clubs in Lancaster. There are several, as I'm sure you know. We could talk, William said. Maximilian glanced at his father. He wondered whether this tactic was to prove an alternative to the usual angry outburst. Was his father giving him a chance? What about? Maximilian replied. About your future, Maximilian. You'll be the Duke of Lancaster one day. Don't you realise the responsibilities that brings? The Duke exclaimed, throwing up his hands in exasperation. Maximilian did know the responsibilities his future title brought. He saw them express it each day, and he knew his father took his role seriously, even as it should never have been his. The death of Maximilian's namesake had brought with it a seismic change, and had the previous duke not died, it would have been William who would have inherited the title. And perhaps he's better suited to it than me, Maximilian thought to himself. But he knew William was only trying to help, and he nodded. We could make a day of it, just the two of us. Luncheon, a walk, and then some drinks. No rakish behaviour. 
William said, and Maximilian smiled weakly. Very well, since I'm to get no peace, unless I agree, we can talk, but I won't promise anything, and I don't know what you intend to achieve by talking, he said, as his father sighed. Thank you, William. You've managed to talk some sense into him, the Duke said. But Maximilian was not about to have anyone talk their version of sense to him. His behaviour was as he desired it, and not according to anyone else. He would talk with William, but it would not change anything. Maximilian was a rake. Society described him as such, and his reputation preceded him. We'll go to Lancaster tomorrow, Maximilian, William said, and Maximilian nodded. Very well, but for now I'm going to tend to my roses. I'm sure you can't find anything wrong with that, can you? He said, and turning on his heels he marched off across the hallway, determined not to be changed by anyone. Chapter 3 Lady Sandra Allington, whose stable will she find herself in? A passion for horses or a passion for the stable hands? Lily concluded, reading over her words and feeling pleased with her latest scandal sheet. She had met the maid Ellen again at Sloane's of Mayfair, and been furnished with further particulars of Lady Sandra's illicit activities. It seemed another woman was involved too, and the maid had seen several well-known young men of the aristocracy entering the mews at night. Lily had written two pages on the matter, and was now on her way to deliver the final copy to the editor for whom she wrote, and who paid her. He'll be very pleased with this she told herself, as she left the house that morning. But before meeting with her editor, Lily had another task to perform, her weekly visit to the prison where her father was being held. It was a grim penitentiary on the south side of the Thames at Lambeth, a repository for some of the worst criminals in London. Lily's father had been there almost a year, and the determination of his sentence had been vague. Lily knew there were those in the judiciary conspiring against her father, he had told her so, and that meant he would only be released when they were satisfied revenge had been served. I've come to see Connor Edge, Lily said, as she arrived at the gates of the prison, where two warders stood checking the details of those visiting. Lily had brought her usual basket of cakes and other treats for her father, and by way of a bribe, she slipped a shilling into the warden's hand as he looked her up and down. Ah, yes, Miss Edge. Your father's waiting for you, I believe, the warden, who was regularly on guard at the gate, said, ushering Lily through into the prison yard beyond. Lambeth Jail was a grim edifice, part medieval fortress. Its turrets and battlements had been augmented by a wing designed by Sir Christopher Wren, though without the architectural style of his work at St Paul's, and the prison yard was surrounded on three sides by neoclassical blocks with steps rising to metal-studded doors, the windows barred, and the ever-present sound of human misery emanating from within. Today was visiting day, and Lily joined the queue of wives and daughters waiting to be given entry to the visiting hall. "'What's in the basket?' one of the warders asked, peering suspiciously at Lily, who smiled. Like the shilling on the gates, this too was a familiar ritual. Lily reached into her basket, taking out a small cake covered in white icing and dried fruit. She gave it to the warden, fixing him with an expectant gaze. For my father, Connor Edge, she said, and the warden nodded. Come this way, Miss Edge, he replied, beckoning her past the queue to the front, where a pair of double doors stood open, leading to the visiting hall beyond. The other woman looked disgruntled, but Lily was used to being given preferential treatment. Her father had befriended the guards with promises of Lily's basket and the bribes she could give. In that, she was her father's daughter. And now she saw him, sitting at the far end of the visiting hall, waiting to receive her. When he saw her, he rose to his feet and smiled. Father, you look well, Lily said, hurrying to embrace him. I feel well, Lily. I've heard they might release me, he said and Lily let out a cry of delight. Oh, father, that's wonderful news, she exclaimed as they sat down opposite one another. Lily set down her basket on the low wooden table, and her father delved beneath the red checkered cloth covering it,
pulling out a currant bun and taking a large bite. These were his favourite. Yes, it seems I've got friends as well as enemies, he replied, through a mouthful of currants. Lily glanced around her. The visiting hall was no bigger than a large dining room in a grand house, with a dozen or so tables interspersed at intervals. The other women had entered now, greeting the men with long embraces, only to be told to sit down by the wardens, who patrolled menacingly up and down the room. The sooner you're out of here, the better. I can't stand to see you here, the injustice of it all, she said. Every time she came to the prison, Lily thought the same. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button this way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. Her father was surrounded by murderers and thieves, but he had done nothing wrong and was confined here on trumped-up charges against him. There was no truth in any of it, and Lily was determined to see him freed. We must bide our time, but I hope to soon have further news. But tell me, how's your mother? Is she still raging against me? He asked, smiling at Lily, who nodded. We argued about you again, father. She's always drunk. I can smell it on her. And the more she drinks, the more emotional she gets. I can't have any pity for her, Lily said, and her father nodded. It was always the way, Lily. I'm sorry you have to put up with her. It won't be for much longer. Once I'm out of here, well, I'm sure she can be dealt with, he said, narrowing his eyes. Lily knew her father intended to put her mother out of the house on his return, and in this, at least, she was torn. Her mother had been good to her, even as they had never seen eye to eye. She did not want to see her suffer, even as she knew the marriage was irreconcilable. Isn't it more important to see those who put you here brought to justice? Lily said, and her father nodded. You speak the truth, Lily, a daughter after my own heart. Yes, those responsible. They'll pay dearly for what I've suffered, not least the Duke of Lancaster, he snarled. The name of the Duke of Lancaster, Ralph Oakley, had haunted Lily's childhood. Her father had often spoken of the man who had caused his downfall, though she really knew little more than that. He was a figure to be feared, and as a child she had imagined him as the devil himself. In recent years her father had often been away, and Lily had understood he was seeking the revenge he had always dreamed of. When this had failed, prison had followed, and her father had spoken of the Duke as being responsible for his incarceration, conspiring with others against him. And how can we make them pay, father? she asked, wanting to help in any way she could. I've told you the story often enough, how I was driven from my job as the land agent by Ralph. He was hungry for power, and the death of his brother was the means of achieving it. I tried to hold him back, to rein in his ambitions, but he considered me a threat, and made up all manner of rumours about me. Even after I'd left Lancashire, he continued to persecute me. No, Lily. What's needed is the exposure of the truth, her father replied. Lily smiled. She specialised in the exposure of the truth, and taking her latest offering for the scandal pages from her basket, she handed it to her father. She was proud of her work. There was nothing untrue in what she had written, nor had she embellished the facts. The scandal was enough on its own, and as her father read through it, he smiled and nodded. How delicious, he said, running his tongue over his teeth. I can't believe how long she got away with it for. It's quite remarkable. She's been visiting the stables for months, and not always to see the same stable hand. It's wicked. But the maid saw it all and I corroborated the story with one of the other stable hands. Lady Sandra had spurned him, and he was only too glad of an opportunity for revenge, Lily replied. She spoke of her work in detached and professional terms. There was nothing underhand in her revelation of the facts. What she had written was true, and what happened as a result of it did not concern her. If Lady Sandra Allington found herself ostracised from society, and reduced to a marriage of desperation, she had brought it entirely on herself. The actions were her own, no one had forced her hand, and she would be forced to live with the consequences, whatever they may be. 
My clever girl, you've got it all here, haven't you? I'm proud of you, Lily's father said, smiling at, as he handed back the article. But that's what we need for the Duke of Lancaster, too. Couldn't we write something about his past, or discover something new, Lily ventured. She had been thinking about the matter for some time, and it would surely be the way for her father to have his revenge. He pondered for a moment, a smile playing across his lips. If it concerned the past, they'd know I was the source. I kept certain details to myself. But as for something new, yes, there's bound to be fresh scandals lurking in the family, her father replied. Lily wanted to do something to help her father in his hope for revenge. She hated to see him imprisoned, there was no justice, and she would gladly have written anything about the Duke of Lancaster if she knew it would help her father's cause. There's got to be something, hasn't there? I could go there, I could go to Lancashire, Lily said, the thought suddenly occurring to her. She and her mother were not getting on, they argued constantly, and whilst Lily would not see her mother destitute, she had no desire to continue as they were, always at one another's throats. Time apart would do them good, and if Lily could discover something about the Duke of Lancaster, so much the better, she thought to herself. Her father thought for a moment, as though weighing up the possibilities of her proposal. You'd have to be careful, he said, but Lily waved her hand dismissively. She was used to being careful. Lily had established a network of contacts across the capital, always knowing one of them could betray her. She used false names and always ensured nothing she wrote could be traced back to her. It would not be difficult to establish herself in a new county, if only for a few months. I could go for the season. I could stay with my friend Alicia. Her parents have taken a house up there just recently. It's perfect. Oh, do say yes, father. I want to help you. I want to see an end to this terrible injustice, Lily said, and her father nodded. Very well, you go with my blessing, but publish nothing until I see it. Do you understand me? he said, and Lily nodded. I won't, I promise. But I know I can do it. I'll find something out about them. Something new. Something unconnected to the past. Once we expose it, the rest can follow. There'll be nothing they can do to stop it, Lily exclaimed, warming to the idea of revenge on her father's behalf. When the time for the visit was ended, her father embraced her, telling her he loved her and how proud he was to call her his daughter. I'll await your letters, Lily. Tell me everything you discover, but don't tell your mother where you're going. You know what she'd say, he said, and Lily nodded. We'll keep it between ourselves, father. I'll write to you, and it won't be long before you're out of this dreadful place, I promise, Lily said, bidding her father goodbye as she took up the empty basket. She followed the warden out of the visiting hall, hurrying across the prison yard towards the gate. Lily's mind was made up. She would go to Lancashire, and she would use all her ingenuity and skill to discover something scandalous about the Duke of Lancaster. In her experience, every grand family had its secrets, and whilst her father was reticent in revealing the past, Lily felt certain the present would hold just the same intrigues. Will we be seeing you next week, Miss Edge? The warder on the gate asked her, and Lily shook his head. No, I won't be visiting for some time. I've got important business to attend to, she replied, and the warden raised his eyebrows. Is that so? What is it you do to keep a roof over your head? You've no brothers. It can't be easy for an unmarried woman, the warden said, and Lily smiled. Oh, it's easier than you'd think, she replied, and nodding to him, she left the prison vowing only to return when her father was avenged. Yes, oh yes, really. She didn't. How marvellous, the editor said, looking up at Lily with a smile on his face. She smiled back, pleased to see the evident pleasure on his face as he read the details of Lady Sandra Allington's fall from grace. You'll print it then, Denzel, she asked, and the editor nodded. I'll print it and I'll pay for it too, but... Why the hurry? he asked, folding the piece of paper and placing it on the desk in front of him. The printing press was in a shabby part of town, close to the river. It was a secretive operation, 
and Lily knew Denzel was also a forger too. He ran copies on a scandal sheet, distributed across the city, and his reputation was such as to make the aristocracy quiver in their boots. Denzel Scruton cared nothing for the destruction of reputation, and he was only too glad to have a steady stream of gossip imparted to him by Lily, whose father had introduced her to him. I'm going to Lancashire for the season. I wanted to get this to you beforehand, she said, as Denzel held out her payment to her. Lancashire, the dukedom. It might prove fruitful, Denzel replied, smiling at Lily, who nodded. I'll happily send you copy of whatever I find. I thought it would make a change of scene. The aristocracy in London are on their guard. They know someone's writing about them, and they're intent on discovering who it is. The nobility of Lancashire might be more, well, less on their guard, she said, smiling as Denzel laughed. You're a devious creature, Miss Edge, but you've got your father's name, and I'd expect nothing less, Denzel replied, rising to his feet as Lily placed the payment in her purse. Denzel had given her ten pounds for the article, enough for the journey to Lancashire, and the establishment of herself there amidst its society. The thought of it pleased her. She would attend balls and soirees, ingratiate herself with the gentry, and discover their secrets. I'll send you something soon, Lily told the editor, as he showed her out. And I'll look forward to receiving it, Miss Edge. I'm sure your father will too. Anything to get him released, Denzel replied, and Lily nodded. She would do anything to see her father freed, and as made her way home, thoughts of revenge were foremost in her mind. Chapter 4 I'm only speaking the truth, William. He prefers you to me, he always did. I didn't much care about it when we were youngsters, but it's different now. He holds you up as the example I'm to aspire to. You've got everything, and what have I got? I'm not married. I'm a disappointment to my father, and I'm not going to inherit his title for a very long time, Maximilian said, sighing and gulping the brandy from his glass. William looked at him sympathetically. They had dined at the Gresham Club, a gentleman's establishment in Lancaster, that afternoon, and were now drinking in the smoking room. The evening was drawing on, and Maximilian had become animated by the brandies, never knowing when to say no to another. It's not like that, you know that. He doesn't prefer you to me. But perhaps I'm a little more malleable, William replied. Maximilian laughed. Malleable? What's that supposed to mean? You do as he tells you? Well, that's true enough. But why? He's not your father, is he? Maximilian retorted. He had only grudgingly agreed to spend the day with his cousin. An uneasy truce had been called with his father, mediated by the Duchess, and William had invited Maximilian to Lancaster so the two of them could talk. But Maximilian was bored with talking. It never got him anywhere, even as it reminded him of his many apparent faults. He's been good to me. My education in London, the title, his kindness to my mother and the benefits of being his godson. I don't know why you rebel against him so. What's wrong with settling down? You could find a wife. You're the heir to one of the richest dukedoms in the country, William replied. Maximilian sighed. It was easy for William to talk. He had a beautiful wife, Anne, and a son, Jacob. They lived at Podmore Grange, a beautifully restored house close to the Burnley Abbey estate and William was well-liked and respected by his tenants and in the village. Maximilian, however, was not. He was something of a joke to the local people. If he's not drunk, he's going to be, one person had rudely put it, but there was truth in the words. But who'd want to marry me? Besides, I don't want to get married, Maximilian replied, even as he would dearly have liked to have done. The thought was often on his mind to marry, to be in love, to court a woman, but his behaviour spoke of other desires. Maximilian had the reputation of a rake, and it was women like Clara Greenwood rather than the bells of local society who attracted his attention. He was free with his favours, and not particularly concerned who received them. In this he knew he had been lucky, and his father had reminded him on countless occasions as to the danger of scandal, 
Don't you realise the things they write about us? The Duke had said, after Maximilian had woken up under an apple tree in the garden of a woman with a dubious reputation. But Maximilian did not care much about his reputation. He counted on the fact of his inheritance, and apart from that, nothing else mattered. He would be the Duke of Lancaster, whether mired in scandal or not. Plenty of women would want to marry you, some of them even having good reputations, William retorted. Maximilian called for the steward to bring him another drink, even as his cousin pointed to the late hour. What's wrong? Won't Anne like you being out so late? That's the difference between us, cousin. You have your responsibilities, I don't, and that's how I want it to remain, Maximilian replied, taking a gulp of brandy and sitting back with a satisfied sigh. His cousin looked at him sympathetically. Maximilian knew what he thought of him, what everyone thought of him. He was a rake, and a rake would not change his ways. And what about your mother? Doesn't it matter what she thinks? He asked, and Maximilian sighed. He had known William would use this tactic against him. Maximilian loved his mother dearly, and he had no desire to upset her, even as his father's sensibilities were a different matter. He knew the Duchess worried about him, and to that, at least, he had a care. It does, but, well, she'd be better off not doing so, Maximilian replied. He did not need anyone to worry about him. He was twenty-two years old, his mistakes were his own, and what others thought was an irrelevance. You'll only upset her. She was weeping in my mother's arms only last week, lamenting the state you've got yourself into, William replied. But to this, Maximilian merely raised his glass in a toast. To my mother, may she never worry about me again. Let me alone with my rakish ways. I'm proud of them, he exclaimed, taking a gulp of the brandy, as other members of the Gresham Club looked on askance. Really, Maximilian, don't do this to yourself. It's not right, William said, and Maximilian laughed. Are you lecturing me? The man taken for a fool by Connor Edge, who paraded himself around London as the gentleman on my father's good name? You were hardly the paradigm of reason then, were you, cousin? Maximilian hissed. Even in his drunken state, he knew better than to speak loudly of his true affiliation with William. But the facts of the matter remained. His cousin, whose mother had once been a servant at Burnley Abbey, had been educated by Maximilian's father, the Duke, and sent to London. There, by means of an unfortunate manipulation, he had come under the auspices of Connor Edge, the former land agent and a sworn enemy of Maximilian's father. William had been far too trusting, and Connor Edge had used the fact to his advantage, turning William into a laughingstock and setting him up as a failure. The matter had been resolved. Connor Edge was in prison for gambling crimes, but William's embarrassment remained. I've made mistakes, and that's why I want to help you, William. I don't want you to make the same mistakes as I've made. We're all allowed a second chance. I'm grateful to your father for mine, and I know he'll give you one too if only you'll allow it, William replied. Maximilian sighed. He had heard enough for one night. It was always the same argument the same condemnation of his behaviour. None of them would be happy until he had renounced his former ways and conformed to the pattern they themselves laid out. The Duke wanted a son in the mould of William, and William wanted a cousin he could rely on as the worthy inheritor of the estate, as he himself gave advice as the new land agent. I'm sure it's not as simple as that, Maximilian said, rising to his feet. The time had come to go home. Nothing had changed, nor would it, as far as Maximilian was concerned. The stewards seemed relieved the animated conversation had come to an end, and they bid Maximilian and William good night, the two cousins stepping out onto the street where it was now dark. Their carriage was nowhere to be seen, and Maximilian cursed under his breath. It's all right. I told him he could wait in the yard behind the club. We shouldn't begrudge him the opportunity to warm himself, William said and he went off to find the carriage driver, leaving Maximilian pacing up and down in front of the steps leading up to the club. What a wasted night, Maximilian thought to himself. He liked his cousin. They got on well now, at least. But if William believed Maximilian was ever going to change, he was surely mistaken. They were total opposites, and Maximilian knew he would never live up to the ideals of his cousin, 
or his father. And thus, I'll always be a disappointment, Maximilian said to himself, shrugging his shoulders, as he noticed a carriage pulling up in front of an inn and lodging house opposite. A young woman clambered down, passing some coins to the driver, who pointed her in the direction of the lodgings. She was pretty, and Maximilian smiled to himself, deciding to have a little fun before William returned with the carriage. He stepped forward, clearing his throat. The woman looked up at him, her face illuminated in the light of the lamp above the inn door, where a flickering candle burned behind the glass. Yes, she asked, looking Maximilian up and down with a disdainful expression. She was a pretty creature, with long blonde hair, wearing a purple dress, and a travelling cloak, a bag held in her hand. Her cheeks were rosy, her lips red and inviting. Maximilian had never seen her before, but he thought her quite attractive, and wondered if he might steal a kiss from her before returning home. You've just arrived, have you? I don't recognise you, he said, and the woman laughed. Why should you recognise me? Am I meant to be recognisable? she asked. There was a haughtiness in her voice, and Maximilian decided she needed reining in. A woman should not be so forward in her words. That's no way to speak to me. Don't you know who I am? he said, and the woman shook her head. No, I don't. But I know one thing. Whoever you are, you're a drunk, and I'd rather not know you, she replied, turning as though to make her way inside the inn. Maximilian, emboldened by alcohol and angry at having thus been so spoken to, lunged forward, grabbing her by the arm. I'm Lord Maximilian Oakley, son of the Duke of Lancaster. I only wanted to talk to you. You women are all the same, aren't you? He exclaimed. But to his surprise, on hearing these words, the woman turned to him and raised her eyebrows. You're the son of the Duke of Lancaster, she said, her tone changing, and Maximilian nodded, smiling, and feeling pleased at the change his words had wrought in her. Few women could fail to be impressed at such a title. The dukedom was an ancient one, and the Duke of Lancaster was, by far, the biggest landowner in the county, if not the north of England. The estate was a wealthy one, and with properties spread across the north and business investments through the empire, Maximilian would one day be a very rich man indeed. That's right, he replied, and the woman put down her bag and smiled. It's a pleasure to meet you, she said, holding out her hand. Maximilian took it, still feeling pleased with himself and hoping William would be delayed in his return with the carriage. Maximilian Oakley, at your service, miss, he said, for the woman had not yet introduced herself. Lily. Lily Porter, the woman replied, and Maximilian raised her hand to his lips. It's my pleasure, I assure you. You've only just arrived in Lancaster? he asked still holding her hand in his. She nodded. I've come from London. It was a long journey, but I'm here now. I've come for the season. I'm to stay with a friend. Will you be attending the events? Lily asked. Maximilian nodded. The season was an excuse to indulge his pleasures. He looked forward to it, even as his parents had already warned him of the dangers. Don't cause a scandal, Maximilian, his father had said. But Maximilian had not listened. He was happy to cause a scandal, even as he knew the consequences. How wonderful. I'm sure we'll be seeing more of one another, won't we? She said, and Maximilian nodded. I hope so. But are you here alone? He asked, for he had expected a chaperone to appear at any moment and chase him away. Young women were always accompanied by chaperones, but to his surprise, Lily shook her head. Not at the moment, no, it's complicated. But I'll have my friend Alicia. She'll be my chaperone at the balls and soirees. Why? Do I need a chaperone to talk to the son of the Duke of Lancaster? Aren't I safe? she asked, and Maximilian smiled. I'm sure you are, he said, his hand lingering in hers as he stepped forward, intent on planting a kiss on her lips. She cocked her head to the side, looking at him coquettishly and giggling. He found her very attractive, but as he moved forward, intending to pull her into his embrace, a voice from behind called out, 
Maximilian, I've got the carriage. Come on, it'll be late by the time we get back, William said. Maximilian sighed. His cousin had spoiled the moment even as Lily smiled at him. You'd better go. I don't want you getting into trouble on my account, she said. And Maximilian laughed. I'm sure I won't, and I hope to see you again very soon, at the first ball of the season, perhaps, or before, if I'm lucky. Why not take a carriage ride around the parkland at Burnley Abbey? Tell them I sent you and we could ride together, he said, bringing her hand to his lips again. Do you invite yourself into every woman's carriage? she asked, and Maximilian winked at her. Not every woman, no, he replied, and stepping back, he bowed to her, watching as she made her way up the steps into the inn. As he turned, he found William watching him and shaking his head. I leave you for a few moments, Maximilian, and you find a woman to flirt with. Who was she? he asked, and Maximilian shrugged his shoulders. Just an idle distraction, cousin, but pretty enough. She's here for the season. That's long enough for me, he said, following William back to the waiting carriage, intent on acquainting himself further with Lily Porter and discovering just how far she might go with gentle persuasion. Chapter 5 Lily could not believe her luck. She had stepped down from her carriage after the long journey from London over the course of three days, only to be accosted by a man claiming to be the son of the Duke of Lancaster himself. At first Lily had assumed the man to be an idle drunk, but as he had spoken she had become ever more convinced he was telling the truth. What remarkable luck, she thought to herself, as she watched the young heir's carriage drive away. He had treated her with nothing but entitled lasciviousness. There was no doubt in Lily's mind as to what the Duke's son was like. He was a rake, and rakes were the sort of men who created scandal. He'd have kissed me if his friend hadn't interrupted him. What an awful man, she said to herself, shaking her head, as the carriage disappeared from sight. Lily smiled to herself, imagining the things she could write in one of her scandal pages. But the journey north had been long, and Lily was tired. She would think more about the matter the following morning, and how best to use this new acquaintance to her advantage, for it surely would be. She had overnighted at a number of dubious inns, the landlords treating her with suspicion. An unaccompanied lady was a rarity. But Lily was not like other young ladies. She had inherited her father's guile and was nobody's fool. As she entered the inn, she found herself in a noisy taproom where drunken men were carousing over cards and dice. The perfect place for the Duke's heir to embroil himself in scandal, Lily thought to herself imagining what might be done to lure Maximilian into a trap. Behind the counter, a tall man with a wispy beard and an eagle-like nose was drawing a tankard of ale from a barrel, and he looked up at Lily with suspicion, a greeting Lily was now used to. Be off with you! I won't turn my inn into a house of ill repute, he snarled. Lily fixed him with a stern expression. I'm not what you assume me to be she said, even as some of the men at the tables nudged one another and winked. Then what do you want? the man asked. I want a room for the night, and lodgings for the coming days, she said, pulling her bags over to the counter. We don't allow unaccompanied women. Where's your husband, your father, your brother? the landlord asked. Not here, I've travelled north alone. I'm to stay with a friend for the season, Alicia Saunders. You might know her father. Timothy Saunders, a merchant in these parts. Those are my credentials, Lily replied. But the circumstances of her arrival were not as firmly set as she claimed. Lily had written to her friend Alicia, telling her she was coming north and hoping to have the favour of a previous stay on Alicia's part repaid, but was yet to receive a reply. The previous year, her friend had lodged with Lily and her mother for a month whilst her parents were abroad and Alicia had always promised to reciprocate the kindness. The two had known one another for several years, having met at a ball in London when they were both eighteen, and Lily was certain there would be no difficulty in securing an invitation to stay. To Lily's relief, at the mention of Alicia's father, the landlord's expression softened. Ah, yes, I know Mr Saunders, 
a wine and spirit merchant. His company supply me with claret. Very well, though, I'm making an exception, the landlord said. Lily glanced around her. Several of the men were still watching her with interest, but the others had returned to their card games and dice. The landlord took down a key from a hook behind the counter, beckoning Lily to follow her, as a young boy appeared from the kitchen to serve the next customer. Lily was led through a door at the far end of the taproom and up a rickety flight of stairs to a landing above. I'll only need the room for a few nights, she said, as the landlord lit a candle for one burning in a sconce at top of the stairs. And what brings you north? By your accent, I presume you're from London, he said, and Lily nodded. As I said, I'm here to visit my friend Alicia. She's terribly bored in the north. Society isn't the same as it is in the south, Lily said. The landlord gave a wry smile. Yes, that's always the opinion of Southerners. But we have society here. Not that they frequent my inn, of course. If you want society, you'll need to look to the Duke of Lancaster and Burnley Abbey. Perhaps Mr Saunders can get you an invitation. He has dealings with the Duke, the landlord said. And now he unlocked a door at the far end of the corridor, opening it into a small bedroom with a bay window looking out over the street. It was furnished with a bed, washstand, and a small writing desk just what Lily wanted, and lit by a number of candles burning in sconces on the walls. Very good, thank you. I'm sure I'll be very comfortable. I'll write to Alicia immediately. Can you have it sent for me? Once she knows I'm here, she'll send for me at once, I'm certain, Lily said. The landlord nodded. The boy can take it in the morning. I serve breakfast in the parlour at eight o'clock. There's no maid, though I'm sure you'll manage, he said, and bidding her good night, he left the room. Lily lit another candle, placing it on the writing desk and pulling out her journal from one of her bags. She was eager to write down her first impressions of the Duke's heir, even as fatigue was getting the better of her. What sort of man was he like? A rake, yes, and a drunkard. He had a sense of self-entitlement. I was a woman, he wanted to kiss me, and he thought he could do so because of who he is. A dozen other women can surely testify the same. More, I should think, Lily mused to herself, and she wrote down her observations, smiling to herself at the sight of the emerging scandal sheet before her. But Lily was exhausted, and having written hastily to Alicia, she readied herself for bed. But as she lay down to sleep, Lily could not help but smile at the thought of what luck had brought her, and as she fell asleep, it was with a vow to use that luck to her advantage in securing revenge for her father. Lily awoke to the smell of breakfast wafting up from the parlour below, and having washed and dressed, she made her way downstairs, eager to learn more from the landlord about the Duke of Lancaster. It was the kitchen boy who greeted her, showing her to a table in the window. There were only two other guests staying at the inn, an elderly gentleman buried behind a periodical, and a young man hurrying to eat before setting off for an appointment with the local magistrate. Two boiled eggs, tea, and a slice of bread, Lily said, and the boy hurried off to the kitchen just as the landlord entered the parlour. I've sent the letter to Miss Saunders, he said, for Lily had left it outside her door the previous night. Thank you. I'm sure she'll be in touch very soon. But I'm keen to know more about the season here in Lancashire. Is there a ball to open it? Lily asked, and the landlord nodded. The Duke's son had mentioned such an occasion, even as he had given no further details. Yes, they all gather at the assembly rooms, not far from here. It's quite an occasion, for the North. It's taking place tomorrow night, he said, and Lily blushed. Yes, well, compared to London. And does the Duke himself attend? she asked. He does. He and the Duchess are the patrons. Not that any of it concerns me. I'm the landlord of an inn, I don't attend such things. But yes, they'll be there, along with the Baron of Mowbray and his wife. He was a fortunate man, the son of a servant, but the fortunate favourite of the Duke. A title bought for him. Can you believe it? The landlord said, shaking his head. Lily was intrigued. The son of a servant. A bought title. Such things reeked of scandal, 
and her mind immediately turned to the possibility of illegitimacy. How extraordinary. And he has a son, is that right? Lily asked, pressing the landlord for further details. Lily was used to extracting information in this way. In London, she had built up a string of contacts, maids, valets, footmen, hallboys, and even butlers, anyone who could be of use in furnishing her with details for her work. The landlord of the inn was proving to be her first there in Lancaster, and it seemed he was a mine of information concerning the local aristocracy. But to her surprise and delight, the mention of the heir brought a grimace to the landlord's face. Ah, yes, Lord Maximilian, he's quite the rake, he said, shaking his head. Really, I can hardly believe that, the respectable son of a duke, Lily said, dangling the possibility of response. At this, the landlord laughed. Respectable? Him? I don't think so. When he comes in here? I've never seen such behaviour. He's a drunkard, always carousing, and with a different woman every week. It's a scandal, the landlord exclaimed. The kitchen boy now brought Lily's boiled eggs, but she was far more interested in hearing more about Maximilian than eating the breakfast placed in front of her. Goodness me, I always thought aristocrats to be the most respectable sort of people. But you say the Duke's son runs riot, like father, like son, Lily asked. She knew just how to ask a leading question, and it seemed the landlord was only too happy to continue talking. Well, the Duke's a respectable man, though, one hears rumours. He was never meant to be the Duke. His brother died fighting the French in Corsica. His name was Max, Lord Maximilian's namesake. The Duchess was the daughter of the Baron of Mowbray, who lost all his money in a failed business venture. That's why the Duke bought the title, or so I'm led to understand. But one never knows the whole story, he said. Lily nodded, smiling to herself at the thought of the intrigues she had already uncovered. A dead Duke, an unexpected heir, a bought title, a servant's son, and a rakish heir. She wondered where her father fitted into it and now she sought to push the landlord further. My father had some dealings with the Duke of Lancaster. He didn't care for him very much, Lily said, and the landlord shrugged. He owns most of the city, thought not my inn, I'm glad to say. What was your father's name? he asked. Oh, er, uh, Joseph Porter, Lily said, knowing she could not reveal the truth about her father to just anyone, and the landlord furrowed his brow. Ah, I don't remember a Joseph Porter but I suppose it's a long time ago, isn't it? Over twenty years ago. Goodness me, how times change, he said, as Lily cut the top off her boiled egg and smiled. They do, but people don't always change with them. I must say I'm surprised to hear such things said about the Duke's son. One always imagines the aristocracy to be a model of virtue, she said, but the landlord laughed. If it's a model of virtue you want, you won't find it in the son of the Duke of Lancaster. He's not fit to inherit his father's title, that's for certain. But he will. How could he not? He'll make a poor duke, though, and for now he'll play the rake. You'll see him at the ball, or he'll see you. Be careful. You and Miss Saunders are just the sort of women he'll be interested in, the landlord said, and Lily smiled. That was just what she was hoping for. After breakfast, Lily stepped out into the morning sunshine, keen to explore her new surroundings. She wanted to acquaint herself with the city and learn more about the dukedom. Any information was valuable, and she took with her a small pocketbook, ready to note down anything of interest she discovered. In London, Lily kept copious accounts of everything she learned, and she had an encyclopedic knowledge of the tongue, so as to connect one piece of information with another always ready to find scandal lurking beneath the surface. And I've already learned so much, she thought to herself, making her way along the pleasantly appointed high street, pausing to look into the window of a modiste, where a beautiful pink dress was on display. The ball would be an opportunity for observation, for Lily had no intention of preempting scandal. She could easily write a penny copy about the rakish air. The landlord had already furnished her with tantalising possibilities. But Lily knew the real skill in scandal-mongering was to wait for the perfect opportunity to publish. A reputation could be destroyed in a moment, and it was often prudent to wait for a subject's stakes to be higher before publishing a scandal from the past. 
In this way, Lily set herself apart from the many other scandal writers in London, for her copies were always perfectly timed to cause the most damage to reputations deserving of destruction. A new gown would certainly help draw in the rakish air, she thought to herself, deciding to invest in the pink dress as a means of securing the information she required. Stepping into the modiste, she was greeted by a large woman in a purple dress with a red face and bouffant hairstyle. Good morning, madam. And what can I do for you? A new dress, is it? I don't think I've seen you before, the woman said, and Lily smiled and nodded. Yes, I'd like to be fitted for the dress in the window. It's something of an urgency. I've travelled from London and my trunks were misplaced by a careless carriage driver. I've nothing to wear for the assembly room's ball tonight. I've sent my maid to buy the other things I need, but if you can do something for me, I'd be ever so grateful. I'm here for the season, you see, she said, as the woman nodded. Certainly, I'll take your measurements and can make the alterations this afternoon. It's no trouble, and how terrible for you to lose your things like that. This way, please stand on the stool, she said and Lily was directed into a fitting room where she slipped off her shoes and stood on a red plush stool, the modiste taking out a tape measure and holding it up to Lily's skirt. I don't know much about the season here, though I assume the Duchess hosts a great number of events, Lily said. Such leading questions were always to her advantage, and she felt certain the modiste would know a great deal about the Duchess of Lancaster. Oh yes, madam. The Duchess hosts several grand balls at Burnley Abbey and a picnic in the grounds. She was here only yesterday to buy a new dress and admired the one you've chosen, the woman replied. It must be difficult for her, not having a daughter. A son isn't much use when it comes to society events, Lily replied. The modista noted down her measurements and nodded. Certainly, madam. But she's used to it, I'm sure, and she's got Lady Anne to help her now. She's like a daughter to her. The Baron's her godson, you see. The way she speaks about him. Well, sometimes I wonder who she prefers. Her own son or him, the modiste said, tutting and shaking her head. Lily smiled. It seemed there was no shortage of opinion as to the family of the Duke of Lancaster, and with every conversation Lily was learning something new. Chapter 6 Maximilian groaned. His head was pounding, and he rolled over onto his back, staring up at the canopy above his bed. What time is it? he said out loud, struggling to sit up and feeling suddenly unwell. His chamber pot stood next to the bed, and he looked down into it, fearing he was about to be sick. A jug of water stood on his bedside table, and he grabbed it, drinking straight from it, the water running over his nightshirt. For goodness sake, he exclaimed, soaked to the skin, as now he rose from the bed and staggered towards the window. He pulled back the curtains, shielding his eyes from the bright sunshine, before pulling up the sill and breathing in the fresh air of the garden. Down below, a gardener was clipping the box hedge, and he looked up at Maximilian, shaking his head and tutting. What are you looking at? Get back to work, Maximilian shouted, even as he staggered back from the window feeling again as though he was about to be sick. He sat down on a chair by the hearth, struggling to recollect the events of the night before. He had gone to Lancaster with William. They had dined at the Gresham Club and stayed drinking in the smoking room until close to midnight. There had been a carriage ride home, and Maximilian had persuaded his cousin to have another drink, or perhaps two. And the woman, too, Maximilian reminded himself, thinking back to the encounter with the woman outside the inn. She had been a pretty creature, from what he could recall, and now he wondered who she was and whether he would see her again. But his musings were interrupted by a gentle tapping at the door. I've brought you some tea, my lord, a timid voice called out, and the door opened to reveal one of the maids carrying a tray with a cup and saucer on it. As she entered the room, she made a face, and Maximilian could only assume the smell was not to her liking. Put it down there, he said, pointing to the table in front of him. Shall I open the curtains, my lord, she said, and Maximilian nodded. Yes, but I'm not going down to breakfast. Bring it up to me, he said, 
for he did not relish the prospect of encountering his father and mother that morning in the dining room. They would certainly have an opinion on his current state, and he would be compared to William, who had drunk only a sensible amount and returned home in full control of his faculties. The maid nodded, curtsying and hurrying from the room. Maximilian let out another groan, sighing and closing his eyes. He would eat breakfast in his room and then go out into the garden intending to avoid his mother and father for the remainder of the day. They'll only judge me, just as they always do, he thought to himself. The maid returned a short while later, but she delivered a message rather than the expected breakfast. The Duchess reminded him it was the day of the ball at the assembly rooms and that Maximilian was expected to attend. He had forgotten all about it and let out another groan as the maid waited expectantly for his response. I suppose they want me downstairs, do they? he asked, and the maid nodded. Her ladyship was most insistent, my lord, she said, and Maximilian nodded. Very well, he said, dismissing the maid with a wave of his hand. He pulled on the clothes from last night, not even bothering to comb his hair before making his way downstairs. The effects of the previous night were still showing, and he paused in the hallway, steadying himself on the banister, the sight of the marble chequered floor making him feel ill. Is that you, Maximilian? A voice called from the dining room. It was the Duke, and Maximilian sighed, staggering forward towards the door. As he entered the dining room, his mother and father looked up at him with expressions of resignation. Really, Maximilian, whatever do you look like? his mother exclaimed as Maximilian sat down at the table and beckoned a footman to pour him a cup of coffee. Like a man summoned from his bed before he wished to be, mother, Maximilian retorted. I'm sure William's managed to make himself look presentable after a similar evening to you, the Duke said, but Maximilian only rolled his eyes and made no reply. It's the ball at the assembly rooms tonight. You'll need to be ready for it. It's an important occasion, Maximilian, his mother said. Maximilian disliked the opening ball of the season. He disliked any occasion when his parents would be observing him. He did not like to be judged, and yet he knew he would be. It was inevitable. A few debutantes and maiden aunts dressed in peacock feathers and ill-fitting gowns. It's hardly an important occasion, Martha, Maximilian replied. It's expected of us. It's expected of you, Maximilian. Being a duke doesn't mean always doing what one wants to do. Don't you understand that? We turn out, we nod and greet, we're polite and on show. Society sees us, and we benefit from their continued respect, the Duke replied. Maximilian did know this, but it did not change his attitude towards what was required of him. He hated the idea of being on show and would gladly have avoided the ball entirely, even as he had mentioned the possibility of it to the woman outside the inn the previous evening. Maximilian, why not think of the new season as an opportunity for a new start? Leave the past behind and look to the future. There'll be new people there, debutantes, invited guests, perhaps those from further afield. Wouldn't it be the perfect opportunity to present yourself in a different way? His mother asked. It was the usual tactic. His father would be angry and his mother would be reconciliatory. Maximilian had no desire to upset her even as he knew the prospect of change was far harder than she made it out to be. But Maximilian did not know if he wanted to change. His father would always compare him to William, and the rest of the ton had already made its mind up about him. And how might I do that, mother? Won't I always be a disappointment to you? I can see it in your eyes, and if not yours, then father's. I don't think I can change. I don't always set out to behave like this but a few drinks and he began, even as the Duke threw his napkin aside and rose angrily to his feet. Maximilian, you're to be the Duke of Lancaster one day. You're to be looked up to as a model of respectful living. Can't you see that? he exclaimed. But Maximilian had heard enough. He too rose to his feet and pointed angrily at his father in retort. Yes, but I wasn't ever supposed to be, was I? And neither were you. You grew up not believing you'd ever inherit the title. I've known it since the day I was born. You've always expected so much of me, and yet it was never meant to be. It was William all along, he exclaimed, 
and before his father could reply, Maximilian had stormed off from the table. The footmen by the sideboard exchanged puzzled glances as he passed, but Maximilian did not care what they thought. He was angry, and he had been angry for a long time. It was not just his father's attitude and expectations, but the very nature of what he was born into. Maximilian had no choice but to inherit the title of Duke of Lancaster. It was his, whether he wanted it or not. He had felt the burden of responsibility, even at a young age, and had always felt second best in his father's estimations. The responsibility should have been William's, and the fact it was not left a bitter taste in Maximilian's mouth. But they'll still expect it of me, won't they? He thought to himself, as now he made his way out into the garden. The roses were his solace, and Maximilian was glad to breathe in their sweet scent as he made his way between the beds, pausing to examine the new blooms. He was something of an expert in roses, entirely self-taught, and had propagated several new varieties in the Abbey Gardens. Gallicane Miriama, he said to himself, taking the bud of a crimson rose in his cupped hand and breathing in the perfume. The rose had been named in honour of his mother, the first he had propagated, and it now trailed over an arbour, its flowers blossoming in the early summer sunshine. Maximilian found roses far easier to understand than people, and certainly women. A rose could be trained and trailed. It blossomed in the sunshine and was cut back in winter. There was a predictability to roses, but the same could not be said for women. Not that I try much, I suppose, Maximilian thought to himself. He had taken a pair of pruning spears with him, intending to trail the rose into a comely shape. But as he began clipping, he heard footsteps approaching, and looking up, he found his cousin standing at the entrance to the rose garden. Were you sent as an envoy? Maximilian asked as William approached. No, I've only just arrived. I came through the gardens. I thought I might find you here. I wanted to see how you were. After last night, I mean, he said. Maximilian shrugged. Last night had not been so different from so many others. Maximilian had got drunk and his father had been disappointed in him. It was the usual pattern, or so it seemed, and Maximilian shook his head, returning to his pruning as William stood at his side. I'm expected at the assembly rooms ball tonight. These things are always so trying. But it's my duty, apparently. That's what my father told me at breakfast. I'm a perpetual disappointment to him. But I'll go, I suppose. What choice do I have? he said with a sigh. I'll be there. And so will Anne, too. It's important, Maximilian. You know it is. Besides, you might enjoy it, William said, ever the optimist. I don't enjoy occasions where my parents are watching my every move. I don't care about making favourable impressions for their benefit, Maximilian retorted, snapping the spears together with an angry force. His cousin raised his eyebrows. Yes, I saw that last night. You were hardly making a favourable impression with that woman outside the inn. What were you thinking of? You accosted her in the street. It was quite extraordinary, he said. Maximilian turned to his cousin in surprise. His own recollection was quite different. He and the woman had enjoyed a perfectly civilised conversation. She had been alighting from her carriage as Maximilian and William left the Gresham Club, and as William had gone to find their carriage driver, he and the woman had struck up a conversation. Maximilian had thought himself chivalrous in keeping the woman company whilst her bags were unloaded from the carriage, and in his mind there was no sense of impropriety. What do you mean? I behaved perfectly well towards her, Maximilian retorted, but his cousin laughed. Really? You lunged at her, expecting her to kiss you. I'm surprised she didn't scream. I just hope she's not there tonight. You might find yourself in a difficult position if she is, William said. Maximilian scowled at his cousin. He recalled the encounter quite differently and did not think his behaviour had been anything but courteous. The woman had been attractive, but Maximilian really knew nothing about her. She had come from London, or so he thought, and was visiting a friend. He could not remember how she had introduced herself. Was her name Lily? Well, it hardly matters, does it? She was just a flight of fancy. Nothing more. I spoke to her. 
Is there any harm in that? he asked, looking up at the rose bush as he decided where the prune next. There is when it happens so frequently, Maximilian. You leave a trail of destruction behind you wherever you go. Broken hearts and jealousies. How many women have you claimed to fall in love with? Only to jilt them once you've grown bored with their company? William persisted. But Maximilian had heard enough. He had been lectured at the breakfast table and now he was being lectured in the rose garden too. His rose garden. Lowering his pruning shears, Maximilian turned to his cousin and fixed him with a hard stare. I don't need your opinion on my morals, cousin. You're lucky to have a wife and find yourself settled. Thanks, in no small part to my father. As for me, I don't need further advice. I know what you all think of me, and I know I'm not going to change either, he said, and William sighed. I just want you to be happy, Maximilian, that's all, and you won't be. Not until you stop this nonsense and settle down, he said, and turning on his heels, he marched off across the garden, leaving Maximilian alone. Maximilian sighed. He was not looking forward to the ball that evening, though the prospect of seeing the woman from the previous evening was somewhat enticing. She won't be there. She's not that type, he thought to himself, even as he could only remember scant details of their conversation. Had he asked her about the ball? What had she said? He was struggling to even picture her, though he knew she had been pretty. His recollection of their conversation was entirely different from William's perception. He felt certain he had been charming, even as his cousin gave a very different account. Well, it hardly matters. She's just like all the rest, he thought to himself, returning to his pruning and feeling glad of the certainty his roses provided. They would bloom, even as so much of the rest of his life was still waiting to blossom. Chapter 7 Lily had still not heard anything from Alicia. The afternoon was drawing on, and the time for the ball was fast approaching. The modiste had made the necessary adjustments to the dress, and had it delivered to the inn, where the landlord, who now seemed far less suspicious of Lily, had proved to be a continued source of interest and information over luncheon. Oh yes, they're an ancient family, one of the richest in England. I didn't care much for the previous duke, I mean the present duke's father. His brother was hardly in the inherit long enough to count. No, he was a stern man, and the duchess, then the dowager duchess, was a stern woman. I never saw her smile. She'd drive past in her carriage, expecting the shopkeepers to come out to her. But that's aristocrats for you. I suppose it's even worse in London, the landlord said, and Lily nodded. Oh yes, quite terrible, she said, and the landlord shook his head. The things you hear about them, and especially the rakish air. Last week, he got so drunk it took four men to carry him out, and I won't lower myself by repeating some of the words he used. It's an absolute scandal, he said, shaking his head. I'd never have thought it. I'm surprised no one reveals these things, Lily said, and the landlord nodded. Someone should. He won't get away with it forever, he said, and Lily smiled. No, he won't, I'm sure, she said taking up her knife and fork, as a dish of mutton and potatoes was placed in front of her. Having heard nothing from Alicia by the time she had finished eating, Lily decided to take matters into her own hands. She had already made up her mind to attend the ball at the assembly rooms that evening. It would be the perfect opportunity to observe those characters she had already heard so much about, and to revisit her acquaintance with the heir, in particular. It was he on whom she intended to base her scandal sheet, and she had made discreet inquiries of the landlord as to whether such a publication already existed. You mean the penny horrors? Not here, not really. There's the broker press on Nottingham Street. They print all manner of pamphlets and tracts. Someone always wanted to put their opinions into print, don't they? But you won't find anyone printing scandal. There's not enough of it, the landlord had replied. But given what Lily had already heard, she felt convinced there was, and after luncheon she set out in search of the broker press, intending to offer them her services. Entrance to the ball was something she could achieve through flirtatious persuasion. Lily was used to such things. 
for she often talked her way into societal gatherings, only to emerge with just the information she required. But a formal invitation would make things easier, and she hoped the broker press might be run along a similar nature to that of her editor in London, printing whatever was required without questions as to its intended use. Could you direct me to the broker press? Lily asked, stopping a young boy in the street. He pointed vaguely to a dilapidated building at the far end, where the remnants of an ancient wheel were attached to what must once have been a watermill. It's in there, the boy said, and Lily rewarded him with a penny. Thank you, she said, and the boy ran off looking pleased with himself. Lily was curious. The watermill was hardly what she had expected and she approached with some trepidation, pausing at the door. But before she could knock, it was pulled open, and an elderly man, white-haired, and with a suspicious look on his face, answered it. Yes? Sneaking around you? One of those Dagudas trying to stop my printing what I want? It was the magistrate last week, threatening me. Who are you? He demanded, and Lily smiled. My name's Lily Porter, and I'm certainly not here to cause trouble, Mr. Broker. In fact, I'm eager to make you an offer, she said, using her false name again. The printer's eyes narrowed, and he straightened up, opening the door further. You can come in, but I'm watching you, he said as Lily stepped inside. A printing press stood where once the mechanisms of the mill had been. The air was damp and smelled of ink and oil. The tools of the printer's trade lay all around. A table was covered with block lettering and vats of ink in various colours, whilst piles of paper stood in dusty corners and the latest printing runs were stacked neatly on another table waiting to be packaged. What a marvellous place, Lily said, for she had always liked to see printing presses. They were the tool by which her words were dispersed, and she felt certain Mr Broker would help her. What is it you want? Something printed? he asked, and Lily nodded. I understand you print a variety of pamphlets and tracts, she said, and the printer nodded. That's right, though there are plenty who'd be glad if I didn't. I print for the Catholics, that upsets the church, and I print for the dissenters too, that upsets the church. I print for the politicians, that upsets the ones in power. I could go on, he said, shaking his head. What about the aristocracy? Do you ever upset them? Lily asked. No, but I'd be glad to do so. They'd like me shut down too. No one likes a man with a printing press and a free thought in his head, the printer replied. Then what if I was to make you a proposition? Lily asked, and she explained something of the work she did and how it might be beneficial to them both. Lily had brought several samples with her, and Mr Broker examined them with interest, nodding and smiling to himself. Yes, I see what you do, Miss Porter. And what do you expect from it? Blackmail, I suppose. That could be dangerous for me, he said, but Lily shook her head. Not at all. I only write what's true. I don't ask for money to prevent it being published, but ordinary people like to read about the scandals engulfing their apparent betters. A scandal sheet can contain advertising, and you, the printer, stand to gain considerably from the increased circulation of your publications by including one, she said. Lily was used to selling her wares. It was no different to selling lace or hot chestnuts on a stall. She had something others wanted, and they were prepared to pay for it. Lily kept up with demand, and her supply was already established. The printer nodded. Yes, I can see you're successful in what you do. But why do you think it'll work here in Lancashire? he asked. Aren't there scandals in Lancashire too? Lily replied. The printer nodded, narrowing his eyes and smiling. He cocked his head to one side, looking at Lily, who returned his gaze unflinchingly. She was used to dealing with suspicion, even as it seemed the printer was interested in what she had to offer. I'll only print it if you're certain of the truth, and on your head be it, he said. I pride myself on revealing the truth, as unpalatable as it might be to those whom it concerns. I've never written anything that wasn't true. I'm here for the season, staying with a friend. I'll have ample opportunity to observe the comings and goings of society. I'm always discreet. No one need know who I am, she said, and the printer laughed. 
I like you, Miss Porter. Very well. I'll print your scandal paper and include it in my next distribution. Write a piece about tonight's ball at the assembly rooms. I assume you're going, he said, and Lily nodded. I'll be there, though it would be easier to gain entrance if I had an invitation, she said, glancing at the printing press. I can print you one, yes, but they're the same every year. No one ever wants to forge them. Why would they? But if it makes it easier for you, he said, and it was not long before Lily was handed the invitation, printed in block lettering and embossed with a crest of two lions and an eagle. Thanking the printer and assuring him she would deliver a timely report of events at the ball, Lily left the watermill smiling to herself. She had only been in the district of Lancaster for a day, and already she had contacts, information and a source of distribution. Lily knew her father would be proud of her, and she was eager to carry out her task with diligence and report back to him. He would be awaiting her letter. Now she began to compose the first scandal sheet in her mind, imagining what she would say and how she would report her observations. It'll all be quite innocuous at first, until the punch begins to flow. That's when scandal emerges, Lily thought to herself. But her musings were interrupted by the sight of none other than the heir to the dukedom himself. Lord Maximilian was entering the inn just as she approached, and hurrying after him, Lily was delighted to think she might discover something more about him before the evening had even begun. Landlord. An ale. And swiftly, I haven't got all day, Maximilian said as Lily entered the inn behind him. The landlord did not look pleased at the presence of the Duke's heir, but he served him, nonetheless, glancing at Lily, who was hovering by the door, hoping Maximilian would notice her. If I can get him to talk, perhaps he'll reveal something more about his family, Lily thought to herself, as Maximilian turned with the tankard of ale in his hand and noticed her. Oh! Good afternoon. I know you, don't I? he said. There was an arrogance in his voice, as though it was she who was expected to draw his attention, even as she desired it. We met last night, as I was disembarking from my carriage. I'd just arrived from London, Lily replied, and Maximilian nodded. Ah, yes, I remember now. I'm glad to see you again, he said, extending his hand in an invitation to join him at the nearest table. Lily did so, even as the landlord gave her a look. She wanted to talk to Maximilian, even as it repulsed her to do so. Her estimation of him was simple. He was a rake, and rakes deserved everything that was printed about them, for it was always true. I didn't expect to see you here. I didn't realise aristocrats frequented such places, she said, and Maximilian laughed. Not all of them do, but I'm not like most aristocrats. Won't you have a drink with me? Landlord, an ale for the lady, Maximilian called out. I don't think that's quite appropriate, do you? Lily said. She hoped to embarrass the Duke's heir, and she certainly did not wish to give the impression she would drink ale with him. But the truth was somewhat different. Lily often shared a tankard of ale with her informants, and she was certainly not too proud to keep whatever company was necessary to secure the information she required but Maximilian did not appear perturbed, merely shrugging and waving his hand dismissively. I thought you might be the sort of woman who drank ale. I'm obviously mistaken, he said, and Lily nodded. That's certainly true. I'm only here whilst I await my friend. We'll be going to the ball tonight. Didn't you say you'd be going too? She asked, dangling the proposition before him. Maximilian nodded though his expression now brightened at the revelation of Lily's attendance. I did, yes, though I usually find the occasions interminably dull. One can't misbehave with one's parents watching, he said, and Lily nodded. That's true. Do you normally misbehave? she asked, hoping flirtation would yield the answers she sought. He smiled lasciviously at her, leaning forward over his drink and tapping his fingers across the table towards her arm, where he placed his hand. I can do, I certainly can, he said, and Lily had to try very hard to prevent her countenance from changing to a look of disgust. He repulsed her, 
even as she felt certain his rakish ways would be to her advantage. It was the perfect means by which to take revenge against the Duke of Lancaster. Here was his son, the heir to one of the noblest titles in the land, behaving in the most outlandish manner. It was barely three o'clock in the afternoon, and he was drunk, leering over a woman he barely knew, and sitting in a public house. The scandal paper would write itself, and there would be no need for any elaboration. I'm glad to hear it. Aristocrats can be so dull. At least, that's my impression of them. But I'm sure you'll change my opinion, she said, as he his hand remained resting on her arm. Perhaps, if you'll join me for a drink, he said, indicating his now empty tankard. But Lily shook her head. I need to get ready for the ball, don't you? It starts at seven o'clock. Will you excuse me? She asked, rising to her feet. Maximilian did the same, nodding to her with a smile, as Lily bid him a good afternoon and left the taproom, promising to see him again later at the ball. As she passed behind the counter to the doors up to the rooms, the landlord tutted. Don't get involved with him, Miss Porter. You'll regret it, he said, and Lily smiled. Oh, I won't be the only one, she replied and leaving the landlord with a confused expression on his face, she made her way upstairs. He'll certainly be sorry, she thought to herself, as now she sat down at the writing desk by the window and began to detail everything she had learned that morning and afternoon. Chapter 8 Lily had laid down on the bed for a moment, her eyes feeling heavy. She only intended to rest for a short while, but a knock at the door caused her to startle as the landlord called out to her. There's a letter for you, Miss Porter, from Miss Alicia Saunders. Her maid just delivered it, the landlord said, and Lily got up in a hurry to open the door, finding the landlord holding the letter in his hand. Oh, good, I'm glad. I've been waiting for her reply. Thank you, Lily said, glancing at the clock on the mantelpiece and realising she had only a few hours before the ball began. To her relief, on opening the letter, Lily discovered Alicia's parents would be only too glad to reciprocate Lily's hospitality to Alicia, and she could return home with them after the ball that evening. Lily did not have much time to spare, and she dressed in her new pink dress, imagining the look on Maximilian's face when he saw it. All her plans were coming together, and now she felt excited at the prospect of seeing Alicia and discovering more about the local society but I won't tell Alicia why I'm here. She doesn't need to know, Lily thought to herself, as she made her way downstairs a short while later. The landlord looked at her in surprise. Lily had transformed herself into the belle of the ball in her pretty pink dress, a pair of silver slippers, a silk shawl, and jewellery her father had given her for her 18th birthday. Well, Miss Porter, you're certainly full of surprises, the landlord said as Lily settled her bill. The kitchen boy brought down her bags, and a carriage was summoned to take her to the assembly rooms, a short distance away from the inn. I'm grateful for your hospitality, and for the things you've told me about. Well, everything, Lily said, as she bid the landlord farewell. Just remember what I told you, Miss Porter. Have nothing to do with the Duke's son. You wouldn't be the first young woman to be seduced by his charms, he said and Lily smiled. Don't worry, I'm sure I know what I'm doing, she replied, and now she made her way out to the waiting carriage, garnering admiring looks from several men sitting outside the inn drinking. The assembly rooms, miss, the driver said, and Lily nodded. That's right, she replied, and they set off to make the short ride along the high street. The building known as the assembly rooms was a handsome one, built in a neoclassical style with columns and steps up to a large door standing open where liveried footmen stood in attendance. A steady stream of fashionably dressed men and women were entering and there was much merriment and cheer amongst the crowds. This was the beginning of the season and there was a sense of anticipation in the air as Lily climbed down from her carriage and looked around her for a sight of Alicia and her parents. I wonder where they could be. The letter said they'd meet me here, and the bags could be put into their carriage, she thought to herself, even as it was hard to pick out any individuals amongst the crowd. 
But at that moment, a commotion occurred along the street, and shouts of make way could be heard as the clatter of horses' hooves approached. Lily watched in fascination as a large carriage, much larger than any of the others, and embossed with an ornate crest on the door, drew up. There was much excitement and jostling amongst the crowd, and heads turned as the carriage came to a halt. A footman jumped down, hurrying to open the door for the occupants, who now appeared to a round of applause. Who is it? Lily asked, turning to a young couple at her side, both of whom looked at her in surprise. It's the Duke and Duchess, of course. Don't you know them when you see them? The man replied, with indignant expression on his face. Lily turned to look back at the Duke and Duchess, now making their progress through the crowds. They were a handsome couple and greeted their well-wishers amicably. But Lily could only look at them with contempt. She remembered her father's words and felt even more determined to enact the revenge he sought. As they reached the top of the steps, they turned, waving to the crowds, who now followed them into the assembly rooms. But Lily lingered, surprised to see the Duke and Duchess were not accompanied by their son. I wonder where he is, Lily thought to herself, just as an excited cry came from behind. Oh, Lily, there you are. How wonderful to see you, Alicia called out, and Lily turned to find her friend hurrying towards her. Alicia was a pretty creature with blonde hair hanging down to her shoulders in ringlets and a rosy-cheeked face with dark brown eyes. She was wearing a peacock blue dress and she hurried to embrace Lily, exclaiming again how glad she was to see her. And I, you, thank you for replying to my letter. I should have written earlier, but I just had to leave London. My mother and I weren't getting on. You know how it is, Lily said. And Alicia nodded sympathetically. Alicia had seen the growing animosity between Lily and her mother, and it would surely have come as no surprise to her to be told Lily wanted some time away from London. Oh, yes, I can only imagine. You poor thing, but I wasn't sure. Why Lancashire? Though I'm thrilled to see you, of course. It's hardly the society you're used to, Alicia said, lowering her voice, as a pair of young women walked by arm in arm. My father lived here once. Lily said by way of explanation, and Alicia looked at her in surprise. Did I know that? No, I don't think I did. How interesting. Oh, but look, my mother and father are here, she said, taking Lily by the hand. Mr. and Mrs. Saunders were a thoroughly respectable couple, a little older than Lily's own parents, and now they greeted Lily warmly. How pleased we are to see you, my dear, Mrs. Saunders said. She was a large woman her height extenuated by a large plumage of feathers emanating from her fascinator and her red skirts trailing somewhat behind her. Her husband was quite the contrast, thin and in no way possessed of the countenance one might expect of a man who traded in liquor for a living. Alicia had once confided in Lily as to her father's absolute abhorrence for the demon drink, even as he had no qualms in selling it. And I you, Mrs. Saunders. Thank you so much for agreeing to my staying with you for the coming weeks. I was just saying to Alicia, I've come north because my father once lived here, Lily said, and Mrs. Saunders nodded with interest. Really? How fascinating. And of course you must stay. We haven't forgotten your kindness to Alicia when we were abroad, have we, Timothy? She said, and Mr. Saunders shook his head. No, certainly not, though I'll be glad never to see another sugar plantation for as long as I live he replied, smiling and shaking his head. What a pretty dress you're wearing, Lily. Is that the one? Oh, it was in Miss Anderson's dress shop, the modiste, she said, and Lily nodded. I thought I'd make an impression. If I'm going to be here for the season, I thought I should make an effort with my dress, Lily replied. Oh, we're going to have such fun, aren't we? It's my first season here, too. I've found Lancashire society, too, somewhat different from London, but not less pleasant because of it. It's a smaller world, of course, and intrigues travel fast. Are still writing the society listings? Alicia asked. In this, too, Lily had not been entirely honest. Her friend knew she wrote accounts of the happenings in London society, but these were factual and informative rather than damning and divisive. In Alicia's mind, 
Lily wrote accounts of pretty ball dresses and the music danced to at this or that aristocratic gathering. She knew nothing of the scandal sheets, and she would surely have been horrified to have learned the truth as to Lily's real occupation. Oh yes, but these things are always planned in advance. I was able to learn all I needed to know before leaving London, and I'll just make up the colours of the dresses, Lily replied, laughing, as Alicia took her by the arm and led her into the throng of guests still crowding the steps up to the assembly rooms. Did you see the Duke and Duchess arrive? She's always so elegant. I've seen her a few times since we arrived here. She's ever so pretty. I feel sorry for her, Alicia said, and Lily looked at her curiously. And why's that? she asked, even as she thought she already knew the answer. She's got a son, but he's a terrible rake, or so everyone says. It must be so awful for her, and no daughter either. I know fathers want sons, but mothers want daughters, don't you think? she asked. Lily smiled. She thought of her own mother, and felt fairly certain she would have rather Lily been born a Luke or a Lance. As for her father, she could not imagine him with a son, and she knew he was proud to call her his daughter. I'm sure they do, she replied, as they made their way up the steps. As they approached the door, the reason for the throng became apparent. Invitations were being checked, and Lily took her forgery from the pocket of her dress, even as Alicia looked at her in surprise. Oh, you've got an invitation. I thought we were going to have to make an excuse. My father supplied all the liquor for the ball this evening. It wouldn't have been a problem, Alicia said, as Lily handed the invitation to the steward. He barely looked at it, and it seemed appearance was what mattered, rather than the invitation itself. In her new dress, slippers, shawl and jewellery, Lily was every bit the society belle, and it was just the appearance she needed to bait the attentions of the Duke's heir. But Lily had no intention of seducing him. She could hardly write about such a thing, nor did she wish to compromise herself in such a way. Her appearance was part of the act. She would befriend Lord Maximilian and attempt to enter his confidence. In this way, Lily could be assured of observing him at close quarters and watching for any sign of scandal on his part. From the accounts she had heard, it seemed the young heir was not averse to the company of any woman on whom his gaze rested, and with so many debutantes and visitors at the ball, Lily felt certain one of them would fall into his trap. They hardly looked at it, Lily said as she and Alicia entered the assembly rooms. A grand room opened up before them, where the swish of ball gowns mingled with laughter and conversation, and musicians played to accompany in the background the formal dancing to take place later. A long refreshment table stood along one side of the room, whilst windows on the other looked out over a terrace and gardens. The doors were open, the place scent of lavender wafted in from outside. Lily enjoyed such occasions, whether she was searching for scandal or not, and she was hopeful of dancing, even if it meant doing so with Lord Maximilian himself. Let's get some punch. I'm not sure I know anyone here. That's the problem with moving to a new place. It takes so long to become acquainted. I recognise a few faces, of course, and one can't mistake the Duke and Duchess, she said, glancing over to where the couple were being received by the Lord Mayor. Lily watched imagining the look on the Duke's face when he read whatever it was she would write about his son. She would ruin him. She would ruin them all. Lily felt a sense of power at the prospect of what was to come. She would bide her time dangling the sword of Damocles above the unsuspecting couple, knowing she could take her father's revenge whenever she desired it. For Lily the scandal sheets were a means of income. But this was different. She had never before written out of spite, for she had never had a reason to do so. Lily told the truth, but this time the truth was different. It was personal. No, they make quite the couple, don't they? She replied. He's ever so handsome. The Duke, I mean. I know he's older, but still, Alicia said, and Lily turned to her and raised her eyebrows. He's twice your age. And married, she said, and Alicia laughed. Oh, I know, but there's something about an older man I find alluring, she said, blushing as Lily shook her head.
She herself was wary of men. She had seen enough of human nature for such wariness to be justified. Even men who appeared to be perfect gentlemen could have their secrets. There were times in London she despaired of ever finding the sort of man she would wish to marry, one who did not behave in the way so many others thought it appropriate to do. Men were, on the whole, rakes, and Lily had had her fair share of rakes. It was why she wrote about them, even as there were any number of women complicit in such behaviour too. What is it about the aristocracy that makes them behave like this? she thought to herself, glancing around the room and picking out various dresses and ball gowns on which to comment when she wrote her report of the ball for the broker press. Every shade and permutation of colour was there, forced onto ill-fitting bodies, be they too tall, too short, too fat or too thin. Fashion was painful, for some more than others, and Lily smiled at some of the sights, shaking her head in astonishment at some of the outfits on display. It's quite a gathering, isn't it? I suppose in the provinces everyone just has to get along with one another, Lily said, as she and Alicia helped themselves to punch. Yes, I've thought that too. In London, you'd never have the likes of a duke and duchess rubbing shoulders with the middle classes like this. They have their balls, the rest have theirs. My father always finds himself stuck in the middle. He's rich enough to rival most any aristocrat, but born so as not to even outrank the lowliest Viscount, Alicia replied, taking a sip of punch. Lily smiled. Such a fact was certain to provide an interesting perspective for her scandal sheet, and she could only imagine the possibilities. I'm sure we'll see some interesting sights, she replied, as now the musicians struck up a waltz. This was the signal for the dancing to begin. But neither Lily nor Alicia had a partner, and they remained on the wall, watching as Alicia's parents joined the throng, led by the Duke and Duchess. There was still no sign of Maximilian, and Lily wondered if he was even going to bother putting in an appearance. He had spoken of how much he detested such events, and Lily could only imagine he had retreated to the inn, where even now he would be ingratiating himself with whatever woman would give him the time of day. But if he doesn't come, what am I going to do? She thought to herself, for she could hardly write a scandal sheet without its subject giving rise to scandal. Chapter 9 Where is he? Ralph hissed, looking around him for any sign of Maximilian. Miriam looked worried. Maximilian was nowhere to be seen, despite having promised to attend the ball at the assembly rooms that evening. Ralph and Miriam had arrived by carriage with much pomp and ceremony to be greeted by the Lord Mayor and fated by the great and good of Lancaster society. But Maximilian was notable by his absence. It was expected of him to be present. He was the heir to the dukedom, and Ralph felt only exasperation at the absence of his son. I'm sure he'll be here soon, Miriam replied. But what he's going to be like when he does arrive... Ralph replied, shaking his head as several fashionably dressed young women curtsied to him as they passed. Your Grace, I really must speak to you about an urgent matter concerning the wheat prices. They've gone up so quickly lately, I fear we'll have a riot on our hands if bread becomes too expensive, the Lord Mayor said, approaching Ralph with a glass of sherry in his hand. Ralph forced a smile to his face and nodded. He was distracted but he knew he could not let it show. But Maximilian proved a perpetual problem to Ralph, and his absence from the ball would not go unnoticed. Ah, yes, a terrible thing. Wars in Europe, I suppose, and importing problems, Ralph said, having only a vague knowledge of what the Lord Mayor was talking about. Well, yes, that's part of the problem, but it's not the whole problem, Your Grace. They're unscrupulous farmers pushing up the prices for their own gain. Now, I'm not accusing anyone particularly, but, the Lord Mayor was saying, but Ralph's attention was now drawn to a commotion in the entrance hallway, where a familiar figure had just appeared. Maximilian, Ralph snarled, and Miriam too turned and gasped. Maximilian was drunk, and he was causing a scene with the master of ceremonies. But it was not just his drunken state attracting attention but the astonishing outfit he was wearing. It had something of a continental style about it. 
foppish and bawdy. Maximilian was wearing a long orange frock coat and a waistcoat of coloured patchwork. He had a tricorn hat on his head and a ruff and cravat in yellow and white silk. His boots were highly polished and his socks pulled up over his breeches, attached with clasps in the shape of golden lion heads. It was a remarkable sight and the whole room was staring at him. Oh, goodness me, Miriam said, raising her hand to her mouth in astonishment. The Lord Mayor was momentarily distracted from his exposition on the price of wheat, and he too stared at Maximilian in disbelief. I demand entry. Don't you know who I am? Can't you see who I am? Or are you just stupid, man? Maximilian was exclaiming, and Ralph groaned. But to his relief, it was William who stepped forward. William, the ever-reliable Baron of Mowbray. A good and trustworthy pair of hands, the very opposite of Maximilian. It's all right. William can take him aside. He won't cause too much of a scene, Miriam whispered. But the damage had been done, and Ralph knew his son had a very long way to go before he could be called the heir to the dukedom, a title he was far from yet worthy of. I demand you allow me entry. I'm not drunk. How dare you suggest such a thing, you arrogant little man? Get your hands off me, Maximilian exclaimed, as the Master of Ceremonies tried to manoeuvre Maximilian back towards the doors of the assembly rooms. If your lordship would be reasonable. I know very well who you are, the Master of Ceremonies replied, but Maximilian dismissed him with an angry shove. Get out of my way, he snarled but before the insulted man could respond, William had appeared at Maximilian's side. Come now, cousin, come and sit down. You can listen to the music and watch the dancing, he said in a hushed tone, taking Maximilian by the arm. Maximilian scowled at the master of ceremonies, who dusted off his lapels, straightened the creases in his waistcoat and glared at Maximilian, who waved his hand dismissively. What are you all looking at? Maximilian snarled as William led him past a group of men and women tutting and shaking their heads. Maximilian had been drinking that afternoon at the inn, though he could not remember precisely what time he had arrived there. It may have been the morning. Eventually the landlord had refused to serve him any more drink, and Maximilian had staggered down the street to the assembly rooms, demanding entry on accord of his rank and privilege. Sit down here, I'll get you some. Not punch. William said, looking suddenly uncertain. Yes, punch, Maximilian demanded, even as William appeared to look around for something other than alcohol to provide him with. At that moment, Anne came over, smiling at Maximilian, who looked up at her as though through a haze. Maximilian liked Anne. She was a kind and considerate woman, gentle and thoughtful. William had made a good match, and her appearance was that of a woman in the first throes of motherhood, radiant and rosy-cheeked. "'How are you, Maximilian?' Anne asked, sitting down next to him, as William brought a cup of warm milk mixed with nutmeg. "'I'm quite all right. Everyone always asks me the same question. But I'm quite all right,' Maximilian replied. He spoke emphatically, even as he could hardly remember his own name. "'Your parents are worried about you,' Anne said, taking Maximilian's hand in hers. Maximilian rolled his eyes. His parents were not worried about him. They were concerned about their own appearance. That was always the way, and Maximilian resented it. He had deliberately dressed in an outlandish and continental fashion and was not ashamed of being flamboyant in his appearance. He sipped the cup of warm milk and sighed. Then why don't they come and speak to me? Am I such a pariah? Maximilian replied glancing over to where his mother and father were talking to the Lord Mayor. It's not that... Well, no one thinks that, Maximilian. But you don't do much to help yourself, do you? William replied. Maximilian looked up at his cousin and scowled. He did not like being lectured. He did like being told what to do by anyone. And what's that supposed to mean? he demanded. William and Anne glanced at one another, and Anne took William's hand in hers and squeezed it. It's not meant as a criticism, Maximilian. But you've got to think about the future. You're to be the next Duke of Lancaster. Doesn't that mean anything to you? Anne asked. In truth, it did not mean much to Maximilian. 
He had always known of his privilege, even as the thought of one day inheriting the title from his father filled him with dread. He did not want to be the next Duke of Lancaster. But birthright and hereditary meant he had no choice but to be so. With a sigh, he shook his head, setting aside the cup of milk and pulling his hand away from Anne, who looked anxiously at him. I don't care about the dukedom. I'm not interested in it. Let it all go to ruin. If I tried, it still would. If I didn't, well, we'll see. I'm good for nothing, and I might as well embrace the fact, Maximilian replied. William and Anne exchanged worried glances, but Maximilian had heard enough, and now he rose to his feet, glancing around him at the other guests and suddenly remembering Lily Porter. She was meant to be in attendance that evening, and Maximilian looked around him, trying to catch a glimpse of her through the throng. But his head was hurting, and his vision blurred. The room was filled with brightly coloured dresses, twirling and whirling in the midst of a waltz. It made Maximilian feel quite ill, and he rose to his feet, dismissing William and Anne with a wave of his hand. Where are you going? his cousin asked. I'm going to take the air on the terrace, it's stifling in here. Besides, I'm not wanted, Maximilian replied, glancing towards his parents, who were now talking together in a far corner of the room. Shall I come with you? William asked, but Maximilian wanted to be alone. He shook his head and staggered off through the throng, catching the hems of several dresses and causing something of a rumpus as he pushed his way towards the doors leading out onto the terrace. Watch what you're doing, one man exclaimed as Maximilian barged into him. Watch what I'm doing? Don't you know who I am? Maximilian demanded, grabbing the man by his lapels. The man shook him off, pushing Maximilian back and laughing. I know just who you are. A pitiable excuse for a man, and entirely unworthy of his apparent succession, he said, straightening his lapels as the woman he was dancing with laughed. Yes, if it weren't for his title, they'd throw him out, she said, as the couple returned to their waltz. Maximilian cursed under his breath and made his way out onto the terrace, where several other couples were taking the evening air. It had been raining, and the gardens were sodden, with large puddles creating patches on the terrace. Maximilian leaned on the parapet, looking down at the flowers in the borders below, the heads of a rose drooping under the weight of the water lying in the petals. I know how it feels, he thought to himself, wishing he had not come, and feeling the burden of expectation lying heavily on his shoulders. He knew what was expected of him but the way he was treated was such as to make him believe no one would ever take him seriously. He was a joke. The whole ton was talking about him, and amidst the limitations of Lancashire society, Maximilian was a laughingstock. He played up to it, of course, and certainly there were times he took delight in it. But it was not the anger of his father he took to heart, but the evident disappointment on the Duke's face. Maximilian was a disappointment to his father, and he knew it. Good for nothing, he said to himself, as though to reinforce what he was certain others thought of him. It was beginning to rain again, and Maximilian made his way back inside, standing next to a column across from the refreshment table and looking around him again for a sight of Lily Porter. He did not know why his thoughts were so drawn to her. But she had interested him. There was a spark about her, a difference not entirely discernible, but alluring nonetheless. She was not quite the same as the silly, giggling women he was used to. Lily Porter was a challenge one Maximilian liked the thought of. I wonder if she's here. Perhaps she's seen me already, Maximilian thought to himself. And now he looked around again, his eyes alighting on a young woman standing alone by one of the columns close to where the musicians were playing. She appeared to be unaccompanied, though Maximilian assumed there would be a chaperone somewhere. She was pretty, dressed in an orange gown with a blue shawl and a fascinator made of peacock feathers. With no sign of Lily Porter anywhere nearby, Maximilian stepped forward, clearing his throat and causing the woman to turn. She looked at him curiously, though with what was surely a little fear. Have I seen you before? Maximilian asked by way of an introduction. The woman blushed. It's my debut, she admitted 
and Maximilian smiled. The warm milk had sobered him, and now he offered the woman his arm. But you know me, don't you? Maximilian asked, smiling at the woman who nodded. You're Lord Maximilian, the Duke's son, she said, as Maximilian drew her closer towards him. That's right. And what pretty name do I call you by? he asked. Amelia Fox, my father's Sir Christopher Fox, the woman said, and Maximilian smiled. Christopher Fox was a landowner in the north of the county, and whom Maximilian's father often had dealings with. Amelia was a sweet creature, pretty, with blonde hair and bright green eyes. Maximilian ran his fingers along her hand, smiling as he raised it to his lips. What a pleasure it is to meet you, he said, his lips lingering for a moment. I'm sure the pleasure's mine too, thank you, Amelia replied. It was always the same. Maximilian was well practised in the art of seduction. He used his position with impunity, and it was rare for a woman like Amelia to resist his charms. You're very welcome, Amelia. What a pretty name that is. French, I suppose, Maximilian replied, drawing Amelia back into the shadows behind the pillars. Another waltz was taking place but Maximilian was far more interested in seduction than dancing. His reputation was already in tatters, and another woman would hardly do anything to dent it further. Besides, Maximilian no longer cared what others thought about him. His mind was on one thing and one thing only. I don't know. Perhaps it is. My grandmother was Amelia too. That's why my mother chose it, I believe, Amelia replied. And she chose very well. She certainly did, Maximilian replied. He was trying his best to be charming. It usually worked. A compliment here. A show of feigned interest there. It's kind of you to say so, Amelia replied. Come a little further back. I hate talking in public. One never knows when one's overheard. Tell me, Amelia, have you ever been to Burnley Abbey before? Maximilian asked. This was another a ploy, the mention of the house, the estate, its grandeur and nobility. It was rare for a woman to resist such enticement, for there were few daughters of society who had not entertained the dream of marrying a duke. I haven't, no. But I hear it's a beautiful house, the finest in the county, and you live there with your parents? How extraordinarily wonderful, Amelia replied. I'd take you there if you wish. Would you like to see it? You'd be very welcome. We could sit in the rose garden. I propagate them myself. I'd pluck one for you. A beautiful rose for a budding debutante, Maximilian said, leading Amelia further back into the shadows. He wanted to kiss her, even as he knew it would cause a scandal if they were seen. But the columns hid them from sight, and with the dance continuing, all eyes were on the throng. Amelia blushed. Oh, I'd be delighted to see it. One hears of Burnley Abbey, but as for seeing it for myself, she said, as Maximilian slipped his hand around her waist. I'd be delighted to show you, he replied, as now he brought his lips to hers and kissed her. Chapter 10 There he is, Alicia said nodding to where Maximilian was making a scene with the Master of Ceremonies. Lily watched in fascination. There was such arrogance in Maximilian's attitude. He was entirely self-entitled, a rake of the First Order. He had pushed the man aside and was now being led away by another man whom Lily did not recognise. Though why should she? She was a stranger here and it was fascinating to watch the scenes going on around her as she acquainted herself with Lancaster society. Isn't he awful? Lily whispered, and Alicia nodded. I don't know what other women see in him. I think he's terrible, she said, shaking her head. But Lily was fascinated, and taking up a position, hidden behind one of the columns supporting the gallery above, Lily watched her subject with interest. He was dressed in the most extraordinary manner, a continental fop, with an orange frock coat and an overly large ruff at the collar. His breeches were held up with what looked like clasps shaped like lion's heads, and the buckles on his shoes were diamante. I'm going to dance with Michael Tanner. He's the son of a friend of father's. 
He's rather charming, Alicia said, as a tall young man with a mop of blonde hair approached them. Lily smiled at him, nodding to Alicia, who hurried off arm in arm with the man, just as a waltz was beginning. Maximilian was deep in conversation with the man who had led him away, joined by a woman whom Lily assumed to be his wife. I wonder what they're saying. He's probably berating him for bringing scandal on the dukedom, Lily thought to herself, smiling as Maximilian now stormed off across the dance floor, barging into several couples and being laughed at as he went. There was something sad and even tragic about him, and Lily shook her head, astonished to think this man would one day inherit the title of Duke of Lancaster. The Duke himself was standing at the far end of the ballroom, and Lily turned her gaze to him, wondering as to what it was that had passed between him and her father. Wicked man. Well, he'll regret it when he sees what I write about his son, Lily thought to herself. She had not expected the matter to be so easy, and had come to Lancaster with only a vague notion of what she might discover. But the heir to the dukedom reeked of scandal. She had only to scratch the surface to discover it. Everyone had an opinion on him, and it seemed there was a great deal more to discover about the rakish heir to one of the noblest titles in the land. Excuse me, might I have this dance? A voice to her side said, and Lily looked up to find a smiling young man offering her his arm. He was around the same age as her, with dark hair and blue eyes. She recognised him as the man with whom Maximilian had just had an altercation on the dance floor, and smiling she nodded. I'd be delighted, she replied, taking his arm. He led her to the dance floor, and as the speed of the waltz increased, they whirled and twirled in a frenzy of skirts and other couples. You dance well, miss, the man said, looking suddenly embarrassed at having not introduced himself properly. Porter, Lily Porter. I'm here with my friend Alicia Saunders. Her father's a merchant and highly successful, Lily replied. Benjamin Attlee. I'm here for the season, staying with my cousin, Lord Martin. I must say I wasn't expecting much society in the North. I'm from London, you see, he replied. Lily smiled. She knew Benjamin Attlee by reputation, though not by sight. She had written about him once, an affair with a married woman twice his age. She was a widower and had taken a string of lovers, including Benjamin, amongst them. But in truth, there were few aristocrats who did not have some sort of scandal attached to them, and compared to others, Benjamin was practically a saint. I am too, though I don't mix much with society there. I like peace and quiet, but it's nice to come to a ball occasionally. Tell me, what do you think of the people here? Lily asked. She knew Benjamin was bound to mention the rakish air, and now he smiled glancing towards the terrace, where Lily could see Maximilian leaning on the parapet. I can't say I think much of it, though I suppose it's concentrated in a place like this, isn't it? In London, one can't move for crowns and coronets. Up here, everyone's rather at close quarters. I was pushed aside by the arrogant air earlier on. A quite ridiculous character, Benjamin said, and Lily nodded. Absolutely, she said as they continued to dance. My cousin doesn't think much of the family, the Duke of Lancaster, I mean. He says there are scandals, though no one quite knows what it's all about. The brother who died, the commoner for a godson, suddenly raised to the heights of a barony, and others, whisperings too. I forget the details now, he said. But Lily had heard enough. Everyone she spoke to had an opinion on the family, and it was never favourable. But it was Maximilian who was the object of her intentions and having gained all she could from Benjamin, she stepped back once the dance was concluded. I'll just use the powder room, Lily said, and Benjamin bowed to her. I hope we can dance again later, he replied, and Lily smiled. Alicia was still with her beau, taking refreshments in an anteroom, and Lily lingered by the doors out onto the terrace, noticing Maximilian was no longer outside. It was raining now, the large drops bouncing on the terrace tiles as a rumble of thunder echoed overhead. Dusk was falling, and the stewards were lighting candles around the ballroom. But in the shadows, 
Lily now noticed two figures, and slipping behind a column, she watched with interest the sight before her. The rake, she said to herself, realising it was Maximilian with a woman, his arm slipped around her waist. I'd be delighted to show you the house next week, perhaps. You should call on me, Maximilian was saying. Well, I'd have to ask my father, the woman replied. Did you need his permission to kiss me? Maximilian asked. No, but, well, one needs a chaperone and I'm not sure. It doesn't seem quite right. Will you visit me? You could speak to my father, the woman said. Or you could just kiss me again, Maximilian replied. Lily was outraged. He was treating the poor woman no more than a slip of a girl, with nothing but rakish contempt. It was as though he saw her as his property to do with as he chose. I'm not sure. We've not been seen, but... Oh, we shouldn't. Please, it doesn't matter for you. But a woman, the woman said, as Maximilian leaned forward to kiss her. But as he did so, she pushed him away, and Maximilian gave an angry cry. It's only harmless fun. Fine, be that way, he said, and he marched off into the throng, leaving the woman in tears. Lily could hardly believe what she was seeing, even as Maximilian's reputation preceded him. She had experienced something of it herself, his rakish behaviour, but never had she expected him to behave quite so outlandishly. The woman was sobbing, and Lily hurried over to comfort her. Are you all right? she asked, and the woman looked up at her in surprise. Oh, I feel such a fool. Did anyone see? You didn't see, did you? she asked, as Lily put her arm around the woman to comfort her. I'm afraid I did. But don't worry, I won't say anything, I promise. What a terrible thing he just did to you. I've never seen such wicked behaviour, Lily said, shaking her head. She led the woman to a chair by the nearest column, lit now by candles burning in sconces on the wall, and introduced herself as Lily Porter. I wasn't spying on you. I just caught sight of what was happening. The way he spoke to you. It was as though he felt entitled to do as he wished with you. It's terrible, Lily said, as the woman, who introduced herself as Amelia, took out a fan. He was charming at first. He told me all about the rose garden at Burnley Abbey. I love roses, the sweet scent, but, she said, her words trailing off. Even the most beautiful roses have thorns, Lily replied, and Amelia nodded. She began to sob, and Lily put both her arms around her to comfort her. The creation of scandal was not the preserve of man. Women could play their part too, and frequently did. But in this case the blame was clear. Amelia was the innocent party. She had done nothing to court the lascivious attentions of Maximilian, and his actions reminded Lily of her first encounter with him outside the inn. There he had assumed it was his right to do as he pleased, and had his friend not interrupted them, Lily felt certain he would have behaved in just the same way with her as he did with Lily. That's very true. He certainly does. And yet, when I rebuffed him, he seemed indifferent. He cast me aside like I was nothing, she said, as tears rolled down her cheeks. Come and take the air outside. I think it's stopped raining, Lily said, and she led Amelia out onto the terrace. It was wet underfoot, but the rain had stopped, and the last of the day's light was lingering on the horizon. The clouds had cleared, leaving a moonlit night, the scent of the garden hanging heavy on the damp air. There was no one else outside, and Lily led Amelia to the end of the terrace where they could not be overheard. She was keen to learn more about Amelia's encounter with Maximilian, determined to make the young heir sorry for what he had done to this poor, innocent creature. I feel such a fool. You must think I'm nothing but a silly child. But the way he spoke, he seemed so genuine in his affections. Any gentleman would have respected my wishes. It was too much. I can't be seen kissing in public, his hands all over me. Oh, what if someone else had seen? Amelia exclaimed, but Lily shook her head. No one saw, it's quite all right. 
and he won't say anything either. He'll just move on to the next poor creature and never give you a second thought. That's what these sorts of men are like. They cast one aside in favour of, well, themselves, Lily replied. She felt sorry for Amelia. She was young and naive, but no fool. It was fortunate she had not given in to Maximilian's advances, fortunate for herself. Lily always wrote the truth. She did not elaborate, nor speculate, and if she observed something, it would be included in her report. There were times she held things back or played their revelation to her advantage. But the truth was the truth, and Lily always told the truth, however unpalatable. That's what he's done. It's horrible. I don't know how he gets away with it. Does every woman think they might be the one? I knew of him, of course. I was flattered by his attentions, at first. But his indifference when I refused. He looked cold and distant. I was scared of him, Amelia said. Lily patted Amelia's arm, wanting to reassure her, and for Amelia to trust her. She wanted to discover as much as she could about the encounter, even as she did not appear as though she was prying. It would take considerable skill to weave the story together into a scandal sheet. She would not allow Amelia to be identified, nor did she want Amelia to realise it was she who had written it. I'm not surprised. It's terrible. I can't imagine what I'd do in your place, she said, and Amelia shook her head. I just... Oh, why can't men be decent? I know some are, but an incident like this... It hardly gives one faith in the opposite sex, does it? she said. Lily shook her head. She had seen enough of what men were capable of to know Amelia was right. Women could create scandals, but it was more likely to be the seduction of a man leading them into it. Men were not to be trusted, and Lily herself had never done so. She was reserved when it came to romance, and always took the attentions of a man as a matter of ulterior motive. But Lily could act well enough to get the things she wanted, and she was not above filtration to achieve her ends. It doesn't know, quite the opposite, in fact. It's hard to know if you can ever trust a man to be a decent sort, Lily said. Well, I'm just glad I've someone to comfort me. But I should be going. I'll tell my father to take me home. I'll say I've got a Megrim. He won't question it. I'm grateful to you, Lily, even though I know there's nothing you can do to help me. It's my mistake and I'll have to live with it, Amelia said. Lily smiled. There was a great deal she could do, even as Amelia would never know the truth. You'll find these sorts of men usually get their comeuppance, she said, as they made their way back inside. The ball was coming to an end, and the guests were now dispersing, calling out their farewells to one another across the room. There was no sign of Maximilian, and Lily felt glad to have avoided him. She had thought about the possibility of creating her own scandal to write about but that with Amelia was so much better than a contrived encounter. The thought of allowing the heir to the dukedom to take advantage of her made her feel quite ill, and whilst she felt sorry for Amelia, she was glad it was she and not Lily herself who had borne the brunt of his attentions. I hope I'll see you again. The season's just beginning, Amelia said, as they bid one another goodbye. Lily nodded. She liked Amelia and she was determined to do what she could to help her. Who was that? Alicia asked, as she came up to Lily a moment later. Oh, just a new acquaintance. I think we'll get on rather well, she said, turning to Alicia, who smiled. Well, I've got all sorts of things to tell you. Michael Tanner's quite the catch, Alicia said. But Lily's thoughts were elsewhere, and she was looking forward to being alone with her quill and papers the beginnings of the scandal sheet now forming in her mind. Chapter 11 Amelia, oh no, not Amelia, no names, the young woman caught in the flagrant embrace. No, should that be lascivious embrace? Tactile embrace. No, it sounds as bad as it was. He put his arms around her. He accosted her behind the column. Snatching her away from the safety of the dance, the heir to one of the greatest dukedoms in the land made his rakish advances towards her. She was wholly innocent, a lamb led to the slaughter, a dove 
No, less highfalutin language. The poor creature, the innocent, caught in the clutches of a devouring beast. No, perhaps not beast, Lily thought to herself, laying aside her quill with a sigh. Having returned to the home of Alicia's parents, Lily had made her excuses and gone straight to bed. Alicia had wanted to stay up and talk. Michael Tanner had swept her off her feet, and he was going to call on her the very next day. I think I might be in love, Alicia had said, confiding in Lily as soon as her parents were out of earshot. Lily was pleased for Alicia, but her mind was elsewhere, and she had wanted to begin writing her scandal sheet as soon as possible. The room was comfortably furnished, and Lily was sitting at a writing desk by the window, surrounded by pieces of paper, all of them covered in her attempts at writing the account of the ball that evening. I don't want anyone to know it was Amelia whom Maximilian seduced. She was a delightful creature, naive, but delightful. I won't have her brought down, Lily thought to herself, taking a fresh piece of paper and beginning to write. There were times when Lily had no qualms in revealing the part played by a woman in a scandal. As she so oft repeated to herself, she wrote the truth. And if a woman was party to scandal, so be it. But Amelia had been visibly upset by Maximilian's actions. She was, though Lily would not write it as such, an innocent lamb, hunted by a wolf. It was that wolf Lily intended to slay, and not the lambs on which it preyed. She thought of her father, knowing he would be pleased at all she had discovered in her short time in Lancaster. And the look on the Duke's face when he reads it, and realises everyone else has too, Lily thought to herself. She began her new account innocuously enough, a description of the ball gowns and music, before turning her attentions to the more interesting guests. The Duke and Duchess Lancaster arrived with much accolade and ceremony. The Duchess dressed in a most beautiful ball gown of blue satin, white lace trim and pearls. They were followed by the arrival of their son, Lord Maximilian, whose continental style of dress mirrored his forthcoming behaviour, Lily wrote, smiling at this tipping point between the public events of the ball and the scandal no one else yet knew about. As long as I keep Amelia's name out of it, Lily reminded herself, yawning, as she set down her quill. The events Amelia had recounted, and those Lily herself had observed, were clear in her mind. Maximilian had used his power and position to attempt seduction, and when Amelia had rebuffed him, he had discarded her without a second thought. Utterly wicked, utterly rakish, Lily said to herself, shaking her head as she continued to write. A duke might well have his choice of dancing partner, but to choose for himself and force his affections on unsuspecting innocence is something quite different. Was the Duke observed doing just this? Several sources attest he was. What sort of example is that to set? The heir to one of the noblest titles in the land, nothing more than a common womanizer. Lily wrote. She yawned again, glancing at the bed, the blankets of which had been turned back with an inviting suggestion. Lily was tired. The bed at the inn had been far from comfortable, and the ball that evening had been a long, drawn-out affair. She laid aside her quill and rose to her feet, intending to return to the matter the following morning. With no maid to help her, Lily got ready for bed, slipping between the sheets and pulling the blanket up around her. She blew out the candle at her bedside, plunging the room into darkness, and closed her eyes. I wonder if anyone else has ever dared write about the Dukes of Lancaster in such a way, Lily wondered to herself, pleased to think she could be the first, and intending to make her father proud in doing so. Isn't this wonderful, Lily? I do love balls. The dresses, the dancing, the refreshments. One feels so... alive. Oh, look, there's Michael Tanner. Isn't he so handsome? Have you ever seen a man like him, his uniform... Oh, I could gaze at him all day. Look, he's coming over to us, Alicia exclaimed. Lily glanced over to where Alicia was pointing and to where a handsome man in the uniform of the king's militia was approaching them. He took Alicia's hand in his and raised it to his lips. Lily curtsied and he smiled, offering Alicia his arm. 
I'm sorry if I'm about to take away your friend, miss, he asked, turning to Alicia, who smiled. This is my friend Lily. She's come from London for the season. You don't mind if we dance, do you, Lily? she asked, and Lily shook her head. It would have been churlish to object, even as Lily was now left alone at the edge of the ballroom, watching as other couples joined the throng of dancers taking up the waltz. The ball, it seemed, was a highlight of the season, and all of Lancaster society was there to witness it. She looked around her with interest. The Duke and Duchess had arrived and were now being fated by the Lord Mayor. But a commotion at the door now distracted everyone's attention, and Lily watched as the heir, Maximilian, made a scene with the Master of Ceremonies. Get your hands off me. Don't you know who I am? I want to be drunk. I'll be here drunk, Maximilian was saying. Lily smiled. There was something amusing about him even as he cut a tragic figure. Don't feel sorry for him, she told herself, shaking her head as Maximilian was led away. Eventually he made another spectacle of himself and went out onto the terrace, leaving a wake of scandal in his place. I suppose he has his charms. He's a duke and wealthy. Most women could put up with his defects, Lily thought to herself, and with no one else to talk to, curiosity got the better of her. She made her way to the doors of the terrace, watching as Maximilian stood leaning on the parapet, looking out over the gardens. Lily was about to slip away, having observed him for a few moments, but as she did so, Maximilian called out to her. I've been waiting for you. I hoped I'd see you, he said. Lily paused, uncertain of what to do. She had wanted only to observe him, but now she could hardly run away. He would be bound to follow her. Stepping forward, she approached him with caution, and he turned to her and smiled. Dusk was gathering, but she could still make out his face and the curious outfit he was wearing, an orange frock coat and a collar and ruff. I didn't think you'd give me a second thought, Lily said, but Maximilian shook his head. I've given you any number of thoughts since we first met. You're quite a delightful creature, he said, and Lily smiled. She knew what he was doing. He wanted to seduce her, just as he sought to seduce so many other women too. But curiosity had gotten the better of her, and Lily was eager to discover all she could about the man whose downfall she intended to bring about. Am I? Do you say that to every woman? She asked and to her surprise, Maximilian sighed. Not every woman, no, not most, in fact. That's what they'd like to think, of course. It's what my reputation says of me. I play up to it, of course. But then, I don't know anything different. That's my problem. Why should a leopard change its spots, or is it stripes? I can never remember. But it's what they expect of me. I'm a rake, so why not behave like one, he said. Lily was taken aback. She had not expected him to speak like this, and now she found herself feeling almost sorry for him, even as she knew such thoughts were nonsense. He was everything he believed himself to be, and the sooner the truth was known, the better. Well, I suppose reputations are hard to alter, she said. Maximilian shrugged. Yes, so why bother? he asked, turning to her with a smile. Lily felt conflicted. She had always vowed not to create scandal in order to write about it. But her feelings for the Duke were such as to make the matter an exception. She thought of her father, knowing he would encourage this as a means to an end. Lily returned Maximilian's smile. I suppose that's true. What do you intend? she asked. To ask you to dance with me, she said, offering her his arm. The arrogance of his words made her shudder even as Lily maintained her composure. There was something so infuriating about his sense of entitlement, but swallowing her pride, Lily took his arm. I'd be delighted, she said as he led her back inside. It felt strange to be on his arm, to have him so close to her, and now to join the throng of dancers in the waltz. He danced well, his arm around her waist, ever drawing her closer into his embrace. When the music came to an end, they stepped back, and Maximilian bowed to Lily, taking her hand in his and raising it to his lips. A delightful dance, Miss Porter, he said, 
and Lily was surprised he even remembered her name. It was, wasn't it, she said, as they stepped behind the columns running the length of the room. Dusk was falling, and candles were being lit in sconces on the walls, casting flickering shadows all around. Maximilian led Lily into a dark corner and leaned on the wall with a sigh. Lily was curious as to his intentions. She found him repulsive in his behaviour, though there was no denying his handsome looks. He, the heir to one of the most ancient and noble dukedoms in the land, a man of wealth and privilege, for whom any woman could surely fall if given over to materialist pursuits. But whatever charms he possessed were hidden behind a veneer of rakish self-entitlement, and it seemed he had become so used to living up to his reputation, it was now second nature. What really brings you here, Miss Porter? Do you leave behind some scandal in London? Maximilian asked, and Lily blushed. Not at all, no. I've left nothing behind I wouldn't bring with me, she replied, thinking him quite impertinent for asking. I wouldn't mind if you did. Too many women make themselves out to be perfect when they're far from that, he replied, leaning his shoulder on the wall next to her and turning to face her. And too many men, Lily began, checking her words before she said something she regretted. He raised his eyebrows. Too many men, he asked, and Lily blushed. Too many men think women are like that. Women can be as imperfect as men, I assure you, she said, and Maximilian laughed. Absolutely. The fairer sex isn't always fair, he replied. Again, Lily felt almost sorry for him. Had an experience with a woman soured him for life. Perhaps he had been mistreated by a woman, led along the garden path, only to be rejected at the last moment. Men could be rakish brutes, but women could be subtle in their seductions and swift in their revenge. You're right. Though I'm sure no woman would ever admit as much, Lily replied. But men? Well, I did, didn't I? I told you just what I was like and you still danced with me. I was honest, he said, and Lily smiled. You were, and I'm sure that counts for something, she replied. So, you don't come here to escape a scandal. But perhaps you come here in search of something, or someone. What is it you're looking for? he asked. Lily was not prepared for this question. She was not looking for anything in particular, apart from that which she could not reveal to him. He cocked his head to one side, narrowing his eyes in the flickering candlelight of the nearest sconce. I, well, I suppose I'm not looking for anything in particular. I don't know quite what to say, she replied, finding herself unexpectedly lost for words. You could say you're looking for a man who understands what it's like to be different. You've run away from something, I can tell. It's not always easy fitting in, is it? I know I don't, Maximilian said, smiling at Lily, who blushed. His words resonated with her. He was right. She did not fit in. Lily had forged her own path, never conforming to the expectations of others. In this, she resembled Maximilian himself at least on his own account. And now she nodded as he took her hand in his. You're right, yes, I didn't really fit in, but, well, it's strange to say so, but I find I'm already comfortable here. In Lancaster, I mean. I like the society here, she said as he edged a little closer to her, still gazing into her eyes with a smile on his face. At close proximity, it was easy to see why other women had fallen for his charms, his chiselled looks, his swept-back hair, the expression on his face. I'm glad. I think the society here likes you too, he replied, and to Lily's astonishment, he leaned forward and kissed her. But it was her own reaction she found most remarkable, for instead of pushing him away, she kissed him back. As their lips parted, he smiled, resting his forehead against hers, his arms around her waist. I... Lily stammered for nothing about her encounter with Maximilian had been expected. You didn't resist, he said, smiling at her. Lily realised what she had done, horrified by how easily she had been seduced. She stared up at him with fearful eyes, as now he laughed and attempted to kiss her again. No, you mustn't, I won't. I can't, 
she said, and Maximilian looked at her curiously. Very well, if that's how you feel, he said, turning. He made to leave. She caught his arm, confused as to her feelings for him, feelings she hardly dared admit to, even as they felt very real. But I... I don't know. We shouldn't have... I'm... I'm not... She stammered, but he waved his hand dismissively. Not like that, I know. That's what they all say. They lay the blame on me and that's that. You'll speak about it, I'm sure. The rakish heir to the dukedom, snatching a kiss from you. But your own kiss was just as passionate, he said, and without waiting for her reply, he slipped between the columns and out into the throng of dancers, leaving Lily hurt and confused. What happened? she exclaimed out loud, opening her eyes and sitting bolt upright in bed. It had all been a dream, but what a remarkable dream it had been, those same feelings lingering in a most unexpected manner. Chapter 12 The orange frock coat lay discarded on the floor, and the lion head clips and ruff were lying next it, the detritus of the previous night scattered across Maximilian's bedroom. He had only just woken up and had rolled onto his side, groaning at the memories of the previous evening. The ball had been just as Maximilian had feared, dull, and had done nothing to improve his reputation, even as Maximilian had made no attempt to use it to his advantage. The carriage ride home had passed in silence and his parents had remained pursed-lipped, even as Maximilian had tried to lighten the mood. Better to leave sober than drunk, he had said, but his father had merely scowled at him and shook his head. Maximilian knew they were disappointed in him, but he was past caring, and now his thoughts turned to the foolish girl he had kissed. What was her name? Amelia Fox, that's right, the son of Sir Christopher Fox. If she tells her father, he'll make a fuss, Maximilian said out loud, rolling out of bed onto the floor and lying on his back, staring up at the ceiling and laughing. It had all been a marvellous joke, and the thought of the look on Amelia's face after he had kissed her was priceless. What did she expect? he said out loud, rising to his feet and inspecting the mess around his room. He picked a few things up, shaking his head at the outrageously coloured frock coat, ordered especially from a French merchant in Liverpool. What was I thinking? he said out loud, just as a knock came at the door. I've brought your morning tea, my lord, the voice of one of the maids called out. Leave it outside, I'm just getting dressed, Maximilian replied. He opened the door a moment later, finding the steaming cup of tea on a tray, along with the morning's periodicals. There was the Lancaster Observer, the Northern Call, and the latest offering from the Broker Press. Maximilian always enjoyed reading the outlandish claims of Mr. Broker, conspiracies, plots, exposure of secret societies, the list went on, and the Broker Press specialised in the reporting of those things no respectable outlet would dream of printing, and it was always the first periodical Maximilian would open. Look at this, what nonsense, overthrowing the government, a popish plot here in Lancashire, the discovery of a well built by fairies. Oh. Really, Maximilian said to himself, rolling his eyes as he sipped his tea and flicked idly through the periodical. But to his astonishment, a separate piece of paper fluttered from between the pages, its headline immediately grabbing his attention. Behind the columns with Lord Maximilian, Maximilian read. He set down his cup, snatching up the paper and beginning to read. It was an account of the ball at the assembly rooms. It began innocuously enough with a description of the setting, the colours of the dresses, and the music played. But when the guests had been listed, attention was turned to Maximilian himself, and what he read next astonished him. The heir to the dukedom took to his liking innocent woman on the very day of her debut. She was easily led astray, caught up in his charms and seduced by his promises. But this was a wolf in sheep's clothing and the kiss he gave her was the stealing of her innocence for his own carnality. Maximilian read, his eyes growing wide at the details of the encounter between himself and Amelia, even as she herself was never named. 
It was extraordinary, and Maximilian could hardly believe himself to be the subject of such a scandalous description. It must be her. It must be Amelia Fox. Who else could have written it, he thought to himself, shaking his head in astonishment. Despite his years of rakish behaviour, Maximilian had never found himself the subject of such an account. His name had never found itself into the respectable periodicals of Lancaster, and even the Brooker Press had confined itself to far-fetched stories rather than the proceeds of scandal. Maximilian was uncertain what to think, even as he knew what his father and mother would say when they discovered it. I'll be the talk of the ton, he thought to himself, smiling as he read through the text again. It amused him to think of himself written about in this way, a prowling wolf seeking to devour an innocent lamb. But Amelia Fox was a fool if she thought she would get away with it, and Maximilian now vowed to seek her out and make her pay for writing such things about him. He could write a scandal sheet of his own, replying to her accusations in kind, and now he ran his tongue over his lips, imagining what he might print in reply. The little harlot, desperate for the attentions of the heir to the dukedom, flaunting herself, throwing herself, at me. What could I do against such an onslaught? I resisted her, and then she kissed me before making it seem I was the one in the wrong. Oh, but wait, there's more. Her father has debts. Yes, terrible debts, and so she attempts to hold me to ransom to save her family, but I refuse, noble to the last. I won't give in. And so she publishes these lies about me. Dreadful lies, he thought to himself, smiling as he realised he could destroy Amelia's reputation, just as she was attempting to destroy his too. Having finished his tea and examined the other periodicals briefly, Maximilian dressed and made his way downstairs. He planned to spend what was left of the morning in the rose garden, hardly caring about the contents of the scandal sheet and wanting only to have fun with the foolish woman who had dared print such slander. But as he came to the bottom of the stairs, the door to his father's study opened and the Duke stood before him with an angry expression on his face. What's the meaning of this, Maximilian? he said, holding up the scandal sheet, even as Maximilian waved his hand dismissively. Oh, that? It's nothing. Just a lot of lies and silly talk. I never thought I'd see the like here. You hear of them in London, of course, but, he said, as now his father advanced towards him. Don't laugh it off, Maximilian. I won't have it. I won't have this. You've gone too far this time, the Duke exclaimed. Maximilian rolled his eyes. It was hardly his fault. A silly, childish girl had printed something outlandish. The salons and drawing rooms of the county would digest it, then move on to something else. It hardly mattered, even as Maximilian had every intention of responding to it. Have I? And do you believe everything you read in the broker press? Last month, that old fool was telling everyone we'd soon be sending messages across the Atlantic. He called it a telegram. Did you believe that? Maximilian asked. His father's eyes narrowed. I don't like our name being dragged through the mud, Maximilian. It worries me. What else will they write about you? He asked. Maximilian shrugged. He did not know what else there was to write about him. The story was always the same, and any number of women could offer their grievances if they wished. The matter would soon blow over, even as Maximilian had no intention of forgetting what Amelia had done. They can write what they like. No one reads those things anyway, Maximilian said, waving his hand dismissively. But even as he spoke, two of the maids appeared from the drawing room, carrying coal scuttles. They were whispering to one another and had not seen Maximilian and his father standing by the study door. And when Mr Gregson read out the bit about him kissing her behind the columns, I nearly shrieked with laughter. It was the way it was described calling him a lech and a womanizer. He is, though, isn't he? One of them said. The other was about to respond when Maximilian cleared his throat, and the two maids looked up in horror. You were saying? His father asked, looking pointedly at Maximilian, even as the two maids began apologising profusely. I beg your pardon, my lord, we were just... It's not... She stammered. Maximilian sighed. You were just repeating what Mr. Gregson read to you, 
Yes, I'm sure, Maximilian replied, and the two maids hurried off, red in the face with embarrassment. The Duke shook his head. You humiliated us last night, Maximilian. I'm the Duke of Lancaster. I'm expected to behave in a certain way, and my family is too. You made a fool of me, and you shamed your poor mother. And now this. Am I to read of my son's exploits on a weekly basis at the courtesy of Mr. Broker? It doesn't matter if it's true or not, the point is he publishes it. That's all that matters. Was it the girl who wrote it? Who is she? he asked. Amelia Fox, Sir Christopher Fox's daughter. Yes, she wrote it. I'm certain of it. No one else could have known the details, he said. The Duke pondered for a moment. I wonder, perhaps there's a way to have her retract her words. It won't be easy, though. I just can't believe... Oh, I wish you'd be, he began. But Maximilian finished the sentence for him. More like William? Yes, I know that's what you think. William doesn't have scandal sheets printed about him. He's not subject to the gossip pages, is he? Well, I'm sorry, Father, but I am. And there's nothing to be done about it, is there? It's printed in black and white, whether truth or lies, Maximilian said, shaking his head. He had heard enough. His father's reaction was entirely predictable, and Maximilian was tired of repeating the same things over and over again. There's something very clear to be done about it, Maximilian. Put a stop to it. Don't allow yourself to be the subject or reason of it. If there's no scandal, there's no scandal sheet, the Duke said, and tossing the offending article aside, he retreated to his study, slamming the door behind him as he went. Maximilian sighed, shaking his head as he picked up the sheet and read through it again. The words were damning, and there was no doubting their ruinous intention. The writer had spared no detail of the scandal, and Maximilian could deny the accuracy of the words. I did kiss her, and she rebuked me. Perhaps I shouldn't have tried again, but most women don't mind, he thought to himself, thinking back to past conquests. But Amelia had minded, and now she had written her objections for all to see. She had called him a rake and a womanizer, a man with low morals, arrogant in his own position and self-assurance. It was what so many others thought, Maximilian knew that, but to see it written in black and white for all to see. It's pretty damning, isn't it, he thought to himself, as he made his way out into the rose garden, where the perfumed scent of the blooms hung on the warm afternoon breeze. He had promised to show Amelia the rose garden, but now he would be glad if no woman, except perhaps his mother and Anne, ever set eyes on such beauty. They were not worthy of it, and as he retreated into the refuge of the rose garden, he wondered if perhaps his time had run out. I suppose it was to be expected, he thought to himself, as he began to prune a large rose bush growing on the wall at the back of the garden. It had peach-coloured flowers and a heady scent, sweet and intoxicating. Like the allure of so many women, Maximilian thought to himself. He did not know why he behaved as he did. Such rakish behaviour did not come naturally to him, or rather it was not the way he had been raised. But Maximilian was rebellious, and there was something about his actions he found pleasing, his father's anger notwithstanding. He enjoyed the exhilaration of the act, the filtration, the possibility of the kiss. Women were alluringly attractive, and Maximilian knew he would not so easily change his ways. And what comes next? William, with his moralising. My mother, with her look of disappointment. Another scandal sheet, he wondered. The thought came to him suddenly, causing his stomach to churn. If one woman could write such damning things about him, why not all the rest? There would be other women who would see the printed words and remember their own experiences at Maximilian's hands. Emily. Susan. Rebecca. Charlotte. Louisa. The names rolled off his tongue even as the details were obscured. A kiss, an embrace, a brief liaison in the dark corner of a ballroom or salon. It was all there, waiting to be exposed. Maximilian sighed. 
Then we await the onslaught, he told himself, even as he felt tired of forever being thought of as a rake. But to change his ways would not be easy, and even if he did, would anyone believe he had done so? Maximilian could change. He could deny himself those pleasures he had long since indulged in, but would it really make any difference to his reputation? Not one bit, he said to himself as he continued with his pruning. Chapter 13 The heir to the dukedom took to his liking an innocent woman on the very day of her debut. She was easily led astray, caught up in his charms and seduced by his promises. But this was a wolf in sheep's clothing, and the kiss he gave her was the stealing of her innocence for his own carnality. His behaviour was shocking, and he showed little regard as he cast off the poor creature, having satiated his lust. Oh, really, have you seen this, Lily? Who writes these kinds of things? It's extraordinary, Alicia exclaimed, as the two of them sat at luncheon the day after the ball at the assembly rooms. Lily smiled, looking across the table with an innocent expression on her face. Oh, what is it? she asked, as Alicia handed over the offending article, tutting and shaking her head. It's one of those scandal sheets. You see them in London, but I didn't think I'd ever see one here in Lancaster. It's just terrible. I don't know why Mother takes such things. She's always reading these odd tracts and pamphlets. The Broker Press, I think it's called, last week some odd description of the stars aligning as a sign of impending doom, then wild claims about the Regent being a French spy, and now it seems they've turned their attention to scandal-mongering. It's so distasteful, she said even as Lily smiled to think her friend had read the whole thing, whether finding it distasteful or not. Lily, of course, knew all the details. She had risen early, finished her piece about the ball, and her description of Maximilian's rakish behaviour, before slipping out and making her way to the broker press. Mr Broker had been only too glad to see her, and he had been impressed by what she had written, setting it to print at once. Even now, copies were being distributed across Lancaster and further afield, so that there would soon not be a drawing room or salon without an account of the happening at last night's ball. It's quite extraordinary, isn't it? Lily said, reading over her own words, as Alicia tutted. Oh, but it can't be true. They'll print anything, won't they? It titillates, of course. But for the subject, well, he's the heir to dukedom. I've heard rumours about him, of course, but, well, it can't be true, can it? Alicia said, shaking her head. Lily raised her eyebrows. She had never thought of Alicia as being in any sense naive, but there was a propensity amongst the merchant classes to believe the aristocracy to be beyond reproach. Title and privilege was something to aspire to, and to discover the human frailties of such people was to discover an unpalatable truth. Why not? Didn't you see the way he behaved when he arrived? He was already drunk and making a scene. Why not another? And why not with another? Lily replied. Alicia furrowed her brow. Well, it just seems very far-fetched. And where's the right to reply? Doesn't Maximilian have the right to defend himself? She asked. Lily did not think so. She had simply laid down the facts as she had observed them. If Lily had learned anything from her years of writing such scandal sheets, it was that reporting the facts was a certain way of ensuring there could be no defence. What Maximilian had done was wrong, and it was Amelia Fox who had borne the brunt of it. And if it's true, if he's done these things, what do you think of him then? Lily asked, fixing Alicia with a pointed expression. Her friend looked at her in confusion. I don't understand why you're defending it so... I was merely passing a comment. I just think... Well, it seems terribly unfair on the Duke's heir. Anyone could write anything about him. Still, if he's guilty of it... I suppose it's justified, she said, and Lily nodded. In her mind... It was entirely justified, and she felt glad to have set about the work her father had entrusted her with. He would surely be pleased to learn of the scandal engulfing the Duke's son, 
and she wondered what the Duke himself would have to say when he read of Maximilian's exploits. I think it is, yes. If a man or a woman behaves like that, they deserve everything that comes of it, Lily replied. But you don't think the woman here is to blame? Perhaps she seduced him, or perhaps she was out to entrap him. You hear of such things, the seductress. Women aren't always wholly innocent, are they? Alicia said. Lily's instinct was to defend Amelia. She was the innocent party, and to have any suggestion as to the contrary was wrong. But Lily could not do so without revealing herself as the author of the scandal sheet, and given Alicia's reaction to it, she feared her friend would not understand anything of her motives. Women are capable of causing scandal just as men are, Lily replied. But not in this case. Did you see anything? I was dancing with Michael Tanner the whole evening. Oh, I hope he calls on me. Do you think he will? Alicia asked. Lily was glad of the change in conversation, and it was not difficult to now steer Alicia away from the subject of the scandal sheets and onto thoughts of a more romantic nature. Do you think he's the one for you? Lily asked, after Alicia had swooned over Michael's attentions to her at the ball. They had left the dining room and were sitting out in the garden. Alicia's parents' house, let for the season, was a handsome dwelling, set on the road leading to the Burnley Abbey estate. It had a walled garden, where an ancient orchard grew, the fruit trees now in blossom, and with views across the countryside to the grand edifice of the abbey beyond. Lily's parents had gone out for the day, and it was pleasant to sit together in the garden talking as young women do. Well, I hope so, but I don't know. He's charming, and I want him to call on me. But do you think I'm rather caught up in the romance of it all? Alicia asked. Lily smiled. She knew little of romance, at least in her own experience, but she had observed a great deal of what others called romance, but what often descended merely into scandal. There's nothing wrong with falling in love, she said, and Alicia smiled. No, you're right. There's nothing wrong with it at all. It's entirely natural, but I'm not sure if my parents approve or not. They've got aspirations, you see. Michael's a man of business, but he's hardly at the upper end of society, Alicia said. Lily smiled. But would they really want you to marry a man who is? You read that scandal sheet. Isn't Maximilian Oakley at the very heights of societal expectation? Any mother would be delighted to think of her daughter marrying the heir to one of the noblest and wealthiest dukedoms in the country, until she read the scandal papers, of course. All that glitters isn't gold, Lily said, raising her eyebrows. She had a healthy distrust of the aristocracy, born of her experiences with the scandal papers. Lily knew too much about such people to accept them as they presented themselves. Behind the masquerades, scandal lurked, and it was only a matter of teasing it out. Alicia nodded. Yes, there's that, I suppose. Michael seems a perfectly respectable choice. He's got good prospects, and I wonder sometimes, well, I think my father thinks more of us than others do. He's a merchant, albeit a successful one. But we don't have true wealth or title, she said. Then you've answered your own question. If you're in love with Michael Tanner, so be it, Lily replied. But that's just the point. I don't know if I am. It's all so confusing. Anyway, it doesn't matter, does it? If it's meant to be, it'll be. You were dancing with a rather nice gentleman. Benjamin, wasn't it? Alicia asked. In her hurry to write the scandal paper, and after all she had observed at the ball, Lily had forgotten her brief dance with the gentleman named Benjamin Attlee. Oh, him? Yes, he was charming, Lily said, and Alicia raised her eyebrows. You never give much away, Lily. I never really know what you're thinking. Do you like him? Do you hope he'll call? My parents wouldn't mind if he did, she said, but Lily shook her head. She had no intention of receiving any gentleman callers during her time in Lancaster. She had come to the north with the sole intention of discovering the scandal now unfolding before her eyes. If anything, it had been far too easy. Maximilian had presented himself to her on her arrival, and since that moment he had done nothing but provide precisely the sort of scandal she desired to write about. But as for what came next, 
Lily was uncertain. When a scandal sheet was written, it was launched into calm seas with the hope of creating a storm. Even now, the fashionable members of Lancastrian society would be picking over the details, scandalised, and yet continuing to read and casting furtive glances at one another lest they be next. But perhaps some would even agree with the sentiments expressed, and the floodgates would be open for further accusations to emerge. I don't mind. I don't particularly court the attentions of men. I'm not interested in such things, Lily said. Alicia looked at her curiously. But don't you want to get married? I'm sure your mother wants you to, she said, and Lily laughed. Her mother did want to see her married, but she also wanted to see her stop writing scandal sheets and distance herself from her father. Mothers did not always get what they wanted for their daughters, and Lily knew her father would never force her to marry any man. Men aren't to be trusted, neither are most women, he had once told her, and Lily had taken those words to heart. I'm sure she does, but I don't. If I meet a man, I suppose it's a possibility. But I'm not looking, and I'm not anxious to find one here, Lily replied. Her purpose was clear, to write the scandal sheets and see her father vindicated. But in truth, Lily did not know what her publication would bring about. It was clear Maximilian had a reputation, and what was written about him would surely come as no surprise to many members of the Ton. But would it encourage further revelations, or would it simply be forgotten? Another piece of scandal, lost in a sea of affairs, liaisons and illicit behaviour. I need something more, something to continue the momentum, Lily told herself, for a scandal was only as titillating as its next instalment. A person could be utterly despised one moment and vindicated the next. A scandal could emerge on a Monday and be forgotten by Friday. Such was the fickle nature of society. There's a letter for you, miss, the maid said, appearing in the garden and bringing with her a tray of tea accessories. Lily was surprised. She was not expecting a letter, but it turned out to be from her mother. And when Alicia had poured the tea, its fragrant aroma filling the air, Lily read it out loud. My dear Lily, the house feels empty without you, and I find myself at a loss without your company, a strange thing considering how often we disagree. But I write this brief letter to offer you my blessing in your sojourn to the north. I have written to Alicia's parents too, thanking them for their kindness to you. I was ever so worried when you upped and left without an escort or a chaperone, but I have every confidence you will be well taken care of. Alicia is such a sensible young lady, and I hope you will find in her the example of one who is settling down. Despite missing you dreadfully, I can only be pleased to think of you away from London and, Lily read, pausing here, for the next part of the letter made reference to the writing of the scandal sheets. Alicia looked up. Why is she pleased you're away from London? I think we're going to be terribly bored by the end of the season. Alicia said. Oh, only because she thinks my father's a bad influence on me. That's all, Lily replied, folding the letter and placing it in her pocket. Your poor father, the things you told me about him. It's such an injustice, Alicia said, for she had been lodging with Alicia and her mother during Lily's father's trial, and Lily had told her many of the details as to why her father's imprisonment was unjust. Lily nodded. Her father was the reason why she was doing as she was doing. He was innocent. But whilst the Duke of Lancaster resided in his handsome dwelling, surrounded by servants and with all the trappings of wealth and privilege, her own father languished at the pleasure of the regent in a grim penitentiary. There was no justice in that, and the thought of it alone was enough to spurn Lily on in her resolve to see Maximilian brought to ruin. You're right and I feel guilty for enjoying myself here, when he finds himself under such reduced circumstances. Still, I know he'd want me to be happy, Lily said, and Alicia nodded. He would, and I hope you are. We've got the ball at the omen of the Count and Countess of Morecambe to look forward to. They say it's a more intimate affair than that at the assembly rooms. The invitations are more exclusive. The Countess is something of a snob. 
If an income falls below 10,000 a year, she doesn't issue a return invitation. But fortunately for us, father's income is far above that. Will you wear that pretty pink dress again? Alicia asked, and Lily nodded. I will do, yes, she said, hoping the ball would be another opportunity to observe Maximilian and see his downfall continue. Chapter 14 She's a frightful old bore, and a complete snob too. I wouldn't mind telling it to her face. Don't you remember last year? She had the Marchioness of Halifax thrown out because of her affair with the Duke of Glyneborn. I can't stand the woman. And I know just what she'll think of me too. I'm sure she's an avid reader, Maximilian said, as his mother looked at him imploringly. Oh please, Maximilian, just for once, won't you do as you're told? the Duchess said, and Maximilian sighed. They were sitting in the drawing room. His mother was drinking tea and Maximilian was drinking brandy, despite it being only three o'clock in the afternoon. It was the day of the ball held by the Count and Countess of Morecambe, and Maximilian's mother was trying to persuade him to go. It's not a matter of doing what I'm told, mother. I know I won't be welcome there, not after what was written in that damn scandal paper, Maximilian replied. His feelings towards the broker press had verged from initial amusement to a realisation of just what such words could do to his reputation. It was one thing for others to gossip behind his back, but to have his deeds appear in black and white was something else. Maximilian was no fool, and whilst he had resigned himself to always being a rake, the fact of his actions now confronting him in this way had given him pause for thought. Then all the more reason to attend the ball. The Countess won't say anything. Your father has patronage over her husband's estate. She's not going to cause a scene. Why can't you go to the ball and behave properly, Maximilian? Show the world you can change. You'll be forgiven for your past misdemeanours, she said. But Maximilian shook his head. He knew the ways of the Tarn well enough to know they were slow to forgive or forget. Scandals came and went, but memories were long, and his many faults would not be easily laid aside in favour of a restoration of his reputation. You're looking at me through a mother's eyes, he said, and the Duchess smiled. That's how it is, Maximilian. I can't see you in any other way. Try not to worry about what others might think, but don't give rise to any further scandal. If you don't, it won't be printed, will it? She said. In this, Maximilian thought his mother somewhat naive. To the people who wrote such things, the truth hardly mattered. It was the story that counted, whether made up or not. Maximilian could spend the rest of his life pruning roses and never speaking to another woman ever again. And still the words would be written and his reputation tarnished. Better to just get on and do it, he thought to himself. For if the truth did not matter, what reason would there be to attempt to save his own reputation? Please come to the ball, Maximilian. It's expected of you. Don't upset your father any more. He loves you, and he only wants you to learn from your mistakes, the Duchess said. Maximilian rolled his eyes. It was certainly not as easy as that. His father wanted far more. He wanted Maximilian to be like William. That was the fact of the matter, and as long as that possibility went unrealised, Maximilian would continue to be a disappointment. And if I don't learn from them? Maximilian asked, finishing his glass of brandy and rising to his feet. His mother looked at him sadly. Well, then I don't know what's going to happen, she replied. What a fine house, Lily said, peering out of the carriage window, and she and Alicia, along with Alicia's parents, drew up outside the home of the Count and Countess of Morcam. It was meant to be the dower house for Burnley Abbey, but the previous Duchess refused to live in it. She wanted to stay at the Abbey, so it was given over to the Count and Countess, Alicia's father said. The house was built of red brick with tall chimneys rising from a steeply inclined roof. It was covered in ivy, with a large portico and steps running up to open doors, where liveried footmen stood in attendance on either side. Several other carriages were drawn up, their occupants emerging in a flurry of fascinators and silk. 
I wonder if the Duke and Duchess will be here this evening, Lily said, glancing at Alicia who shook her head. I can't imagine they will be, not after what was written about their son. Could you imagine daring to show your face after such scandalous things were written? Alicia replied. Her mother shook her head. I think it's quite terrible. One wonders who writes these things. What do they gain from it? It only causes trouble for all involved, she said, shaking her head. Lily smiled, maintaining her composure with an innocent look on her face. I couldn't possibly imagine. I suppose there are benefits to revealing such things, she said, as a footman now opened the carriage door to them. The aristocracy. It's not all to be admired, Alicia's father said, shaking his head. They climbed down from the carriage, but as they did so, another carriage drew up and Alicia pointed to the crest on the side. Oh, look, it's them. It's the Duke and Duchess and... Oh, he's here too, she exclaimed. Lily watched as the carriage drew up at the bottom of the steps and the footman hurried to open the compartment door, standing at attention as the occupants climbed out. There was the Duke and Duchess and following them was Maximilian. He was dressed far more conservatively in a black frock coat, matching his father's and blue breeches, with a white shirt and yellow cravat at the neck. He looks almost ordinary, as though nothing happened the other night. He's got quite a nerve, Lily whispered, and around them similar sentiments were expressed behind fluttering fans. As he entered the house, Maximilian glanced behind him, catching Lily's eye for just a moment. She held his gaze, wondering what he was thinking. Did he even remember her? It seemed extraordinary for him to appear at the ball given what she had written about him. But in Lily's experience there were two responses to the scandal sheets. An individual either hid themselves away, refusing visitors and invitations, and waiting for the matter to die down. Or they made a blatant attempt at denial, pretending as though nothing had been written about them, and carrying on regardless. It seemed Maximilian had chosen the latter, for good or ill. I'm surprised he's got the nerve. Did you read about what he did? I certainly won't be finding myself behind any columns, a woman to Lily's right said, and others expressed similar sentiments. Lily was pleased. She had been successful, and there was a certain satisfaction in hearing others talking about what she had written, about what she had exposed. Everyone's talking about him. Alicia said, taking Lily's arm in hers, as the two of them made their way inside. The Duke and Duchess were just ahead of them, talking to a pearl-clad woman in a red dress whom Lily presumed to be the Countess of Morecambe. Maximilian was nowhere to be seen, and Lily could not help but wonder what he expected to achieve by attending a ball at which he was universally unwelcome. It seemed the ton had woken up to his rakish ways, and the chatter all around them suggested Maximilian's reputation lay in tatters. Mr. and Mrs. Saunders, how good to see you. And with Alicia and Miss Porter, the Countess said, as the Master of Ceremonies announced their arrival. Lily took the Countess's hand and smiled. It's a pleasure to be here, my lady, she said, curtsying to the Countess, who seemed to approve. We like to encourage men of business in the county. And of course, our cellars are well stocked, thanks to your excellent recommendations, Mr. Saunders, the Countess said. There was an air of snobbery about her, just as Alicia had suggested. But Mr. Saunders was more than capable of holding his own, and he complimented the Countess on her home, thanking her for the graciousness of her invitation. We were surprised to see the Duke and Duchess here. Alicia's mother said, and the Countess gave a nervous laugh. Oh, and why's that? she asked. Well, the awful things printed about their son in the broker press this week. I don't think I could bring myself to show my face. It's quite terrible, Alicia's mother said, and the Countess leaned forward and lowered her voice. You're right, of course, it's a scandal. He's always behaved like that. It was only a matter of time before someone wrote about it. It serves him right. He's nothing but a rake. When our granddaughter was staying with us last year, he, well, it wouldn't be right for me to say. But she won't come back, the Countess said, glancing over her shoulder 
just as Maximilian swaggered into view. He seemed entirely oblivious to the fact of his being the chief preoccupation of the gathered guests. No one was talking to him, but they were all talking about him. The Countess now turned to greet the next guests, leaving Lily, Alicia and Alicia's parents to make their way into the ballroom. It was a lavish setting, decorated with flowers and foliage, redolent of a classical painting. Refreshment tables were set alongside one side of the room, and a quartet of musicians were playing at the far end as the guests milled back and forth, waiting for the dancing to begin. Is Michael Tanner going to be here? Lily asked as she and Alicia helped themselves to punch from an ornate glass bowl. No, he's not rich enough for the Countess, Alicia said, looking somewhat disappointed. Then who else is here? Do you know anyone? Lily asked, for she was keen to learn as much about the society she now inhabited as possible. Alicia looked around the room, nodding, before pointing discreetly to a couple sitting together against the far wall. I don't know many people by sight, but that's surely the Duke and Duchess of Crawshaw. He's blind, you know. Can you see the way he's sitting? It's as though he's staring out at nothing, she whispered. Lily looked with interest at the couple. They were perhaps the same age as the Duke and Duchess of Lancaster. He was greying but with a handsome face, even as his eyes were blank. She was a pretty creature, dressed in blue, and with a fascinator of wax fruits and feathers on her head. How extraordinary. One can't imagine being blind, Lily said. They have a son too, I believe. Ernest, that's his name. I've heard my mother talk about him, but I don't know much more about them than that. As for everyone else, well, I don't really know anyone by sight. Apart from Maximilian, of course, Alicia replied. Lily glanced around her, looking to catch sight of the errant heir. She saw him by the refreshment table, helping himself to punch. He had an arrogant look about him, and still appeared entirely oblivious to the fact he was the centre of everyone's attention. Look at him! He's quite ridiculous, isn't he? Swaggering around without a care in the world, Lily said. She could feel her anger towards Maximilian growing. She resented him, for he represented everything her father had lost. Maximilian deserved none of the trappings of wealth and privilege he enjoyed, and yet he was handed it on a silver platter whilst her father languished in the jail. There was no justice in the matter, even as Lily was determined to make the dukedom pay for what it had done to her father. You certainly seem interested in him, Lily, Alicia said, and Lily turned to her in surprise. Well, isn't everyone interested in him at the moment? He's nothing but a rake. I couldn't care less about him, unless he intends to subject another innocent creature to his lascivious advances, she replied. And if he does, what can you do about it? I'm sure there are still many naive young creatures waiting to be devoured at his hands, Alicia replied. Lily nodded. It was true. Even the most scandal-ridden rakes attracted a certain type of woman. There were those who enjoyed the thrill of association, and those for whom their own compromises necessitated such a match. A rake like Maximilian, even exposed, still presented a threat. Undoubtedly so. That's why we need to keep our eyes on him, Alicia. Vigilance. That's the only way, Lily replied, still watching as Maximilian lingered by the refreshment table. Will you dance, Lily? They're going to begin shortly. We should find partners, father, I suppose. We can take it in turns to dance with him, Alicia said, but Lily's mind was preoccupied. She could not take her eyes off Maximilian, waiting for him to make a false move, willing him to fall into scandal. In her mind, her quill was poised, waiting for Maximilian to make one false move. Mr. Broker had paid her an advance for a further three scandal papers, and Lily had every intention of delivering on her word. You go ahead. I'll take the next dance, Lily replied, before following Maximilian's course from the opposite side of the room. He was looking around him, trying to catch the eyes of various young women, none of whom were responding. There was a growing look of frustration on his face, and again he returned to the refreshment table, replenishing his glass of punch. And when he's had a drink, he's worse, Lily said to herself, for her first encounter with Maximilian had been when he was drunk. Would you dance with him? 
a woman to her side asked, and Lily looked up in surprise. A woman not much older than herself was watching Maximilian too. Lily smiled and shook her head. I really don't know much about him, she lied. The woman smiled. I rather like him. He's dangerous. The men here are such bores. But Maximilian, there's something rather alluring about him, don't you think? she asked. Lily shook her head. I couldn't possibly say, she replied, glancing again at Maximilian, who was now speaking to a pair of giggling young women who appeared oblivious to his reputation. I might take the risk. You never know. Isn't it worth it to be a duchess, she said, before slipping off into the throng and making her way towards where Maximilian had now been rebuffed. Lily could not take her eyes off the duke's air. She was fascinated by him. The blatant manner in which he behaved, oblivious to the trail of destruction he had left behind him. There was no shame in him, and that was what really angered Lily. He had no conscience, or so it seemed, as to those things he had done, and the women he had hurt. Lily could only imagine how Amelia was feeling now, and whilst she had been careful to avoid identifying the object of Maximilian's scandal, she knew Amelia would realise someone had been watching them. Are you going to stare at him all evening? Alicia asked, as she returned from dancing with her father. Lily turned to her friend and blushed. I wasn't staring at him, she said, glancing again at Maximilian, who was now dancing with the woman who had seemed so keen to gain his attention. You've done nothing but look at him all evening. Why are you so interested in him? Alicia asked. But Lily dismissed her with a wave of her hand, not wishing for Alicia to pry too closely into the reasons for her close observation of Maximilian. Oh, Alicia, it's nothing. He just... interests me, that's all, Lily said, turning away, even as she had already gathered much information for her next scandal paper. Well, he doesn't interest me. He was looking at me very oddly before. He's been looking at everyone. I wonder who he suspects of writing about him. I hope he doesn't think it's me, Alicia replied, and Lily smiled. There were dozens of suspects, and Lily rather liked the thought of being hidden in plain sight. Oh, I'm sure he's got his ideas, Lily replied, glancing again at Maximilian, who was even now leading the woman he had danced with into a darkened corner of the room. Chapter 15 It came as no surprise to Maximilian when he was rudely awakened the following morning, or was it afternoon, by a loud knocking at his bedroom door and the sound of his father's angry voice coming from outside. Get up, Maximilian. I want you to see this. I want you to see the things they've written about you again, the Duke exclaimed, hammering louder on the door as Maximilian threw back the covers and rose from his bed. He could remember few details about the previous evening, even as it seemed he was about to be reminded of them by the words written in the scandal papers. Opening his bedroom door, he found his father standing there, red-faced and angry. He was holding the offending document in his hand, his eyes ablaze, as he thrust it towards Maximilian, who took it and began to read. The antics of the itinerant heir know no bounds. Not content with his conquest at the assembly rooms, Maximilian sought out a new flesh pot at the home of the Count and Countess of Morcam. Oblivious to the feelings against him, he preyed on yet another unsuspecting victim, dancing with her, before retreating to the recesses of the anteroom, where he... Maximilian read, his eyes growing wide at the lurid description of an act for which he had little or no recollection. There had been a woman, certainly but it was she who had approached him. Maximilian remembered her now. She was tall and elegantly dressed, wearing a peacock blue dress and a shawl with overly sized tassels hanging from it. They had spoken, and Maximilian had offered her a glass of punch. A waltz had begun, and Maximilian had invited the woman to dance. What do you have to say for yourself? the Duke demanded, and Maximilian shrugged. Well, I don't know. Perhaps it's true, he said, reading the lurid description over once again. Perhaps? You mean you don't know if it is or isn't? 
Can't you remember? Oh, Maximilian, this is too much. Am I to read about your exploits every day of the week? Maximilian's father replied, snatching the scandal sheet from Maximilian's hands and tearing it in half. It seemed to Maximilian as though there was now to be a concerted vendetta against him. One scandal paper was unfortunate, but a series... Someone has it in for me, he thought to himself, and now he pondered who could be responsible for writing such things about him. It would have to be someone in attendance at both the assembly room ball and that held by the Count and Countess of Morecambe. Only actual observation would allow for such facts to be known. The Countess was a snob and only invited those with title and money, or one or the other, to her balls. That meant most of the guests at the assembly rooms could be discounted. The author would not be a simple artisan or member of the middle classes. Besides, despite its subject matter, there was a certain flair to the writing, suggestive of education. Not every day, I hope, Maximilian replied. His father gave him a withering look. Why can't you just be like William? I doubt anyone could find anything worth writing about him, do you? The Duke exclaimed. Maximilian was in no mood to argue. His father was right. William was faultless, as was Anne. Only he, the Duke's heir, would find himself the subject of further copies, and it seemed whoever was writing the scandal sheets had no intention of stopping. No, because he lives a perfectly dull existence, entirely at your bidding, father, Maximilian retorted. There had been a time when William's own life had been touched by scandal, and the circumstances of his birth would bring about a far greater scandal than a snatched fumble in the dark recesses of a ballroom. But that was a different matter, and the protagonists in that affair were sworn to secrecy. Maximilian would not betray his family, despite the constant berating of him. Maximilian, I... I don't want to say this, but I'm beginning to think you might be better off somewhere else. You could go abroad and allow the passage of time to heal your reputation. It won't do so here, not with someone printing these lies. Well, no, truths about you, the Duke said, shaking his head. Maximilian sighed. He did not want to be sent abroad, and he felt certain his life would be little different whether in Florence, Paris or Lancaster. On the continent, he would remain a rake, and in the exotic climes of foreign religion and culture perhaps he would sink to even greater lows. I admit they write the truth, father, but I really don't remember much about it. And besides, what gives this person the right to say these things about me? Who are they? Do you know? Does the broker press reveal its sources? I doubt it. Anyone can publish anything if they've got a printing press. You once said yourself what an old fool that broker fellow is. Well, isn't he proving it? Maximilian replied, growing suddenly defensive. But it's being believed, Maximilian. It doesn't matter if it's true or not, though it is, isn't it? It's the fact it's been printed at all. You're destroying your reputation by your actions, and someone out there is only too glad to help you do so. I can't stop the broker press from printing these things, even if I wanted to. No, going abroad. It might be the only way to teach you a lesson, the Duke said, shaking his head. Maximilian sighed. He did not want to go abroad. He liked Lancaster. It was his home. He had grown up in the county and knew nothing else but its rolling hills and moorland, its pleasant waterways and farmland. There was the rose garden, too. Who would tend it if he was to be exiled? I'll find out who's writing this. I'll make them pay, he said, stooping to pick up the torn fragments of the scandal paper. His father shook his head. It'll hardly do you any good, Maximilian. They'll only go on writing it, he said. And with that, he turned on his heels and marched off along the corridor, leaving Maximilian standing at his bedroom door, still in his nightshirt, despite it being noon. With a sigh, Maximilian tried to piece together the torn fragments, thinking over who might possibly intend his downfall. He had suspected Amelia Fox at first. She had been privy to the event recounted in the first scandal paper. She had been at the event. But Maximilian had made a point of inquiring as to her attendance at the ball the previous evening, and the Countess of Morecambe had informed him she had not been invited. 
I don't tend to invite women like that, was all she had said, and Maximilian had assumed Amelia Fox to be neither wealthy nor well-connected enough to warrant an invitation. But if it's not her, who is it? Maximilian asked himself, thinking over those he had recognised the previous evening. There had been the usual progression of the local aristocracy, minor titles, Lord this and Lady that, a smattering of dukes, the Earl of Winsbury, and a Russian princess, living in exile, whom no one was entirely sure what to do with when it came to social airs and graces. Maximilian did not suspect any of them of having written the scandal paper, and that left the collection of young women for whom the ball had served primarily as a place of encounter. That merchant girl, Saunders, she was there, and at the assembly rooms, and she had a friend with her too. Where did I recognise her from? Oh, yes, the inn. Lily someone. Porter. That's right, Lily Porter. But why would she be interested in the goings-on of the provincial ton? But Alicia, yes, for her own ends, perhaps. And then there was the woman I was dancing with. What was her name? Liana? No? Lorita? That's right. She was very keen to dance with me. Perhaps she's creating her own scandal so as to write about it, Maximilian thought to himself, and he continued in this way for much of the rest of the day, as he went about his pruning in the rose garden, pondering who could hate him so much as to desire nothing but his downfall. You weren't seen, were you? the printer asked as he ushered Lily into the disused watermill. It was early in the morning, and Lily had slipped out before the rest of the household was awake, bringing with her another scandal paper for the broker press. There was a tramp asleep in a ditch, but he didn't see me. I was careful, Lily replied, handing over the piece of paper she had sat up all night to write. It contained details of some of Maximilian's exploits at Burnley Abbey. Lily had made contact with a disgruntled maid, dismissed for stealing from the Abbey, and to whom she had paid a handsome sum for information of a historical nature. Lily had not seen Maximilian since the evening of the ball at the home of the Count and Countess of Morecambe, and it had seemed necessary to keep the momentum going by publishing something to give weight to the current allegations. The maid had held forth and held nothing back. And what do you have for me? Mr. Broker asked, unfolding the piece of paper and beginning to read. A smile came over his face, and he nodded approvingly. Yes, very good. And you're certain it's true, all this stuff about the library and the nighttime visitors? he asked. Lily nodded. She had no reason to disbelieve the maid, who had spoken candidly about Maximilian's many illicit exploits. It's all true, yes. He's a wicked rake, and the sooner he's exposed, the better. Will you print it? she asked. And Mr. Broker nodded. I'm the most popular periodical in the county thanks to your scandal sheet. It's the talk of every salon and drawing room from here to Halifax. I'll print it, and I hope you'll promise me more too, he said, and Lily nodded. She felt certain there was more to come, and not just the revelations of history. It was Lily's intention to expose a scandal so great as to bring down the dukedom and see the whole family humiliated. There was surely more to come, some greater scandal to be revealed. Maximilian could not help himself. He was a rake through and through, a man for whom scandal was second nature, even as his parents had tried desperately to control him. I promise you something, special next time, she said, and the printer raised his eyebrows. Is that so? And what do you mean by that? he asked. Lily was still not certain, even as she felt it necessary to promise something more than just the ordinary. The drawing rooms would soon grow tired of tittle-tattle over foolish women led into dark recesses and an errant air with lascivious tastes. What came next had to be something monumental. It had to be the difference between rise and fall, the very destruction of the dukedom itself. This was what she had promised her father, and now she promised Mr. Broker too. Well, something to truly expose him for what he is. I've been watching him, you see and I feel certain there's something more, something I'm yet to discover. Just give me time, Lily said. The printer nodded. 
Well, you've increased my profits tenfold. I've got a string of businesses wanting to take out advertisements in the next edition. Very well, Miss Porter. I'll pay you a second advance and look forward to receiving whatever you find me. As long as it's the truth, Mr. Broker replied. Lily smiled. She prided herself on the truth. What she wrote was always the truth, even if it meant uncomfortable reading for those whom it was the truth about. As she left the watermill that morning and hurried back to Alicia's parents' house, Lily could not help but hope she was right. I'm certain I am, she told herself, feeling convinced she would soon discover what was necessary to drive a final nail into the coffin and see her father avenged. Chapter 16 The Miller Howe Ball. It's a highlight of the season, or so they say, Alicia's mother said as they sat over breakfast two days later. Alicia groaned. They say everything's a highlight, mother, but it's never anything like a London ball, is it? I don't even know who they are, foolish individuals who've never set foot out of the county. We've been to two balls so far, and I can't say I've found anything particularly exciting about either of them. Don't you agree, Lily? Alicia asked, looking up at Lily, who nodded. Oh, yes, they're quite different, she replied. Her mind was preoccupied with thoughts of the scandal paper. She had still not written her promised piece, for she had not had sight nor sound of Maximilian since last setting eyes on him at the ball hosted by the Count and Countess of Morcan. It seemed he was lying low and had retreated to the safety of Burnley Abbey to lick his wounds. The maid, whom Lily had previously gained her information from, had left for a new job in London, and thus Lily's sources of information were limited. She needed something to maintain the momentum, and she could only hope the Miller Howe ball would provide her with fresh inspiration. They're dull, whether someone writes about the apparent scandals or not, Alicia said, and her mother tutted. Well, you could liven things up a little by shopping for new gloves and bonnets. Why don't you go to the market and choose something new for yourselves, she suggested. Lily and Alicia looked at one another and smiled. That's a wonderful idea, Mother. Yes, let's do that. We'll go after breakfast. It's market day today. I know we're in the provinces, but there's bound to be someone selling something of good taste, isn't there? Alicia asked. Lily agreed, and when they had finished breakfast, the two women set off together, walking along the country lane leading into Lancaster and arriving in the market square just as the stalls were opening. There were all manner of things for sale food and drink, lace and buttons, tools and equipment for tradesmen. One woman was selling freshly cut flowers, whilst another offered hot chestnuts and dried fruit. It was a delight for the senses, and Lily and Alicia wandered amongst the stalls, pointing at things to buy. Oh, look, silk shawls. They're really rather nice, Lily said, as they paused at a stall, where a wizened old woman was embroidering a flower onto the edge of one of the shawls. Something for the Miller Howe ball, is it? she asked, and Lily nodded. That's right, but it's gloves we're looking for, she said, and the woman nodded. My sister sells beautiful gloves. You'll find her stall in front of the town hall, she said, pointing across the market square. And thanking the woman, Lily and Alicia made their way to the other stall, finding all manner of gloves neatly laid out. These are very pretty, Alicia said trying on a pair of lace-trimmed mittens and holding them up for Lily to see. Oh, yes, very pretty, but I want something more delicate. Ah, here we are, she said, taking up a pair of gloves, made of silk, and coming in three different colours. The proprietress, who resembled the wizened old woman exactly, nodded to them. You'll not find finer gloves than these, she said as Lily tried on several pairs. I think I'll take the white ones. They'll go nicely with a pink dress I've got, she said, and Alicia chose a pair in blue. A new hat, I think. We might as well treat ourselves. I haven't been shopping at an absolute age. It's fun, isn't it? Alicia said, and Lily smiled. She was glad to have Alicia's company. She was a dear friend to her, and the two of them acted as one another's chaperones. This was Lily's greatest advantage when it came to observing Maximilian. No one thought her out of place or questioned why she was there. In Lancaster, Lily was Alicia's companion, and there was respectability in that, 
along with the reassuring presence of Alicia's parents. But as they made their way towards a stall selling hats, Lily could not help but notice the number of women, and some men, with their heads buried in the latest edition from the broker press. I just can't wait to read what's published next about him. Can you believe it? One woman was saying, and others too expressed similar sentiments. He's a disaster waiting to happen. Can you imagine him as the Duke of Lancaster? Impossible. He'd be nothing like his father. It would be far better to make the Baron of Mowbray Duke in his place. He's such a delightful man, another replied. As they approached the millinery stall, with its impressive array of headpieces, it was clear as to the general consensus concerning Maximilian and the scandal sheets. Lily's words had been believed, and the heir to the dukedom was humiliated. One more paper, one more scandal. That was all it would take to bring down the dukedom and see her father avenged. Everyone's talking about the scandal papers. It's become a complete obsession, Alicia said, shaking her head and tutting. I suppose people believe what they read, Lily replied. They had come to the stall now and the two of them were set to try on new hats and bonnets. There were hats for every occasion, from flamboyant headpieces covered in wax fruit to tasteful arrangements of feathers and lace. Bonnets for mourning, hats for church, and those more suited to celebratory occasions. It was fun to try them on, and both Lily and Alicia chose new pieces of millinery to complement their gloves. You look very pretty, Lily. You always do in hats. They suit you so well, Alicia said, as the milliner held up a mirror for them. Lily was examining herself in the mirror, turning this way and that, adjusting the angle of the wide-brimmed hat she had chosen. The perfect choice for summer days, when the sun was strong. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button this way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. But as she tilted her head, a sight in the mirror caused her to startle. There, reflected in the glass, was Maximilian. He was watching them, and now he strode forward, as Lily's eyes grew wide with trepidation. Look, Alicia, look who's coming towards us, Lily exclaimed, her heart racing at the sight of Maximilian approaching. She had not even thought he remembered her from the evening of her arrival, even as they had exchanged glances at the ball the other night. Alicia too looked anxious, and the pair of them turned, still with the hats they were yet to buy on their heads. Maximilian looked them up and down and smiled. Again, he seemed oblivious to the fact of his being the centre of attention. And now he smirked as Lily and Alicia hurriedly removed their hats. I thought they rather suited you both, he said, as Lily and Alicia stood meekly before him. For all her bravado, Lily was not prepared to face him as she was. She conducted her affairs on her own terms and had not intended to approach him until the Miller Howe Ball. She wondered now if he suspected something and was about to accuse her of being the author of the scandal sheets. We were just trying them on. We haven't made a decision yet, Lily replied, and Maximilian smiled. Is that so? Well, let me make it for you. The wide-brimmed one for you, Miss Porter, and the less gregarious one for Miss Saunders, he replied. Lily was surprised. She had not expected him to remember her name. The shock was evidently clear on her face as Maximilian laughed. I... I hadn't thought, she said, but he waved his hand dismissively. I make it my business to know those with whom I'm to share the season. You were both at the assembly rooms, weren't you? And then at the ball given by the Count and Countess of Morecambe, both quite interminable affairs, though few were unfortunate enough to attend both. But you two were he said, raising his eyebrows and fixing his gaze accusingly on Alicia, who appeared terribly uncomfortable under his unflinching stare. We were there, yes, as were so many others, your parents included, Lily retorted. Maximilian looked again at her and smiled. Yes, and I suppose you've read all about me in the scandal sheets. They're everywhere. I've seen at least a dozen people reading them today. It's quite extraordinary. They seemed to grip their readers with the force of their sensation. 
One wonders what they'll publish next, he said, glancing again at Alicia, as though he suspected her of being the author. We've certainly read about you, yes. That doesn't mean we've formed an opinion, Lily said, attempting to draw Maximilian away from the possibility of one of them being responsible for the authorship. Lily knew she could not afford to make any mistakes in this unexpected encounter. He had taken them by surprise and was using it to his advantage. But to her surprise, Lily found herself thinking back to the strange events of her dream, of finding herself in the place of Amelia, seduced by Maximilian, and even enjoying it. He is handsome, I suppose, she thought to herself, as Maximilian continued to complain about what had been written about him. I'm defenceless, of course. There's no right of reply in any of this. They could write anything they wanted, whether it be the truth or not. It's quite terrible. My reputation's in tatters, though it was already, I suppose. I'm a laughing stock. I'm surprised you're even talking to me, he said, raising his eyebrows. Lily smiled. Like I said, we've not yet made our minds up about you. I hardly know you. We have scandal sheets in London. I don't pay any attention to them, she said, still attempting to deflect his suspicion. Oh, but I'm sure you do. You've already formed your opinion of me, Miss Porter. For example, I'm certain you won't dance with me at the Miller Howe Ball, he said, looking pointedly at Lily. Her heart skipped a beat. She had not been expecting him to be so forward. Was he baiting her? Was this a test? Lily was used to maintaining her composure, giving nothing away, and now she smiled at him, realising this may also be the perfect opportunity to secure the information she needed. I'd be delighted, she said, and Alicia caught her by the arm. Lily, what are you doing? she hissed. Maximilian, too, looked somewhat surprised at this agreement, appearing he had expected an immediate rebuttal. Ah, well, I'm glad to hear it. I'll be there then, and I'm sure you'll look very pretty in your new hat and gloves, he said, giving Lily a curt bow and glancing at Alicia as he slipped away into the crowd. What were you thinking? You can't dance with him. It's... no, he'll do something awful with you. You know what he's like. You've read the scandal sheets. Why do you think it'll be any different with you? I knew you were looking at him. You like him, don't you? You think there's something to him. Handsome looks, wealth and title. Well, if that's all it takes to sway you, Alicia exclaimed. Lily might have reminded her friend as to how many women had been easily swayed by just those things, but instead she shook her head and smiled. I'm willing to give him a chance. Don't you think I can take care of myself, Alicia? I'm not some innocent lamb waiting to be devoured by the wolf. I know just what he's like. Besides, it's only a dance, Lily replied, even as she knew she was stepping into the lion's den. She had not intended to make herself the subject of the scandal. That was one of her rules, to observe at a distance and never interfere. But this was different, or so she told herself, and the end would justify the means. Maximilian had presented her with a possibility, one she could hardly refuse. Lily had promised the broker press her copy. It could not just be a regurgitation of past events, as intriguing as they might be, but had to be of such proportions as to entirely ruin those about whom it was written. She would not lie, but by making herself the centre of attention, Lily knew she could write an account which would spell the end of Maximilian and his family. Only a dance? And what then? He'll expect more of you. I saw the way he looked at us. It was as though he thought us easy prey for his attentions. Oh, it makes me shudder to think of him. And yet you seemed entirely at ease with the prospect of finding yourself in his arms, Alicia said, shaking her head. They paid for their new hats, and having made a tour of the remaining stalls, purchasing new handkerchiefs and ribbons, they made their way back to Alicia's parents' house. Lily knew Alicia was entirely against her intention to dance with Maximilian. She could not understand it, and said as much when her mother asked if they had enjoyed themselves at the market. I think Lily's enjoying herself too much. She's only agreed to dance with Maximilian Oakley, Alicia exclaimed, tutting and shaking her head. Mrs Saunders, too, looked somewhat perturbed, 
raising her eyebrows as she sipped her post-luncheon coffee in the drawing room. Really, Lily? I'm not sure about that. I know he's the son of a duke, but one only has to read of his reputation, she said, glancing at the pile of periodicals on a table in the corner of the room. Lily was well aware of the risks, even as Alicia and her mother knew nothing as to the truth of her motivation. She was taking a great personal risk, more so than she had ever done before. In the past, Lily had merely been a passive observer in the downfall of others. She had documented it, being careful to ascertain only the truth from her sources. She was always one step removed, and never directly involved. But this was different. It was the Duke of Lancaster who had ruined her father. He and his family were responsible for her father's incarceration and humiliation. It was personal, and thus her approach was entirely justified. Well, I see no reason to believe the scandal sheets. Perhaps they're wrong about Maximilian. I prefer to make up my own mind rather than reading what someone else writes, Lily said, knowing just how hypocritical she was being. Alicia's mother looked perturbed, and Alicia too shook her head. It's not a good idea, Lily, Alicia said. It's only a dance, and if he behaves inappropriately, I'll stamp on his foot, Lily said. Alicia smiled. I suppose if anyone's going to be a match for him, it's you, Lily, she replied, and Lily nodded. She was a match for Maximilian, and she was not about to have her identity as the author of the scandal sheets revealed. The Miller Howe Ball was the perfect opportunity to realise her ambitions against Maximilian and open the possibility of scandal in whatever form it might take. As she and Alicia prepared for the ball, Lily knew this was the moment she had been waiting for. Her father would be proud of her, and she would vindicate him in the eyes of the world. For too long, men like the Duke of Lancaster and his aristocratic friends had lauded it over ordinary people and placed themselves beyond rebuke. But not now, Lily said to herself, smiling at the thought of what might happen when she found herself in Maximilian's arms. Hope it was something entirely worthy of scandal. Chapter 17 I'm surprised you're not putting up a fuss and a fight, Maximilian. You usually detest these sorts of things, the Duke said, as Maximilian climbed into the waiting carriage with his parents. He was dressed sensibly, in tails and necktie, black breeches, polished shoes, and a starched collar and shirt. He appeared every bit the gentleman and had gone to some considerable efforts over his appearance. I don't always behave like a rake, father, he replied, raising his eyebrows as the duke shook his head. You hardly make it easy to discern the difference, Maximilian. Still, if you're intending on behaving tonight, I'll not complain, he said. Maximilian was not doing any of this for his father, but he had promised his mother the Miller Howe ball would be different. He would be a gentleman, or at least give the appearance of being one. Maximilian glanced at his mother, who gave him a reassuring smile. I think you look very handsome, Maximilian. I'm sure you'll find a respectable young lady to dance with, she said. The Duke snorted. Respectable? Maximilian? I doubt it, he said. But Maximilian already had his trump card, and smiling he addressed his father directly. Actually, she's very respectable. It's all arranged, father, he said. And the duke looked at him in surprise, as did his mother, though she tried to hide it behind her fan. You've arranged to dance with someone, he said, raising his eyebrows, and Maximilian nodded. Yes, she's a friend of the daughter of the merchant, Timothy Saunders. Doesn't he sell you wine, father? We met at the market yesterday. She and her friend were buying new gloves and bonnets. A charming creature. We got talking and... I asked if she'd be at the ball this evening. She said yes and the arrangement was made, Maximilian replied. He liked the fact of his father's surprise. Lily Porter was no foolish slip of a girl, nor did she come from a dubious background, even as Maximilian was uncertain as to precisely what that background was. Nevertheless, she was certainly respectable, and whilst she was not possessed of title, she was well connected to the up-and-coming classes, 
evident in her friendship with the merchant's daughter. The Duke looked pleased. Well, I can only applaud you, Maximilian. The Saunders are a respectable couple. The daughter's called Alicia, I believe. I must say I'm a little surprised, but pleasantly so. If this is what you intend, so be it. You have my blessing, he said. Maximilian had not realised just how much such words would mean. He was taken aback by them, for he could not remember the last time his father had admitted he was pleased with him. The Duchess, too, smiled, holding out her hand to Maximilian, who took it and smiled back at her. You see, it's not so difficult after all, is it, Maximilian? she said, and Maximilian shook his head. I don't know why you're both so surprised, he said, as the carriage now drew up outside the imposing façade of Miller Howe. It was a handsome house built only in the past twenty years, pleasingly symmetrical in a classical style of red brick, with a large wisteria growing across the front and spreading its way over the portico. Liveried footmen stood stiffly on either side of the steps, where burning torches created a dramatic welcome. The sound of music was coming from inside, and a steady stream of guests, in both modest and gaudy attire, were making their way inside. We're pleased. Maximilian's mother said, looking pointedly at the Duke, who nodded. Yes, very pleased, he said as Maximilian spotted Lily and Alicia standing below the portico. They both looked very pretty, but Lily in particular. She was dressed in a pink gown, with the white gloves he had seen at the market pulled at the length of her arms, and with a fascinator of peacock feathers on her head. Pointing out of the carriage window, he turned to his parents and smiled. There she is, he said feeling oddly proud at having secured a dance with a woman who seemed entirely respectable and had been willing to see past his previous faults. I still don't understand why you're doing this, Alicia said, as she and Lily stood beneath the portico outside Miller Howe. Because he intrigues me, Lily replied. She was not about to tell Alicia the real reason for her acceptance of Maximilian's invitation to dance. But Lily's resolve was strong, and now she intended to create a situation such as to ensure the downfall, not only of Maximilian, but of the Duke too. Alicia tutted. Well, on your head be it. He's here now. You can't escape him. I just hope you know what you're doing, that's all, she said, and Lily nodded. I know precisely what I'm doing, she replied as Maximilian approached. He was respectably dressed and had combed his hair and washed his face. There was a pleasing scent to him, and with a curt bow, he took Lily's hand in his and raised it to his lips. Miss Porter, what a pleasure it is to see you again, and how beautiful you look, he said, raising his eyes to her and smiling. Lily had not known what to expect, a drunkard or a gentleman but she knew enough about the rakish ways of men to know how easily a mask could be donned and an act performed. If charm was Maximilian's weapon, Lily was ready to defend herself. You flatter me, sir, Lily said, glancing at Alicia, who rolled her eyes. I'm going to get some punch, she said, following her parents into the house. Lily was left alone with Maximilian, who offered her his arm and sighed. I don't think she likes me very much, he said but Lily shook her head. I'm sure she's just... Read the scandal sheets, she said, as now they made their way inside. Lily wanted to push him. She was curious to know his true feelings. Did he believe he had been treated unjustly? At the mention of the broker press, Maximilian raised his eyebrows, as now the master of ceremonies came to greet them. Lord Maximilian Oakley and Miss Lily Porter, he announced, and as they stepped into the ballroom, Heads turned and fans rustled. A whispering sweep of murmurs ran through the room, and for a moment they were the very centre of attention. I think they all read the scandal sheets, Maximilian whispered, steering Lily towards the refreshment table. For a moment Lily had experienced what it was like to be at the centre of a scandal, to have all eyes on her and know she was being judged. It unsettled her, and she was glad when the musicians struck up a tune and the dancing began. But still she was curious. But is it true? Is what they write about you true? The way you treat women as objects for your pleasure? 
she said. Maximilian smiled, offering her a glass of punch from an ornate glass bowl. He shrugged and shook his head. I have a reputation and it's not undeserved, but doesn't a kiss take two? Doesn't a scandal always involve another person? Those women aren't wholly innocent, I assure you. But it's easy to paint the man as a devil and a rake. I admit I'm no saint, but what man really is? Everyone has their secrets, he said, taking a sip of punch and smiling at her. Lily had not known what to expect of Maximilian. At close quarters he seemed different, even as she thought back to their first encounter on the night of her arrival in Lancaster. He had been drunk then, and Lily had feared just what he might have done had they not been interrupted. But now, dressed in such a regal manner, and displaying only the epitome of good manners, Lily could not help but see a different side to the man she so despised. That's very true, she said, thinking back to all the scandal sheets she had written and all the secrets she had exposed. But tell me more about yourself. I know nothing about you, but you know a great deal about me. If the writer of the scandal papers has me accurately, that is, he said, raising his eyebrows. Well, I come from London. I'm the only daughter of a land agent. My parents are respectable, though not wealthy by your standards. I spend my days meeting friends, attending social events. I enjoy the theatre and the opera, she said. Maximilian nodded. Don't talk to my father about land agents. We've had some rather bad experiences with land agents, he said, and Lily's heart skipped a beat. Really? she asked, knowing he was talking about her father. Oh, yes, Connor Edge. But the less said about him, the better. A wicked man. He tried to bring down the whole dynasty with his lies and deceit. But the dukedom endured, as did my father, Maximilian replied. Lily felt her anger rising. How dare he speak so ill of her father, the man the Duke had seen incarcerated and whose reputation had been reduced to tatters because of lies and deceit. I'm sure he was... I'm sure he has his own story, Lily replied, but Maximilian shook his head. He was just a liar. He lied to everyone, but it doesn't matter now. Connor's in prison, where he belongs, and that's all that matters, he said, taking another sip of punch. Lily was not used to being in such proximity to her target, and she was certainly not used to being so personally involved with the object of the scandal she hoped to expose. He was wrong about her father. It was the very opposite of what he said, and Lily found it difficult to control her anger in the face of his blatant lies. I'm sure there's another side to it. His story too, Lily replied, but Maximilian only laughed. I wonder if the person who wrote the scandal paper thought that too, he replied. Lily had no answer. There was no answer. A scandal sheet exposed the facts, or at its lowest elaborated on them. But as for a right to reply, I suppose they didn't, she said, and Maximilian nodded. I rest my case, he said, as the music came to an end, and a throng of dancers approached the refreshment table. Will we dance? she asked, but Maximilian shook his head. I'd far rather find a quiet corner and talk, he replied. Lily nodded. This was it. This was the moment she had been waiting for. It was just the same as she had observed Maximilian behave with Amelia. He wanted her alone, and then... I'd be delighted, Lily said and taking his arm the two of them retreated from the hustle and bustle of the ballroom to a quieter recess, where the light of the hundreds of candles lit around the room failed to penetrate. Miller Howe's interiors were as handsome as its facade, an homage to glittering continental baroque, and Lily and Maximilian took seats beneath a fresco of some classical scene, the figures half obscured in the fading light coming through a nearby window looking out over the gardens. What a gaudy place. I've never liked Miller Howe, Maximilian said, sitting back in his chair with a sigh. Do you prefer a more austere style? Lily asked, and Maximilian laughed. I could hardly be called austere, but I don't care much for being inside, except when I'm asleep. At Burnley Abbey I have a rose garden. It's beautiful, and I spend most of my time there, he said. 
Amelia had told Lily of this ploy, how he made mention of the rose garden and offered to show her it. But where was the scandal? So far, Maximilian had done nothing but talk. He had not even slipped his arm around Lily's waist or leaned forward with a suggestive expression on his face. If anything, he was rather dull. It sounds idyllic, Lily said. She loved roses, even as she knew they hid thorns. It is. I'd be pleased to show you, but... Well, all that's behind me, he said. Lily was confused as to what he meant. What was behind him? I don't understand, she replied, and he looked at her with a wearisome expression. Oh, all of it. I should be married by now, the respectable heir to the Duke of Lancaster, but I'm far from that. I've got a terrible reputation only made worse by those scandal papers. But the problem with them is there's no sense of redemption. A person can be written about, and then, that's that, and opinions formed. There's no escaping it. I could give my whole fortune away to charitable causes, renounce my title, and enter a religious order, and I'd still be considered nothing more than a rake and a devil, he said, shaking his head. Lily would not feel guilty, nor would she feel sorry for him, and yet there was truth in his words. A reputation could take a lifetime to build, and a moment to destroy. She could think of no one about whom she had written who had suitably redeemed themselves. The only sensible course of action for such a person was to enter relative obscurity and live out their days keeping away from scandal. Then what are you going to do? Lily asked. Maximilian thought for a moment, a smile coming over his face. As I see it, I've only got one choice, but because of what's been written about me, that choice isn't one I can pursue. I need to get married, and quickly. That way, I can assuage any doubts as to my current behaviour, he said. In that moment, Lily made a bold decision. It seemed he was not about to create a scandal where she was concerned, and yet there was a necessity in discovering one if she was to supply the broker press with the desired scandal sheet and see her father avenged. A sudden idea had occurred to her, one so fantastic it might actually work. Or you could enter an arrangement of convenience, she replied, leaning forward so they could not be overheard. He looked at her in surprise and she smiled, knowing she had caught his interest. I don't understand. What are you proposing? he asked. That you and I enter into an arrangement. My parents hoped a season in the North might open further possibilities for me. London's so full of admirable young ladies as to make one feel quite like a competitor in a ghastly agricultural show, parading, pruning, longing. No, they wanted me to find a respectable match, a merchant, they said. But I'm sure the heir to a dukedom would suit them far better. And you know, Mr and Mrs Saunders, they won't object, Lily said, warming to the idea, and Maximilian nodded. He seemed taken with the idea, nodding, as a smile came over his face. Well, Miss Porter, you've made me an attractive proposition. I didn't really want to marry, if truth be told, but the illusion of it. Yes, that would help my cause no end. It seems we're in agreement, he replied, raising his punch glass to her with a smile. Chapter 18 Dearly Beloved, we are gathered together here in the sight of God and in the face of this congregation to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony, which is an honourable estate, instituted of God in the time of man's innocency, signifying unto us the mystical union that is betwixt Christ and his church. A distant voice was saying, Where was she? There was a congregation, and a minister, and a church, and Lily was hidden behind a veil unable to see clearly, even as the words echoed around her. I require and charge you both, as you will answer at the dreadful day of judgment, when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed, that if either of you know any impediment, why ye may not be lawfully joined together in matrimony, ye do now confess it. The distant voice said again, and in a sudden moment of realisation, Lily knew where she was. In the church, no, but she stammered as a hand slipped into hers. Just listen to the words, my dear. It'll soon be time to answer, a voice whispered to her, 
and Lily turned to find a shadowy figure standing next to her. She tried to raise her veil, but her hands would not move, and as she tried to move her feet, they felt like lead weights. Lily, wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou obey him, and serve him, love, honour, and keep him, in sickness and in health? And forsaking all other, keep thee only unto him, so long as ye both shall live? The first voice asked, and Lily tried to shake her head, unable to move, even as she cried out. But I can't, I don't know who he is, she exclaimed. Oh, my dear, I'm so sorry, the veil. We must raise the veil, the voice to her side said. There was a rustle of material, the veil was lifted, and Lily found herself at the front of a church, with a surpliced clergyman standing before her. She tried to turn, even as a face came into view, and she let out a cry of astonishment. Maximilian, she exclaimed, and he smiled. Who else would it be, my dear, he replied. Lily awoke with a start, sitting up in bed, breathless, as she realised she had been dreaming. It had been the most curious thing, and she rubbed her eyes, peering through the early morning gloom, as she realised there was no marriage, no veil, and no Maximilian. Goodness me, how awful, she said to herself, even as she knew very well why she had dreamed what she had dreamed. The previous night at the Miller Howe Ball, Lily and Maximilian had come to an arrangement. They were to make a pretense at courtship and betrothal, to appear for all intents and purposes as though they were a couple like any other. It had been a spur-of-the-moment decision, a risk taken without her usual calculations. Lily was usually far more cautious, but having heard Maximilian speak so forcefully against her father, her anger had been kindled. But I'm glad it's only a dream, Lily thought to herself, as she readied herself that morning. She had not told Alicia about the plan, though her friend had been eager to hear all about Lily's encounter with the Duke's heir. But she knew the secret could not be kept forever. As she entered the dining room for breakfast, she was greeted with a pointed look from Alicia. You rushed off to bed very quickly last night. You hardly told me anything. I know mother and father were there, but still. Alicia said. Mr. and Mrs. Saunders had already gone out, and Lily sat down at the table, knowing Alicia would react in horror as to her revelation. But for the deception to work, it had to be believed by everyone, and even Alicia could not be privy to the truth. I didn't want to say it in front of them, Lily said, even as she knew Alicia would tell her parents immediately. Say what? You were ever so coy about Maximilian. Did he do something to you? The swine, we should write our own scandal sheet about it. Or perhaps the author was there. Perhaps we'll read about the wicked things he did to you, Alicia exclaimed, but Lily shook her head. We're courting, she replied, and Alicia dropped the marmalade spoon she was holding, clattering it on the table. You're what? she asked, her eyes wide with disbelief. Lily had expected as much. What other reaction could Alicia give but this? Any woman with an inkling of Maximilian's true colours would say the same. She was a fool to even contemplate such a courtship, and her words were tantamount to a betrayal of the fairer sex. We're courting. Last night, at the ball, I saw a different side to him. He's not what you think, she said, hating herself for lying, even as she had seen another side to him, a side she had not expected. Lily had believed her task would be a simple one, a dance, a retreat into a darkened corner, and the exposure of a scandal the following day. But Maximilian had behaved entirely differently to the way she had expected. It was as though he had genuinely sought to change, or had given a performance worthy of a Shakespearean actor. Not what I think. I don't have to think, Lily. I know it. I've read the scandal sheets. I know just what he's like, she exclaimed, shaking her head in disbelief. Well, it's not like he's had much chance to reply, is it? Someone wrote something terrible about him, and there's no recourse to his own version of events, she said, repeating Maximilian's words, and again, feeling guilty for having done so. But Lily now reminded herself what was at stake. Alicia would discover the truth in due course, as would the rest of society. But for now, 
Lily would have to endure the incredulous looks of her friend and the angry clattering of cutlery as she finished her breakfast. I just can't believe it. Why would you do such a thing? He's nothing but a rake. You've been taken in by him, Lily. Riches, title, prestige and position. That's what you're courting. The rest doesn't matter to you. Well, I'd far rather marry a good pauper than a dastardly duke, she said, rising to her feet and tossing her napkin aside. I don't see why it concerns you so, Alicia. Can't a man change? she asked, but Alicia shook her head. Not according to the scandal sheets, he can't. Not this one, at least. You're entering the lion's den, Lily. I hope you can run quickly, she said. She was about to leave the room, but the butler now entered, bowing to them both and announcing a visitor. Lord Maximilian Oakley, miss, he said, and Alicia gasped. He's here. Oh, what are we to do? she cried, staring at Lily, who could not help but feel unsettled by this unexpected arrival. She had not believed Maximilian would take the arrangement seriously. It had seemed an excellent way of getting close to him and to the Duke and Duchess. She had hoped to discover more about the mystery surrounding her father's past dealings with them, but the arrival of Maximilian suggested he was taking the matter seriously, if only in appearance. Will you show him in? Lily said, and Alicia made a face. You can't, you can't be alone with him, she hissed as the butler stepped out of the room. You can be our chaperone. We'll walk in the garden, Lily said, thinking hastily as to what the best course of action would be. Alicia had no time to answer, as Maximilian himself now entered the room. He looked almost nervous and carried in his hand a single rose with the most beautiful peach-coloured flower Lily had ever seen. For the lady, he said, handing it over with a flourish. Lily blushed. He was certainly keeping up appearances, and she took the flower, holding it to her nose and savouring its sweet, sickly scent. Lord Maximilian, what a pleasure to see you again so soon, Lily said, glancing at Alicia, who was seething quietly in the corner of the room. I thought I should come in the light of day to talk things over he said. I'd be delighted to. Shall we walk in the garden? she asked, and Maximilian nodded. As you wish, he replied, glancing at Alicia, who now followed them out into the hallway and through a door into the garden. It was a pleasant morning, clear and fresh, and the birds were singing in the trees. They walked across the lawn together, admiring the flowers until they came in sight of the view across to Burnley Abbey and the estate of the Duke of Lancaster. Alicia was standing at a distance, and Lily lowered her voice, leaning forward, as though exchanging an intimacy she did not want to be overheard. You still agree to the plan, then? she asked, and he nodded. I do, but I wonder, why are you so eager to appear betrothed? Are your parents putting pressure on you to make a match? he asked. Lily nodded. She knew she could not reveal too much about her parents, even as a lie could easily unravel. Well, as I said, they've sent me north to make the pool less deep, she said, laughing as Maximilian smiled. But you're very pretty. I don't see why any man wouldn't show an interest in you, he replied. Lily blushed. She could not tell if this was part of his act or a genuine attempt to charm her. The arrangement was a practical one, but if Maximilian was to develop feelings for her, things might become more complicated. It's very kind of you to say so, but many young ladies are pretty and of far higher class and rank than I, she replied. Then what of your father? Is he a merchant like Mr Saunders? Oh no, forgive me, you told me he was a land agent. Is it a great estate he manages? he asked. This was the point where Lily would have to lie and remember the details of her lie, too. She thought for a moment, hoping to sound vague in her response. Oh, I always forget the name. Is it Lord Derby? Or is it the Baron of Repton? My father never remains long in one position, she said, and Maximilian smiled. My co... The Baron of Mowbray acts as the agent for Burnley Abbey. He's my father's godson. We work closely together, Maximilian said, turning his head away and clearing his throat. Lily was curious. 
He had been about to say something else, but had checked himself, even as Lily felt certain he had almost said the word cousin. But the Baron of Mowbray could not be Maximilian's cousin. It simply wasn't possible, and she pushed the thought aside, hoping he would not mention her father again, for fear of her anger rising against him. And he'll continue when you inherit the title? she asked. Maximilian shrugged. I don't know. I don't think much about it. My father's in rude health. I doubt I'll inherit for many years yet. Not that he wants me to, of course. They'll be surprised when they discover I'm betrothed. Pleasantly, I hope. I just need to convince them I can be a different man to the one they've read about so often in these wicked scandal sheets. I can turn over a new leaf. I know it, he said. And you've no idea who's writing these things about you, Lily asked. To her surprise, Maximilian glanced over his shoulder to where Alicia was standing beneath the boughs of a weeping willow, watching their every move. But he shook his head and shrugged. It could be anyone. Someone with a vendetta against me, man or woman. I'm not a bad man, Lily, but I don't always behave well. Women are my downfall. I see a pretty face and after a glass of brandy. Well, I want to kiss her, Maximilian said, shrugging, as he turned back to look across the rolling landscape towards Burnley Abbey. When put like that, Lily could almost have sympathy for Maximilian, though she hurriedly banished such thoughts, knowing she had seen a far darker side than that. But as for changing his ways, it seemed Maximilian was at least making some effort to do so. He was completely sober, and the rose had been a kind and thoughtful gesture, albeit for show. And what happens when your reputation's restored? Lily asked. Maximilian smiled. I suppose I could marry someone. We could go our separate ways under amicable circumstances and use the time together to seek those matches we might wish to pursue. I expect nothing of you, and you should expect nothing of me, and we make good on the deception together, he replied. Lily nodded. She had not entirely expected him to behave as such, or to allow her carte blanche in determining future romance. He was not seeking to control her, nor did it seem he intended to use her for pleasure during the course of their deception. The matter was a mutual benefit, one they could part from at a mutually agreed moment. But for Lily, this was not enough, for she could hardly write a scandal paper about a respectable courtship, albeit an entirely fabricated one. Yes. I see what you mean, she said, feeling at a sudden loss as to how to create a scandal out of nothing. Are you having second thoughts? Have I not behaved accordingly? Forgive me, it's hardly expected of me. I'm a thorn, not a rose, he said, cocking his head and looking at her questioningly. Lily sighed and shook her head. No, not at all. It's the perfect arrangement, she said, and it would have been had the subject behaved as she had expected. But Lily was used to biding her time. The trap was set, and everything was now in place for the enacting of what was yet to come. Lily could observe Maximilian at close quarters, and the reaction of those around him too. She was curious to know more about the Duke and Duchess, even as she knew the risk in doing so. Then we'll make an announcement of sorts. I haven't told my parents, but by the looks she's giving me, I presume Alicia knows of our deception, he asked. Not our deception. She thinks we're really courting, Lily replied, and Maximilian laughed. Then I know precisely why she's looking at me like that, he replied, smiling and shaking his head. Chapter 19 Maximilian left the home of the Saunders in good spirits. He had not been surprised at Alicia's reaction to him, and he still suspected her of being the writer behind the scandal sheets but Maximilian felt pleased with himself. He had done that which no one had believed he could. He had established a courtship with a respectable young woman, albeit entirely in jest. There was no courtship, but to all appearances there was, and it would buy him valuable time to mend his broken reputation. And she's charming enough, he said to himself, as he walked across the parkland in the direction of Burnley Abbey. Maximilian had been surprised as to how easy Lily had been to talk to at the Miller Howe Ball. He had found her company entirely conducive, and again that morning. 
It had been a long time since he had talked to any woman with anything but an ulterior motive, even as he felt surprised at how much he had enjoyed their conversation. Lily was a woman who could hold her own, and it was clear she was not intimidated by the opposite sex. A formidable woman, it seems, he thought to himself as he came to the steps of the house, intending to now inform his parents of this unexpected arrangement. They would be surprised to learn he was courting and would no doubt accuse him of a flight of fancy. His father would not believe his sincerity, even as Maximilian had every intention of persuading his parents he was sincere in his undertaking. And the rest, too, he said to himself, imagining what William and Anne would say when they discovered he was courting. The whole district would be surprised, and perhaps the matter would see an end to speculation and rumour. A courting heir was a respectable man, not the subject of a scandal sheet. That was Maximilian's goal, to step back from society and its vicious rumours. He would no longer be the subject of other people's whisperings, and he felt grateful to Lily for helping him repair his reputation. They'll all say I've changed, won't they? he thought to himself, letting himself into the house and making his way to the morning room, where he hoped to find his parents taking coffee and refreshments. His mother was playing the piano forte, the sound of which was drifting pleasantly along the corridor, and Maximilian took a deep breath, knocking at the door and opening it before an invitation was issued. The Duke was standing behind the Duchess, smiling as she played, but the two of them now looked up in surprise as Maximilian entered the room. We missed you at breakfast, Maximilian. Where did you go? Or have you only just got up? His father asked, with the slightest hint of a sneer in his voice. Maximilian held his gaze and smiled. No, father. I've been out to see a woman, he replied. His parents exchanged nervous glances, fearing it seemed some fresh scandal and the possibility of its exposure by the broker press. A woman? his mother asked, replacing the lid of the pianoforte and looking concernedly at Maximilian, who nodded. Yes, the woman I'm courting, mother. I told you I danced with a woman last night. The woman I met in the market, Miss Lily Porter. Well, I'm pleased to say we've agreed to a more formal arrangement. She's a delight, and I'm sure you'll agree when you meet her, he said. Maximilian was curious as to his parents' reaction. Would they be curious, angry, indifferent? The Duke and Duchess looked at one another, evidently taken by surprise at this unexpected revelation. A woman? You're courting a woman? What's she like? Is she... Maximilian's father began, but Maximilian interrupted him. She's entirely respectable, yes, and don't for a minute think you can look down on her for not having a title, given you made a pauper and the son of a servant your godson and baron of Mowbray, Maximilian replied. He already knew he could make adequate reply to any sense of snobbery on his father's part. His parents could not very well deny him a courtship with a commoner, when his own cousin was of far lower stock, and the result of a scandalous liaison. The Duke nodded. Yes, Maximilian, I understand. But, well, it's just... unexpected, that's all. Usually you bring home a scandal, he said. But Maximilian's mother came to his rescue, just as Maximilian had hoped she would. But he's done just the right thing, Ralph. He's proved us wrong, and we should be glad of that, she said. And Maximilian smiled. He knew it was a deception, but it was one he could live with if it was able to restore his damaged reputation. Maximilian no longer wished to be known as a rake, though he had found it difficult to see how his reputation could be restored. His encounter with Lily had offered a solution, and by the time it came for the break to occur, Maximilian's rakish ways would be forgotten, replaced by whatever fresh scandal was titillating the ton. She's a charming woman, mother. You should meet her, Maximilian said and his mother smiled. I'd be delighted to meet her, Maximilian. Why don't you invite Miss Porter to dinner? She's with the Saunders, isn't she? We could invite them all, she said. But Maximilian shook his head. He did not trust Alicia, and he had no intention of giving rise to the possibility of her garnering fresh information for her scandal papers. 
for Maximilian suspected her to be the author, even as he did not know why she should be so intent on revenge against him. No, just Lily. I'm serious about her mother. She's not just an idle fancy, I assure you, he said. And his mother nodded. Very well, I'll issue the invitation for tomorrow evening, she said. And what of her family? What of her father and mother? She does come from some respectability, I hope. If not, title, the Duke said. Her father was a land agent. She came north from London for the season. As for the rest, I know little. But I hope to find out, Maximilian replied, realising he really knew very little about Lily or her circumstances. The Duke looked surprised. A land agent? Well, we've had our fair dealings with them. Very well, we'll look forward to meeting Miss Porter tomorrow. I must say, Maximilian, I'm pleasantly surprised at you, he said. And Maximilian felt oddly pleased at receiving his father's praise, even as it was based on entirely false premises. I don't think you realise what you're doing, Lily. What about all those other poor women? What will they say when they discover one of their own is courting the devil himself? Alicia said, and Lily sighed. It had been several hours since Maximilian had left, and the two of them had not stopped arguing about Lily's apparent choice of suitor. She was determined not to tell Alicia the truth, knowing her friend would not be able to keep the secret of her being the author of the scandal sheets. In matters of this sort, it was imperative to remain covert, and Lily was not about to reveal herself unnecessarily. For this, she would pay the price of Alicia's approval, and that of her parents too, when they found out. They were sitting in the drawing room arguing over tea and cake. Oh, but he's hardly that, is he? I know what you're thinking, Alicia. You've made it very clear. But I've made my choice, and I'm glad in it. Besides, he hasn't behaved like that towards me, has he? She asked. In this, Lily was speaking the truth, though the memory of her first encounter with Maximilian still lingered. He could so easily have made her another of his conquests at the Miller Howe Ball, but something had held him back, and Lily was curious as to this apparent change of heart. It disappointed her too, for if Maximilian was to mend his ways, there would be nothing of any substance for her to write. You wait. He will do, I'm certain of it. He's a dangerous man, Lily. Think about your reputation, Alicia implored her. But Lily did not think her reputation would suffer much from being associated with the heir to the dukedom of Lancaster. Maximilian was rich, and on his inheritance he would become one of the most powerful men in the country. That was not something to sneer at, and many women would give their right leg and false teeth to enjoy the prospect of the title of Duchess of Lancaster. I don't have a reputation to think about. No one knows me here. I'm not anyone, she said. And Alicia sighed. Oh, but Lily, I'm worried about you. And what if the writer of the scandal papers gets wind of it? You'll be included too. They won't hold back. You'll be held up as a pariah against womankind. You'll be treated as badly as him, Alicia replied. But Lily shook her head. I'm sure it won't come to that, she said, knowing it would not come to that. But as for how to proceed with the scandal sheets, Lily knew she would have to tread carefully. She could not afford for her own identity to be revealed, and she could not write those things only a person close to Maximilian would know. Her observations would have to come from afar, and she would need to bide her time, lest Maximilian or his parents guess her to be the source of such information. Oh, but it will. You'll be the talk of every drawing room between here and Cleethorpes, Alicia exclaimed. Lily smiled. It was hardly a devastation. And whilst she had every intention of writing a little about herself, she knew her secret was safe. After all, it was she who decided what the drawing rooms would know. And I'm sure I can weather the storm, Alicia, Lily replied, unperturbed by her friend's fears. Mr and Mrs Saunders had gone out for the day to visit some friends in the town, but the moment they entered the drawing room, Alicia wasted no time in announcing shrilly what she had discovered. She's courting him, mother. Can you believe it? That man, the heir, the rake, the devil, she exclaimed, explaining the full story before Lily had a chance to defend herself. Mrs Saunders looked at Lily aghast. 
Lily, is this true? We've taken responsibility for you in Lancashire. In loco parentis, I believe that's the term. Don't you see what this means? It's terribly dangerous to be flirting a courtship with such a man. Think of your reputation, Mrs Saunders exclaimed. That's just what I said too, Mother, Alicia replied, folding her arms and looking judgmentally at Lily, who sighed. If she was not willing to tell Alicia the truth, she was certainly not willing to tell Mrs Saunders the truth either, and she brushed off her guardian's fears with the same reasoned account she had given Alicia. Maximilian was a perfectly charming man, to her at least. He had done nothing to cause scandal as far as Lily was concerned, and she was willing to give him a chance, even as no one else seemed to be. Mrs Saunders sighed, and her husband, who had thus far kept silence, passed a gloomy judgment. He'll hurt you, Lily. I can't see any good come out of it. None at all, he said. And it seemed that was his last word on the matter. When Alicia's parents had stepped out into the garden to take tea, Alicia looked pointedly at Lily with an expression of I told you so on her face. I don't care what you all say. I like him, and that's that, Lily replied, folding her arms. She could be stubborn both in a lie and in getting what she wanted. But the more she thought about Maximilian, the more she found herself actually defending him. He had done nothing to incite scandal at the Miller Howe Ball. Indeed, he had behaved as a perfect gentleman both then and in the garden this morning. He had not been drunk, nor had he spoken lewdly or inappropriately. In this, at least, Lily knew the truth, even as Maximilian's past told a different story. Well. What are you going to do next? Do you plan on marrying him? Alicia asked. Lily noted a touch of awe in her friend's voice, as though she too might be amongst those who saw the title of Duchess of Lancaster as an attraction. I don't know. It's all very early, isn't it? One can't know for sure, Lily said, not wanting to give anything but a vague impression of her connections to Maximilian. Alicia sighed and shook her head. I just don't understand you, Lily. It's all very odd, she said, just as a knock came at the drawing room door. It was the butler, and he brought with him an envelope on a silver tray, embossed with the same coat of arms Lily had seen on the carriage of the Duke of Lancaster. Alicia looked at it in surprise, and Lily took it, using a letter knife to break the seal. It's from the Duchess. I'm invited to dine at Burnley Abbey tomorrow evening, Lily said her heart skipping a beat as she realised the possibilities entailed. Alicia reached over and snatched the invitation from Lily's hands, staring at it in astonishment. Goodness me, so you are. But no invitation for us, she said, with an indignant tone. Well, you did spend the whole evening doing nothing but casting daggers at Maximilian. Perhaps that's why, Lily said, and Alicia blushed. Well, Perhaps, but I'd have thought, oh, but will you go? She asked, and Lily groaned. Why wouldn't I go? We're courting, aren't we? He's invited me. I'm to meet the Duke and Duchess. Why would I refuse? She asked, feeling exasperated at Alicia's persistence in not believing the sincerity of the match. Alicia looked at her with a worried expression. I just... I hope you know what you're doing, Lily. It's such a big thing, isn't it? You can't possibly... Well, you're putting your reputation on the line, she said. But Lily was well aware of what she was doing. She was the only one who knew the truth. Not Maximilian, not Alicia, not anyone, even her father, still languishing in a prison cell. But if Lily could discover something more about Maximilian, or about the family's past, she would have her revenge on them all. She was the cuckoo in the nest, biding her time before spreading her wings and the invitation to dinner was just what she needed to further her plans and bring down the dukedom once and for all. Chapter 20 Don't overdo it, Lily, Alicia said, as Lily wrapped a shawl around her shoulders, gazing at herself in the mirror as she readied herself for dinner that evening. She turned to her friend, raising her eyebrows, as Alicia looked incredulously at her. A shawl isn't overdoing things, Alicia, she said, fastening it with a silver clasp, before
before scenting herself with the perfume her father had bought her and turning away from the mirror. I just think it's all too fast, that's all, Alicia replied. But Lily had heard enough. Alicia was not going to dissuade her from her task. Lily's mind was made up. She would go to Burnley Abbey that evening and play the part of a besotted courtship. Maximilian was bound to respond, and when he did, Lily would seize the moment. Hidden in a drawer in her dressing table were her notes on Maximilian, everything she had gleaned in readiness for the next copy of the scandal sheet, and it was Lily's intention to return late that evening with the story she had promised Mr. Broker. Something sensational, she had told herself. You're just jealous, Lily replied, and Alicia snorted. Jealous? Of you and him? I don't think so. I'd run a mile before I even thought about him as a prospect, she said. Well, I don't see any other men chasing after you, Alicia. Where's Michael Tanner? Lily asked. Alicia looked suddenly upset, and Lily feared she had crossed a line. He... it wouldn't work, she said, pulling out her handkerchief and dabbing at her eyes. Then can't you just be happy for me, Alicia? I'm sure you will be. In time, Lily said. She had imagined the fall of the dukedom so often as for it to become mundane, but the fact of a final humiliation was tantalisingly close. All Lily had to do was hold her nerve, her father would be delighted, as would Alicia, and every woman ever wronged at Maximilian's hands. Hadn't you better be going? Alicia asked, and Lily nodded, glancing at herself in the mirror for a final time, before bidding her friend goodbye. Alicia accompanied her to the door, where a carriage had been sent from Burnley Abbey to transport her to dinner. Lily felt suddenly very grand, as though she really was to be the Duchess of Lancaster, and as the carriage pulled away she allowed herself to imagine it was all real, at least for a moment. If only my father could see me now, he'd be so very proud of me, she told herself. For whenever she had her doubts, Lily always reminded herself of the goal in mind. Her father would be vindicated, and those who had wronged him would be brought down into the dust. Maximilian chief amongst them, she thought to herself. It was a pleasant evening, and the sun was casting its setting shadows over the parkland as the carriage pulled up at the door of Burnley Abbey. Lily had long wondered what it was like inside, and she was looking forward to being at the very heart of that which her father had once called his own. He had lived a very different life, a life she really knew little about. As a child she had often found him absent, and she was never privy to the places he went, or the things he did. But he had told her enough for her to know it was here, in the beating heart of the dukedom, his downfall had played out. A shiver ran through her as she was welcomed by the butler, and Maximilian now appeared to welcome her, smiling, as he made a pretense of greeting. I'm so glad you could come. You're not nervous, are you? he asked, but Lily shook her head. Why should I be nervous? she asked, even as her heart was beating fast at the prospect of coming face to face with the players in her father's downfall. You shouldn't be, but... Well, it's not every day one meets the Duke and Duchess of Lancaster. They're perfectly amiable, though, my mother in particular. She's a darling, he said. Lily recalled a choicer word her father had used in his description of Miriam, Duchess of Lancaster, but now she was shown into the drawing room, where the Duke and Duchess were drinking sherry with another couple, whom Lily could only assume were the Baron of Mowbray and his wife. They all looked up at Lily and smiled. How pleased we are to welcome you, Maximilian's mother said, hurrying to Lily's side and putting her arm around her. The greeting was a warm one, and the Duke could not have been friendlier. It's a pleasure to meet you, Miss Porter. I understand your father acts as a land agent. William here, my godson, he's our agent, aren't you, William? The Duke said, and the Baron nodded, explaining something of his responsibilities on the estate. The drawing room was opulent, the dress of those gathered exquisite, and the drinks flowed freely before the gong sounded for dinner. Will you take my arm? Maximilian asked and Lily smiled, taking his arm as they processed into the dining room. Lily had never seen such a grand room. The table could easily have seated forty, 
and it was covered in the finest silverware, cutlery and glassware. Liveried footmen stood stiffly around the room, and a parade of dishes was now brought forth and placed on the sideboard. This is extraordinary, Lily exclaimed, forgetting herself for a moment and feeling entirely caught up in the dream of what she was experiencing. Roasted game birds, whole fish, racks of lamb and sides of beef, raised pies, umpteen dishes of vegetables and all manner of other good things to eat were served. It was an extraordinary sight, dish after dish brought forth, and Lily was at a loss to imagine how one group of people could possibly eat so much. The servants finish what we don't, and we send the rest to the poorhouse on grand occasions such as this, the Duke said, as though discerning Lily's thoughts. She looked up and smiled, impressed by his philanthropy. An unexpected discovery indeed. Oh, how kind of you, she said, glancing at Maximilian, who smiled. It's important to take care of those under one's jurisdiction. Estate workers, farm labourers, those who rent cottages from us. We've always tried to maintain a philanthropic attitude, Maximilian said, and his father nodded. Well said, Maximilian. You're quite right. What's the point in having money if you can't do some good with it? That's what I've always thought, at least, he said, and Lily nodded. It's very admirable, she said, as the footman began to clear away the dishes. The Duke spoke eloquently about his plans for the estate, a school, a cottage hospital, and new housing to be built around a new farm, where apprentices would learn trades to assist in the running of the house and parkland. It's easy to rest on one's laurels, but we have a responsibility as members of the aristocracy. That's why I was so pleased when Maximilian announced you're coming to dinner, Miss Porter. The heir of a dukedom needs stability in his life. He needs a... He began, but the Duchess interrupted him. I hardly think we need to speak of marriage just yet, she said, fixing the Duke with a pointed look. He smiled and nodded. Of course, but I must admit we're very pleased at this unexpected turn of events, he said, glancing at Maximilian who raised his glass. I'd like to propose a toast to Miss Porter, he said, and the others raised their glasses to toast Lily, who suddenly felt somewhat overwhelmed. Her impression of the family had been that of an arrogant and haughty set of aristocrats, with no regard for the common man. But if their words were to be believed, and there was no reason not to, the Duke of Lancaster and his family were entirely concerned with philanthropy and the common good, a quality it seemed Maximilian possessed too. It's very kind of you. I wonder, if you'll excuse me, I'd like to take the air for a few moments, she said, rising to her feet. She felt strangely conflicted, desiring their downfall, and yet realising they were good and decent people. The Duke nodded, smiling at Lily, who now rose to her feet and hurried out of the room. A maid directed her to the terrace, and she stepped out into the moonlight, leaning on the parapet with a sigh. They're nothing like I made them out to be, and even Maximilian. Oh, it's hopeless, she exclaimed to herself, for Lily could not imagine what scandal she might discover. Now the family's true colours were revealed. Are you all right? a voice behind her said, and Lily turned to find Maximilian standing by the door leading from the house. She smiled at him, feeling genuinely glad to see him, even as the feeling took her by surprise. Oh yes, quite all right. I was just getting some air, she said, as he came to stand beside her. It can get rather stuffy in the dining room. I hope they haven't bored you, he said, with a genuine note of concern in his voice. Lily shook her head. They were not boring her at all. On the contrary, she was surprised to find herself enjoying the evening immensely. She had come to Burnley Abbey with any number of preconceived expectations and yet had been proved entirely wrong. Whatever she might have thought of the Duke and his family, she had seen a different side, one she could never have imagined from her father's descriptions. Not at all. I was fascinated to hear about your father's philanthropic work. I never expected... Well, one hears so many stories about the aristocracy, Lily said, and Maximilian laughed. Yes, a lot of them printed in those awful scandal sheets but it's not all true. 
One never really has the full story, not in that way. They give a one-sided account. But it hardly matters now, does it? I won't be appearing in one again. I've left all that behind. You've given me the chance to rebuild my reputation. We'll make an announcement about the courtship in due course. But my family won't stand in the way. Will yours? he asked, and Lily shook her head. She knew her father would say she had gone too far, and her mother would be horrified to learn of what she was doing for the sake of the scandal papers. For the first time since arriving in Lancashire, Lily felt unsure of herself. She wondered what would happen when others learned of the betrothal, and just how far she and Maximilian would have to go in order to make the deception appear real. No, they won't. I'll write to my mother in due course. I don't want her to find out through one of those awful scandal sheets, Lily said, and Maximilian smiled. And your father? I don't have to ask his permission, do I? He said, and Lily laughed. No, you don't. I'm sure he'd give it. But let's go back inside. It's rude of me to remain out here, she said. And he offered her his arm, the two of them returning to the dining room, where further convivial conversation awaited. Lily returned to Alicia's house in a state of confusion. She had expected to find herself loathing her hosts and their company. But the opposite was the case, and Lily could not help but feel grateful to Maximilian for the pleasant evening she had spent in his company. He had been nothing but a gentleman, and had she not known better, Lily would have assumed he really was a gentleman. There's a letter for you. It came earlier on, marked from London Mail Coach, Alicia said not bothering to ask Lily how her evening had been. She handed the letter to Lily, who was only just taking off her shawl in the corridor before marching upstairs and slamming her bedroom door, the echo shaking the whole house. Lily rolled her eyes, holding up the letter to a guttering candle in a sconce by the door. She recognised the writing as being that of her mother, and taking another candle she made her way to her bedroom, glad to find a fire kindled there, and the bed turned down. She had intended to begin writing her scandal paper, but with no scandal to report, Lily was at a loss as to what to do. I'll read Mother's letter first, she said to herself, opening the envelope and sitting down by the fire to read. As she read, her eyes grew wide with fear, and she gripped the paper, holding it up and pressing her nose to it, reading the text aloud. Your father is very ill. He has succumbed to a fever brought on by conditions in the jail. They fear for his life. I write, not because your father means anything to me, but because you do, and I know you would want to know the truth, Lily read. She was horrified to think of her father succumbing to a fever. He had always been a strong and resourceful man, but to imagine him lying helplessly on a prison bed. And I was willing to see the good in them, Lily thought to herself reminded of why she had gone to Burnley Abbey that night, and of those who had committed her father to his downfall. Casting aside her mother's letter, and with a renewed sense of determination, she went to the writing desk by the window, took up ink and quill, and began to write. She was concerned only with her father, and she wanted him to know she was doing all she could to bring about the downfall of those responsible for his current predicament. If the dukedom could be dragged down, perhaps the door to her father's cell could be unlocked too. So absorbed was she in this work. It was not until the clock on the mantelpiece struck midnight she looked up, realising several hours had passed since her return. I'll finish it tomorrow, she thought to herself, as a sudden noise caused her to look up. To her astonishment, a figure was sitting on the window ledge, his outline visible against the dark sky beyond, reflected by the flickering candlelight, the curtains still pulled back. Lily was about to scream, fearing an intruder had climbed up the ivy and was making an attempt on the house. But a sudden realisation came over her. The figure was Maximilian, unmistakably so, and now she hurried to the window, pulling up the sill as he clambered inside. I know you weren't expecting me, but I wanted to see you again, and since I couldn't very well knock at the door at this time of night, he said, slipping his arm around her. Chapter 21 Lily had only just had time to hide the scandal sheets from view, and now she looked up at Maximilian, 
astonished at his unexpected appearance. She wanted to be angry with him. The news of her father's illness had kindled fresh resentment against the Duke, but the smile on Maximilian's face told a different story. Why had he come to her like this? They had not planned to meet, and there was no outward appearance to satisfy. The visit was entirely of his own accord, and now Lily wondered if it was not for his own advantage. What are you doing here? she asked, fearing he might take advantage of her. But to her surprise, he stepped back, looking at her with hopeful expectation. I... I just wanted to see you. The dinner tonight. It's been a long time since my family took me seriously. You've brought out the best in me, Lily, in their eyes at least. I wanted to thank you. I know I shouldn't have come, but I couldn't help myself. I wanted to see you, he said, blushing as Lily smiled. Despite her earlier feelings of resentment, there was something sweet in his unexpected appearance, and it did not seem he had any ulterior motive in coming to see her. Glancing at the discarded scandal papers on the floor, Lily realised there was nothing she could write against him. He had done nothing but behave as the perfect gentleman, and even his actions now could only be described as romantic, as strange as it seemed to admit so. What if we're overheard? Lily whispered, for Alicia's bedroom was next to hers, and should they be discovered together, Lily herself would become the subject of scandal. I won't stay long. I just wanted to thank you. I know it's all a deception, and none of it's real. But for the first time in a long while, my family thinks I'm doing the right thing. My father even suggested I'd turned over a new leaf. It's what I want them to think of me. And you've helped me do so, Lily. In just a few short days, I'm a different person, he said, smiling at Lily, who blushed. This had not been her intention, quite the opposite, in fact. She had hoped to lure Maximilian into scandal and had assumed he would behave towards her with the same callous attitude he had treated so many other women in the past. But it seemed he really did mean to change, and that meant Lily's hopes of bringing down the dukedom were over. I'm glad to hear it, she stammered, and he took her hands in hers and sighed. Oh, I feel elated, he said. Lily had been taken by surprise at his appearance and by the gratitude he had displayed. But now her mind was racing and she realised she would need to do something if she was to help her father and see justice served. She had almost felt sympathetic towards Maximilian's family. Their philanthropy and desire to do good stood at odds with her perception of them. But she reminded herself sternly why she had come to Lancaster and that any faltering on her part would mean her father's continued incarceration. I'm glad to hear it, but do you really believe they'll allow the marriage to go ahead? She asked, dangling the possibility of a problem before him and hoping he might be swayed into scandalous behaviour. His unexpected arrival at Alicia's house could be used against him. If only he would do something other than stand there thanking her. Why wouldn't they? You were a great relief to them. At last, a respectable young lady, and not some. Advantage taker from the village. Oh, they'll allow it. I know they will. We can keep up the pretense, or, he said, his words trailing off as Lily narrowed her eyes. I don't understand what you mean, she said, even as she understood entirely. He really was falling in love with her, and as the astonishing realisation came over her, Lily felt quite overwhelmed. I mean, well, in time, perhaps we might... Oh, I don't know, and I've never felt like this before. I'm used to taking what I want and leaving it at that. But couldn't we? I mean, a courtship, he said. Lily's eyes grew wide. It was clear Maximilian was not good at this sort of thing. He could be the bravado-filled rake taking what he wanted and leaving a trail of destruction behind him. But as for actual feelings... Oh, but I'm just the daughter of a merchant. The Duke of Lancaster can't marry the daughter of a merchant, she exclaimed, but Maximilian shook his heed. I don't care who your father is. He could be anyone. It doesn't matter. But please, think about it, Lily, he said. But your parents would. It's an impossible situation, Lily said, 
but Maximilian shook his head. My father isn't like that. He has his faults, but, well, there are things in the past, things better left unspoken. None of that matters now, though. I just want you to think about it, he said. Lily nodded. She felt thoroughly confused. It was the strangest of feelings. Maximilian had behaved in exactly the opposite way to how she had expected. She had wanted scandal and to ruin him, and yet in coming close to him, Lily had discovered another side to him. He wanted to be loved, to be accepted, to leave the past behind. It was as though the scandal sheets had held up a mirror to him, and he had been shocked by his reflection. I will, she said astonished at his words, and yet unable to feel the anger and animosity she willed herself to feel against him. He raised her hand to his lips. His kiss was gentle, and Lily did not pull away. He looked at her and smiled. I'll see you very soon tomorrow, I hope, but I should go. I'll send a carriage for you in the morning. We're to have a picnic on the moorland. There's an old house out there, Briar Heights. My parents knew it in their younger days. I'd like you to see it, he said, and Lily nodded. He slipped back over the window ledge, clinging to the ivy and grinning at her. Be careful, she whispered, and he nodded. I will be. Good night, and thank you, he said, and with that he was gone. Lily sighed. She felt confused as to what had just passed between them, even as Maximilian's own feelings had seemed certain. It was the strangest of feelings, and she dismissed the idea of any emotional connection to him. You hate him, she told herself, and yet she did not hate him, quite the opposite, in fact, and as she lay down to sleep, Lily could not help but wonder what it would be to say yes to the unexpected feelings rising in her heart. Lily, are you awake? Lily, a voice above her said, and Lily opened her eyes to find Alicia looking down at her. She sat up with a start, remembering the events of the previous night, and wondering if Alicia suspected anything of her secret liaison. Is it late? Lily asked, for she did not know how long she had slept. Alicia rolled her eyes. Late enough, yes, and look at the mess, all these papers lying around. You left the window open. A breeze must have caught them, she said, stooping to pick up the discarded scandal papers from the floor. Lily leaped out of bed, with a sudden realisation as to what was about to happen. But she was too late to prevent Alicia from reading the piece of paper she now held in her hand. Her eyes grew wide with astonishment and she stared at Lily in disbelief. But I don't understand, Lily. It can't be... These are scandal papers. You're the one writing all these things about Maximilian, she said. And Lily sat back down on the bed with a sigh. I am, yes. I didn't want to tell you, in case, well, I knew you'd be angry, she said, as Alicia continued to look through the papers, shaking her head in disbelief. But Lily, you came here to do this. Why? she stammered. I was going to tell you the truth, I promise but I got so caught up in the matter and then the opportunity for the courtship. It's all fake, of course. I wanted to get close to him, Lily said, and now she told Alicia the story from the start. She explained how her father had been a land agent for the Duke of Lancaster and how it was the Duke's fault he was now in prison. She told Alicia of her desire for revenge and how she had brought down many an aristocratic family with her London scandal sheets. Alicia listened in astonishment, and her eyes grew wide with horror when Lily told her how Maximilian had declared his emerging feelings for her the night before. He was here? she exclaimed, and Lily nodded. But nothing happened. That's the problem. He seems to have changed, she said. Lily was not about to admit her own changing feelings towards Maximilian, it was enough to suggest Maximilian was not entirely the man she had at first believed him to. In her mind, she had a job to do. Her father was counting on her, and despite the unexpected change in Maximilian, Lily knew she could not be deterred from doing what she had set out to do. But what will you do now? I confess. I feel used, Alicia said. But Lily shook her head. 
taking hold of Alicia's hand in hers. It had never been her intention to use Alicia for her own gain. They were friends, and it was the fortune of circumstance rather than deliberate cunning Lily had taken advantage of. I wanted to tell you, but it had to look real. I was going to, I promise, she said, and Alicia sighed. But if he really has changed, what then? If there's no scandal to discover, are you just going to string him along and pretend? If you break the courtship, you'll be the one whose name ends up in the mud. And as for your father, Alicia said. Lily was all too aware of the risks she was taking. It was supposed to have been so simple. She would get close to Maximilian, win his trust, and see his scandalous behaviour firsthand. She had imagined his rakish ways would continue, not only with her, but with other women too, and that she would have no end of things to write in a final devastating blow. And yet the dinner with the Duke and Duchess, and Maximilian's unexpected appearance in her bedroom the previous night, had only sought to dissuade Lily as to Maximilian's true nature. He had changed, and the possibility of his downfall now lay in tatters. I know that, but I don't know what else to do, Lily admitted. She was always so sure of herself, but now she felt confused. And when a carriage arrived later that morning to take her on the picnic at Briar Heights, Lily's confusion only remained. Isn't it wild out here? I love the moorlands. We used to come out here when I was a child. It's all overgrown, of course, but... There's something romantic about it, don't you think? Maximilian said. Lily was standing next to him on a tuft of heather, looking down at the house, Briar Heights, lying in a hollow of trees below. They had driven for some miles by carriage before taking to horseback to complete the journey, arriving at the house a little before noon. Half a dozen servants had accompanied them and were busy erecting a canopy under which they would picnic. The Duke and Duchess were in the garden below, whilst William and Anne were sitting with William's mother, to whom Lily had been introduced. Her name was Teresa, and the two of them had enjoyed a pleasant conversation during the ride, even as Lily remained distracted by her confused and unexpected thoughts. It's a remarkable place, she said, and Maximilian smiled. I'm really so very glad to be here with you. I look at William and Anne, and I see... Well, I see what might be, he said. Lily knew she had to put a stop to this. It was all becoming too much. Maximilian, I... I'm glad I can help you, but... We really can't be anything more, she stammered, but he stopped her, raising his hand as he spoke. I know you don't think you're good enough. It's your father, I know. It doesn't matter, and I want to prove it to you. I want to tell you something. It's something I've never told anyone before, and in telling you I'm proving to you my esteem, and more so, my trust, he said. At this, Lily paused, uncertain of what to say. She knew there was more about Maximilian, about his family and their past. Her father had not revealed it, or perhaps this was something even he was not aware of. She realised what it could mean, the moment she had been waiting for. Only if you're sure, she said, and Maximilian nodded. I want to prove to you I'm not a rake, that I've changed, he said, clasping her hands in his. Lily nodded, her heart beating fast at the thought of what he was about to say. A hidden lover? An illegitimate child? A secret sibling? It could all be used for his ruin. Then tell me what you want to tell me, she said, and Maximilian glanced over his shoulder, making sure they could not be overheard. William's my cousin, born out of wedlock. My uncle died in Corsica. That's why my father inherited the dukedom. But Teresa was carrying him before my father and uncle went off to war. They'd have gotten married if he'd come back. But he didn't. That's why father made William his godson and lavished so much care and attention on him. He set him up in business, gave him the barony, and treated him as the nephew he was, albeit without revealing the truth, Maximilian said. Lily gasped. It was an astonishing story. And in it was the possibility of a scandal so great as to bring down the dukedom itself. But that means... Does he have a claim over you? she asked, staring at Maximilian in disbelief. No, that's all been settled. I'm the heir to the dukedom. 
But you understand William's place now, he said, and Lily nodded. She understood it very well, and she understood its possibility too. Maximilian had trusted her with his darkest secret, and now it was up to Lily to decide what to do with it. Chapter 22 Lily now knew the truth of the scandal. The Duke's brother, the illegitimate son, the hiding in plain sight. And yet, somehow, it did not seem as grave a matter as she had imagined whatever truth was revealed to be. The Duke had done an honourable thing in raising William, giving him an education, and making him the Baron of Mowbray. How easy it would have been to send the child away, to abandon him to his fate. And yet Ralph and Miriam had proved themselves benevolent. And William had been offered all the advantages his father would have wanted. And you've kept this secret all this time? Lily asked, still staring at Maximilian in disbelief. He nodded. I didn't know it as a child. It was only later I discovered the truth. The problem was always Connor Edge. He was the land agent, and he tried to blackmail everyone. My mother and father, William's mother, even William himself. He was poison, and I'm only glad he's locked away, Maximilian replied. Lily gasped. She had not understood her father's involvement. She had not known the truth, and now she realised there was no reason for Maximilian to lie. He was telling her the secret, the obstacle, as he saw it, between her accepting a genuine courtship between them. Connor Edge, he, he tried to blackmail your parents, she asked, and Maximilian nodded. Oh yes, it was here at Briar Heights all those years ago. It was terrible, he said, shaking his head. Lily now realised just how little she knew about her father. He had always spoken so vaguely about his time in Lancaster, yet vehemently of his hatred for the Duke and Duchess. And he's in prison for it, she asked. Officially for fixing cards and dice but he was stealing money from the estate too, along with the attempted blackmail. My father was merciful to him the first time. My grandmother, God rest her soul, discovered what he'd been doing, and he was sent away with the threat of exposure should he return. He encountered William in London and manipulated him, turning him against my father before the truth was revealed, Maximilian continued. Lily's whole world was unravelling. The certainties in which she had built her hatred and vitriol for the Duke were tumbling around her. Things once confused now made sense, even as so many questions remained. She remembered William's time in London. Her father had told her he had encountered a young man to whom he was giving some assistance, though she had never met him, and as for the events all those years ago, it seemed her father's vagueness in recollection was the result of his being responsible for his own downfall. It's extraordinary, Lily said, shaking her head, and it means whatever you believe about yourself and your father is wrong. My parents don't care about class and wealth. They took in a servant, didn't they? Maximilian said, glancing at where Teresa was sitting with William and Anne. Lily nodded. It would take some time to understand fully what she had been told, and the rest of the picnic passed in something of a daze. She had discovered the very secret she had desired a secret she could use to expose a scandal at the heart of the dukedom, even as its protagonists had behaved with honour. But the ton was fickle, and the bastard son of the dead duke would make a salacious morsel in the drawing rooms and salons of the county. But despite having discovered her prize, Lily no longer wanted to use it, for she had discovered a great deal more too. And as they made their way home across the moorland, she felt thoroughly confused as to her feelings both towards Maximilian and her father. What happened? Have you got something to write about? Alicia asked as she and Lily sat in the drawing room later that evening drinking sherry before dinner. Lily shook her head. Alicia's parents were out and she was glad the two of them were alone, for she could not face the possibility of further explanations and confusion. She did not want to tell Alicia the truth, not about the scandal or about her father. The thought of writing the scandal sheet repulsed her, even as she had been entirely set on doing so up to that point. All her certainties were gone, replaced by the terrible thought her father was the one who had lied to her. I don't want to talk about it. Maximilian isn't who I thought him to be, Lily replied, and Alicia rolled her eyes. 
Don't say you're actually falling in love with him. Oh, Lily, I can't keep up with your changes of heart. It's all so confusing. Don't you want to ruin him? What about your father? She asked, but Lily shook her head. It doesn't matter anymore, she replied, even as it mattered a great deal. The door of the drawing room now opened, and the butler appeared, looking somewhat perturbed. A visitor, Miss Saunders, she said, and Alicia looked up in surprise. At this hour, she said, and the butler nodded. Lily suspected it would be the Duke, but to her utter astonishment, and before the butler could return with instructions to show him in, her father now appeared in the drawing room. He smiled at her, holding out his arms as she rose to her feet, surprise etched on her face. My darling child, he said, coming to embrace her. Father, I... she stammered, uncertain what to say or do in the light of the revelations of that day and his unexpected appearance. I've been granted a reprieve. My health was... bad, he said coughing slightly and smiling. Lily embraced him, though she felt somewhat odd in doing so, unable to rid herself of Maximilian's words and the knowledge of what her father had done. When last she had visited him, her determination to see him avenged was absolute, but now... I didn't think I'd see you here, I thought... she said, as Alicia discreetly left the room. I had to come. I had to see you. My darling child, you've done so well. The things you've written, music to my ears. We'll bring them down, a house built on sand, he said, rubbing his hands together gleefully. But father, I... She faltered, unable to say the words. He had lied to her. Everything had been a lie. There was no truth in anything he had ever told her about the Duke of Lancaster. He, not they, were responsible for his downfall, and if anything... The Duke had acted mercifully, even as there was no reason he should have done so. What more do you know? Tell me everything, her father said, pouring himself a brandy Mr Saunders decanter and settling himself down in a chair next to the pianoforte. The last time I wrote, I told you I'd danced with Maximilian at the Miller Howe Ball. That led to an invitation to dinner at Burnley Abbey and a picnic at a place called Briar Heights, Lily said, uncertain as to what her father now knew. Ah, yes, Briar Heights, the scene of so much treachery, he exclaimed, with a gleeful expression on his face. He was waiting for her to reveal some scandal, lascivious gossip he could use, and yet Lily could not bring herself to say anything, for there was nothing to say. She felt torn, angry with her father for his lies and angry with herself for having believed them. And Maximilian told me about William, she said knowing she could not keep the matter a secret. Her father narrowed his eyes. Is that so? The bastard son. Then you know what to do, Lily. He's handed it to you on a silver platter, and along with everything else, you can write a scandal sheet of such devastation as to bring down the dukedom, he exclaimed. But Lily did not want to write such a scandal paper. In the past, it had been easy to destroy other people's lives. There had been a detachment in the matter, and without any personal involvement, the sweep of the pen had been without consequence. But this was different. Lily knew the Duke had done all he could for William, and that it was her own father who had tried to expose it. But... I need more time, Lily said, even as her father dismissed the idea with a wave of his hand. You've got everything you need, Lily. You don't need any more time. You promised me, didn't you? Think of what I've suffered he said, fixing her with an imploring look. But in that look, Lily saw a lifetime of lies. He was not looking at her with a father's love, but with the look of one who knows how to use others to their advantage. He had played the Duke and Duchess for fools, William too, and now... His own daughter, Lily told herself, even as she fought back the tears, not wanting to believe the truth before her. I'll write it, but... It's not the right time, she said, and her father pointed to the writing desk in the corner of the room. It is the right time, Lily. If he hadn't told you it himself, I'd have done so, though. But it doesn't matter now. You know the truth for yourself. Think of it, Lily. They'll be ruined, he said, finishing his glass of brandy and pouring another. Lily went reluctantly to the writing table. 
A few days previously, she would have relished this task, but now, holding the quill in her hand, she found herself unable to summon the necessary powers required. She could not write a lie, even as her father stood over her. I can't, she said, and he placed his hand forcefully on her shoulder. You can, Lily. Start by reminding your readers about the past, the Duke's brother Max, his death in the war, the odd coincidence of a godson. Then reveal the truth, he said. Lily knew she had no choice but to write. She could not tell her father what she knew. He would only deny it if she did. And what good would it do her? She needed more time. But as she wrote, Lily knew it was all a lie. She knew the truth, and it was not as her father had told her. Maximilian's here, Lily. He's waiting in the hallway for you. Mother just received him, Alicia said. It was the following morning, and Lily had only just come down to breakfast. The night had been long, and her father had kept her up until the small hours composing the scandal paper. He had returned to his lodgings, promising to visit her the next morning. And then deliver our offering to the printer, he had said, smiling unpleasantly as he had bid her farewell. Lily knew she should not have been surprised at Maximilian's arrival. They had entered a deeper intimacy, one where she now knew the truth of his family's past. It was clear he meant to pave the way for a courtship with honesty, even as Lily herself had been far from so. She found him in the hallway, bearing a large bunch of roses. They're beautiful, she exclaimed, the sweet scent filling the air, and he slipped his arm around her and drew her into his embrace. I've wanted to see you again since the moment we parted. I can't stop thinking about you, Lily, he exclaimed. Lily blushed. She was flattered by his words. They were entirely sincere. Gone was the rakish bravado, replaced with an endearing genuineness. Lily could not help but admit she had felt the same. You're very kind, she said, smiling as she took the roses and feeling terribly guilty for having the newly written scandal sheet in her pocket. Her father had insisted they take it to the broker press that morning. He would be arriving any moment. I want you to know how you've changed me. I just can't believe, well, the way I've behaved towards those other women. But it doesn't matter now, does it? I mean, it does matter, and I'm sorry for it. But I needed you, he said, and Lily sighed. She took the roses from him, a thorn digging into her finger as she did so. She too had been a thorn, even as it seemed Maximilian had become a rose. You're very kind, and I... It's just... There's more to me than you realise, Lily said. She knew she could not accept his advances. He could never know the truth. It doesn't matter. I'm used to family secrets. I don't need to know the truth, any of it. But I know you've changed me, Lily. You've made me into a far better man than I ever was before. I'm so grateful to you, he said. And he looked at her with such love as to make her feel quite overwhelmed. Well... That's very kind of you, but I don't know. Shouldn't we allow matters to play out a little longer? We still have the pretense of the courtship, don't we? There's no need to rush, she said, hoping to buy time even just a few days. But the thought of the scandal paper was too dreadful. She could not see him destroyed, even as she knew her father would not rest until every drawing room and salon in the county knew the truth about William and the Duke. But why the need for a pretense? Don't we have it in full? I know you're doubtful, Lily, but please, see beyond my past. See the man I've become, the man I can be, he implored her. Lily did see. She saw it all. How a man can change and become better, leave the past behind and make a new beginning. Seized with a sudden guilt at her past, inability to forgive or recognise change, she felt entirely sorry for what she was about to do but what she could still prevent if she made her mind up to do so. I do see it, Maximilian. I wasn't sure at first. Others warned me, but... She stammered, and he put his hands on her shoulders, gazing at her imploringly. Please, Lily, don't believe what Alicia wrote or whoever wrote it. Those scandal papers only tell one side of the story, not at all, he said. Lily was about to protest in defence of Alicia, when the door of the house opened, 
and over Maximilian's shoulder she saw her father standing on the threshold. She stared at him in horror, even as Maximilian turned and let out a cry. You! You're supposed to be in prison! he exclaimed as Connor strode across the hallway. I was, but I could hardly keep away from my daughter, could I? Connor replied, and Maximilian stared at Alicia in horror. Chapter 23 Lily did not know what to say. Everything had unravelled, and Maximilian now backed away from her, staring in disbelief as Connor put his arm around her. Didn't she tell you who her father was, Maximilian? No, she's too clever for that. I raised her. I should know. How's your father these days? Connor said as Maximilian's face turned red with anger. You tricked me, he stammered, but Lily shook her head. No, please, Maximilian, it wasn't like that, I promise you. I didn't mean to, she said, but Maximilian interrupted her. You're the one who wrote the scandal papers, aren't you? That's why you wanted to get close to me. You were at the assembly rooms and then with the Count and Countess of Morecambe, and on that first night too. It all makes sense now. Oh, what have I done? he exclaimed and it seemed the realisation of his revelation had now occurred to him. Yes, quite the fool, Maximilian, Lily's father said. Maximilian cursed him, pointing his finger angrily at Lily and shaking his head. You wanted to destroy me. But you won't. I promise you that, he said. And with that, he stormed out of the house, banging the door behind him. Lily stared up at her father with fury. He had a satisfied smirk on his face the look of a man who knows victory is his. Father, she said, shaking her head. Pulling the scandal sheet from her pocket, she tore it in two, and her father stared at her in astonishment, his expression turning to anger. You believe him, don't you? he snarled, and Lily faced him defiantly. Is it true? What happened? Is it true, father? Did you blackmail them? Did you turn William against them? Lily asked. She wanted to hear him say it, to admit he had done those terrible things, even as he had tried to make himself the victim. They put me in prison, he snarled. You put yourself in prison, father. They forgave you. They sent you away, but you couldn't let it rest. You wanted revenge, and you've used me to get it, Lily stammered. She had always trusted her father. He had been her role model, and she had defended him against her mother's criticism. But now. But don't you see it, Lily? Don't you see what they've done to me? He exclaimed. But Lily had heard enough. Everything she had thought true was proved false. The Duke and Duchess were not the enemy. It was her father who was the villain in all of this, and Lily could only feel a terrible sense of shame in what she had done and in what she had intended to do. So set had she been on taking revenge. She had failed to see the truth and now she had lost everything. I see what you've done to yourself, father. You used me to take revenge on people who weren't guilty. You wanted me to destroy them, Lily said, shaking her head. Her father reached out to her, but she shook his hand away, turning from him, as now he grew angry. I'm your father, Lily. Do you really believe them over me? he exclaimed. But it's the truth, father. You blackmailed them, you lied, you cheated, and you wanted me to publish that, she said, pointing to the torn pages of the scandal sheet lying on the hallway floor. I wanted you to show loyalty, Lily, he snarled. At that moment, Mr. and Mrs. Saunders appeared in the hallway. It seemed they had been listening from the drawing room, and now they appeared in the hallway accompanied by Alicia, who had an anxious look on her face. Lily. Are you all right? she exclaimed as tears welled up in Lily's eyes. I think you should go, Connor, Mr. Saunders said, shaking his head. Connor glared at him. When it comes to my daughter, I won't be told what to do, he snarled, but Mr. Saunders pointed to the door. From what I've heard, you've put yourself at odds with such a title. How could you use her like that? And for your own revenge? I knew you'd had dealings with the Duke of Lancaster, but this he said, glancing at Lily, who was now being comforted by Alicia. 
I did what I had to do, Connor snarled, but Lily could not bear to look at him. He had betrayed her. He had betrayed his own daughter, and Lily could feel nothing but sorrow for the way she had been used. Maximilian was lying on his bed, staring up at the ceiling. He had returned to Burnley Abbey in a fit of rage, but his anger had now turned to sadness. Even when he tried to do the right thing, he was thwarted. I suppose it's poetic justice, he thought to himself, imagining the gleeful looks on the faces of all the women he had wronged at hearing of his downfall. He felt an utter fool, and the thought of telling his parents what had happened filled him with dread. He had trusted Lily emphatically, trusted her with his family's darkest secret, and unbeknownst to him, he had fallen into a trap. There was no doubt as to who the writer of the scandal sheets was. Lily had planned the whole thing, getting close to him, gaining his confidence, ready for the final devastating blow. I don't want anything to do with any woman ever again, he told himself, for whether rakish or noble it seemed he could not win. Lily had been different. He had fallen in love with her and come to believe she could feel the same for him. But it had all been an act, and Maximilian had been left humiliated. He sighed, rolling onto his side and pulling the blankets over his head, just as a gentle tap came at the door. Maximilian, his mother called out. Maximilian would gladly have ignored her, but the door now opened without invitation and his mother appeared smiling sympathetically at him. I don't know what's brought this on, but... Lily's downstairs in the hallway. She's asking to speak with you, the Duchess said, coming to sit on the edge of his bed. Maximilian sat up in surprise. He did not want to speak to Lily, even as he felt intrigued as to what she might say. Had she come to apologise to him? There was surely nothing more to say. She had proved herself the agitator. Any pretense of love or affection was insincere. There was nothing between them, even as Maximilian had hoped there could be. If I told you, mother, you'd only be angry with me, he said but his mother shook her head. I wouldn't be, Maximilian, not necessarily. I've seen such a change come over you these past few days. After the picnic, you were ecstatic. What's changed? she asked. Maximilian sighed. I learned something about Lily, something I can't tell you. She's not what we thought her to be, he said. Oh, Maximilian, is anyone ever who they seem? Why don't you go down and talk to her? She seemed terribly upset. Don't let the chance of happiness slip away from you. Whatever it is, let her explain, she said. Maximilian felt torn. He wanted to hear Lily's explanation, and yet the thought of what she had done, what she could still do, was enough to terrify him. The secret was there to be exposed, a secret kept for all these years. A scandal like this would engulf the family. It had the power to bring down the dukedom, and that was just what Connor Edge wanted. I don't think I'll ever be happy, mother, Maximilian admitted, but his mother shook her head. Give yourself a chance, Maximilian, she replied, patting him on the arm before leaving the room. Maximilian was in two minds, but curiosity now got the better of her. He did not understand why she had come. Was it a threat, or would she show genuine remorse? Reluctantly, he got out of bed and made his way downstairs. She was standing in the hallway, her back turned, but at the sound of his footfall on the stairs, she turned. There was no one else around, and Maximilian was surprised to see tears in her eyes as she looked up at him imploringly, shaking her head. Maximilian, I'm so sorry, she said, as he came to stand before her. I don't know you he said, and she reached out and took his hand in hers. I know I've done a terrible thing, but I want you to understand why, she said. He pulled his hand away from her, convinced this was just another act. Perhaps even now she was still convinced she could learn something more about him, something more to publish and damage him with. You lied to me, he said, and she nodded. I know I did but that's because I believed what my father had told me. I believed the Duke and Duchess had thrown him to the lions, that they were nothing but wicked charlatans, 
only interested in covering up their sordid secrets with an innocent man's blood. I came to Lancashire to bring them down to avenge my father, and I did it by exposing you. I know how it sounds, but the more I came to know you, the more I doubted myself, and now, well, I know the truth about my father. I know what he did, and it sickens me to my very heart, she said, shaking her head as fresh tears rolled down her cheeks. Maximilian stared at her. He did not know whether to believe her or not. How could he trust her after everything she had done to him? But it was all a lie, he said, even as she shook her head. No, it wasn't. I enjoyed the time we spent together. It meant a great deal. It was... I saw a change in you. I admit I expected things to be easy. I was going to write a final scandal sheet exposing everything you did to me. But there was nothing to expose, she said, her words trailing off as Maximilian shook his head. And I'm supposed to believe your sincerity. I know what everyone thinks of me, and perhaps I should have just behaved as you all expected. It hardly mattered, did it? You know the truth now. You know something far more interesting than the foibles and fumbles of a ballroom. You know about William. I trusted you, Lily. I told you the truth. I wanted you to know because I'd fallen in love with you. I'd never told anyone about it before, but I wanted to tell you. I hoped to build a bond between us. But I don't understand why you've come now, except to cause more trouble for me and my family, he said folding his arms and fixing her with an angry glare. Her tears were crocodile tears. There was no sincerity there, or so he told himself. He could not believe she would disown her own father, even as Connor had been exposed to her as nothing but a wicked man, seeking revenge for his own perceived injustice. I've come because I'm sorry, Maximilian. I'm truly sorry. I thought I was doing the right thing, but I know the truth now. Please, can you find it in your heart to forgive me? she asked. Maximilian looked at her and sighed. He did not know if he could believe her or not. The look in her eyes, the tone of her voice, the hand reaching out imploringly. I... I thought you were different. You made me a different person, but... I realise I was wrong. Perhaps all women are the same. Perhaps I wasn't the one in the wrong, or the one who needed to change, he said. Lily shook her head. Tears rolled down her cheeks. She tried to take his hand in hers, but he pulled it away. I don't need you. I was a fool to think you might love me. But I realise the truth now. It was all nonsense, pure fantasy. You played me for a fool. Perhaps I deserved it. You'll publish your wicked words just like you did before. But it hardly matters, does it? I'll still be the Duke of Lancaster and let womankind be damned, he exclaimed, turning away from her, ashamed of what he had allowed to happen. His father would never forgive his stupidity, but he had trusted Lily, and she had betrayed his trust. He had allowed her to capture his heart, and for just a short while, Maximilian had known what it was to be in love and believe himself loved in return. But all that was gone, and now he was left with nothing but the possibility of ruin, for him and the family he loved. It matters to me. I'm sorry I hurt you. I was always so used to writing those scandal papers, to destroying lives. It hardly seemed to matter any more. But my own feelings got in the way, she said. Maximilian scoffed at her. Oh, I see. And I should feel sorry for you, should I? He demanded, but she shook her head. I'm not seeking sympathy. I wanted... I realised I felt the same way about you. It was the strangest feeling, anger, yet a feeling of... growing love, she said, and he looked up at her in surprise. But still, he doubted her. She was well practised in deceit. She had made a profession out of it. He could not trust anything, she said and shaking his head, he pointed towards the door. I can't believe you, Lily. You should go. I'm finished with women. I'll go back to my roses. At least their thorns are visible, he said, shaking his head sadly. But as he turned to make his way back upstairs, the door from the servant's staircase opened, and Connor himself appeared, his face set in anger. I knew she'd be here. But for what reason? 
What side have you taken, Lily? he demanded. Lily stared at him in horror. I... I don't want anything to do with you, father. You lied to me. You humiliated me. None of it was true, she exclaimed as Connor lunged forward. Instinctively, Maximilian stepped between them, protecting Lily, even as Connor now drew a dagger from his belt. Get out of my way! She's coming with me! he snarled. So you can continue to spread your lies, I suppose, Maximilian replied, holding Connor's gaze unflinchingly. Chapter 24 Lily was terrified. She had never seen her father so angry. The steel of the dagger glinted in the sunlight, coming through the hallway window, as Maximilian held out his arms, shielding Lily from the attack. You're coming with me, Lily, her father snarled. I'm not. I don't want to. I don't want anything to do with you, she cried, and Connor's eyes flashed with anger. It was always the same. Men like this, the Duke, his brother, now his son, taking what they wanted and leaving ruin and destruction in their wake, Connor replied and with a sudden movement he made a lunge for Maximilian who fell back with a cry. The commotion now brought footsteps on the stairs, the opening of doors, the shout of voices. Lily too fell back, screaming, as her father and Maximilian struggled on the hallway floor. The Duke was there now, along with William and several of the other servants. Get hold of him, my God, Connor, the Duke exclaimed as Lily's father was seized by two of the footmen and hauled to his feet, the dagger knocked from his hand. Breathless, his collar torn, his waistcoat dishevelled, he cursed the duke as Lily helped Maximilian to his feet. He had a cut to the arm, and Lily took out her handkerchief to stem the flow of blood as the duke looked from one to the other in astonishment. Are you all right? Lily said, holding Maximilian in her arms. I'll be all right, he said, as the Duke turned to Connor. I thought you were in prison. You knew the price if you returned. What's the meaning of it? he demanded. Connor pointed angrily at Lily, his face contorted with rage. Ask my daughter, he snarled. The Duke's eyes grew wide and the Duchess, who had been standing in horror at the bottom of the stairs, gasped. Daughter? But Lily, is this true? she asked, and Lily nodded. It's true, Your Grace. I'm not Lily Porter. I'm Lily Edge. And Connor's my father. I'm not proud of it. And I'm so very sorry for all that's happened. I sought to betray you all for his sake, she stammered. The Duke shook his head, and Maximilian now pulled away from Lily's embrace, leaving her standing alone before them. The Duchess and William exchanged glances. What does she know? Maximilian's mother asked. She knows everything, mother. They were going to publish it in the scandal papers. She wrote them, all of them, Maximilian said. Lily was humiliated, and tears welled up in her eyes. She was filled with sorrow and regret, and yet she knew it was entirely of her own doing. She had trusted her father, and he had betrayed her. I thought it was all over. I thought we'd heard the last of Connor Edge, but it seemed I was wrong. You were the cuckoo in the nest. It's a betrayal but I can't be merciful this time, Connor. I'll have you locked away for the rest of your life. I've got the papers to prove your past misdeeds, and now you try to kill my son and expose me to scandal. That's the end of it, Connor, the Duke said, shaking his head. I won't rest until you're brought down, Connor snarled. Lily looked imploringly at Maximilian. She knew she did not deserve forgiveness. She had behaved as badly as her father. She had colluded with him, and even in her deep remorse there could be no escaping her complicity in what had happened. He had used her, and she had been so blinded by loyalty as to not see the truth, until it was too late. William shook his head. You've tried many times, Connor. You tried the same with me. But it won't work. When will you realise it's you that's wrong? You're the one who's done this, all of it. You tried to blackmail my mother and my godfather and godmother. You drew me into your wicked schemes. I trusted you too, he said, glancing at Lily, as though with a hint of understanding. And you were a fool to believe their lies too, Connor exclaimed. But William shook his head. There's only one fool here, Connor, and it's you. 
you're the one who deceived yourself. You were greedy and you wanted revenge, and now you've even used your own daughter to secure it. You're a pitiable man, he replied. Lily could hardly bear to look at her father. Everything she had believed about him lay in tatters, like the torn scandal sheets. He was the real scandal, and Lily would not have blamed Maximilian if he now dragged her name into the mud too. Summon the magistrate, have him return to prison. Lock him up for now, the Duke said, turning to the butler who nodded. As you wish, your grace, he replied, and the footman dragged Connor away as the Duke turned to Lily. Her hands were trembling, and she looked down at the black and white chequered marble floor, wishing she was anywhere but there. I suggest you consider carefully who you trust from now on, Lily, he said, and shaking his head, he turned towards his study. William followed him, and the Duchess led Maximilian away to the morning room. I'm sorry, Lily cried out, but her words fell on deaf ears, and she was left standing alone in the hallway, the tears rolling down her cheeks. You poor thing, Alicia said, putting her arms around Lily, who sobbed into her shoulder. It was terrible. The look on his face, the things he said. He wasn't my father, but he was my father. All these years, the betrayal, Lily said, as Alicia held her tight. Alicia had been waiting for Lily's return, uncertain of what had happened to her friend, who had hurried from the house without a word. The arrival of her father had upset her dreadfully, the revelation of the truth as to what he had done shaking Lily to her core. Alicia's parents had sent him away, but not before Maximilian had discovered the truth. It was dreadful, and whilst Alicia had at first felt angry with Lily, she could now only feel sorry for her in the wake of the tragedy she had suffered. But he can't hurt you any more, Lily. They'll return him to prison. He tried to kill Maximilian. It'll be years before they release him, if ever, Alicia replied. Lily had furnished her with a brief account of events, but Alicia still had many questions, not least as to what Maximilian's intentions towards Lily were now. I know, but it's the betrayal, the things I did for him. I wanted to ruin them all, she said, looking at Alicia, her face stained with tears. But you didn't. You realised what was happening and you prevented it. No one knows the secret apart from us and we're not going to say anything. Besides, it's in the past. The Duke died many years ago. It doesn't matter now, does it? She said. But Lily shook her head. What I was going to do matters, though, she replied. Alicia sighed. She could see the guilt in Lily's face and she knew her friend was hurting dreadfully. But you didn't do it. You were going to do those things because you believed your father to be in the right. You know the truth now, and that's what matters. There'll be no publication, no more printing from the broker press. You've learned a valuable lesson, Lily, Alicia said, and Lily nodded. They were sitting in the drawing room. Alicia's parents were out, but they would soon return, and Alicia knew they would have many questions for Lily. She wanted to protect her friend, and she knew her sorrow was sincere. Lily was sorry, but as for forgiveness, that could not be guaranteed. In the past, I never thought about the people behind the scandal papers. It didn't matter to me. They didn't matter to me. But now I realise, well, there's always another side to the story, isn't there? Lily said. Alicia was glad to hear Lily say this. On discovering Lily to be the author of the scandal sheets, Alicia had been shocked. She had seen lives destroyed by gossip and she knew how easily lies could spread. There was nothing noble in such exposure, only a desire for titillation and gossip. There is, and you've discovered that the hard way, Lily. You've become part of the scandal yourself. You are the scandal. You discovered a different side to Maximilian, one you weren't expecting. He's not the man you believed him to be, and I can see how you feel about him. You're in love with him, Alicia said. Lily sighed, sinking into a chair by the window and burying her head in her hands. Alicia kneeled at her side. And he was in love with me too, she replied. Alicia slipped her hand into hers. A thought had just occurred to her, even if she felt uncertain as to pursuing it. 
Lily had hurt her, but she deserved a second chance, and with a sudden resolve, Alicia rose to her feet. I'll go and talk to them. I'll make them understand, she said. Lily looked up at her in astonishment. But you can't. It won't work, she said, but Alicia shrugged. There's nothing to lose then, she replied. Lily had behaved terribly, but Alicia knew there was another side to her, a caring, gentle side. They had been friends long enough for her to know that, and when Alicia had needed a place to stay, Lily had been the one to provide it. She valued their friendship, and she hated to see Lily upset. But what are you going to say? she asked. I don't know yet, but I'll think of something, Alicia replied, and without further ado, she hurried from the drawing room. As Alicia approached Burnley Abbey, her heart was beating fast. She was determined to do what she could for her friend, even as she knew Maximilian had every right to refuse to even listen. He had behaved as a rake in the past, but it was clear he had turned over a new leaf, and in Lily, at least for a short while, he had found a reason to do so. Perhaps I can persuade him to see things differently, she thought to herself, even as she knew she had a monumental task ahead of her. Standing at the door, she took a deep breath and knocked. It was opened by the butler, who informed Alicia the Duke and Duchess were otherwise engaged. But I've got to see them. It's about Lily and Lord Maximilian, Alicia said. The butler raised his eyebrows, but before he could utter a further refusal, a voice behind him interrupted. Gregson, who is it? And the Duchess herself appeared at the door. Alicia curtsied. Please, Your Grace. I must speak to you about Lily. She's terribly upset. She's not to blame for all of this. Well, some of it, perhaps. But her father... She's only a child, Alicia said, stammering over her words, even as the Duchess nodded. Come in, Alicia. I understand, she said. And Alicia was ushered into the house. The Duchess led her into the drawing room where they found the Duke deep in conversation with the Baron of Mowbray. Both men looked up in surprise at Alicia, who now felt terribly nervous. I'm sorry to interrupt, Your Grace, she said. And the Duchess explained the reason for Alicia's much more eloquently than Alicia's earlier stammering had conveyed. It seemed she understood just what Connor Edge was like, and was not in the least bit surprised to find even his own daughter manipulated by him. It's a cruel and wicked thing but I wouldn't have expected any less from Connor. I don't blame Lily. Connor has a way of inciting loyalty, the Duke said, glancing at the Baron, who nodded. It was just the same for me. I trusted him. I had no reason not to. I thought myself foolish. But if he can fool his own daughter, well, what hope did I have? William asked. There was no sign of Maximilian himself and Alicia wondered what his feelings towards Lily now were. It seemed the Duke and Duchess would be understanding. They knew what Connor was like. But Maximilian surely felt the sense of betrayal more acutely, and if he chose not to forgive Lily, there would be little Alicia could do to persuade him otherwise. You know what it is we speak of, don't you, Alicia? The Duke said, and Alicia nodded. I do, but I want you to know... Well, I was appalled when I discovered Lily was the author of the scandal sheets. I'd never, she said, her words trailing off at the thought of such a possibility. And we're grateful for that, the Duke replied. But it was Maximilian Alicia needed to convince, and now she spotted him through the drawing room window outside in the rose garden. Do you think I can talk to Lord Maximilian? I know he must feel terribly hurt, but... Surely there's a way to convince him of Lily's sorrow. She's just a child hurt by her father. She did a terrible thing, but might he forgive her? Alicia asked. The Duke and Duchess exchanged glances. We've seen quite a change come over Maximilian since he met Lily. He's a different man, totally different. Before the Miller Howe ball, when he told us he intended to dance with a woman he had met at the market, we were naturally dubious but Lily changed him. He fell in love with her, but I don't know if he can forgive her, the Duchess said, shaking her head sadly. He deserves the chance to do so, though, the Duke said, and Alicia was glad to think she might have a chance, if only one, 
to change Maximilian's mind. I'll call him in from the Rose Garden. It's his refuge, the Duchess said, and excusing herself, she went outside. Alicia was left with the Duke and the Baron, the two men exchanging glances as the Duchess left. We gave Connor every chance we could, the Duke said. But he proved himself unworthy in every way, the Baron concluded. Alicia knew the hurt they had endured at Connor's hands. It was the same hurt she had seen in Lily too. Connor was a betrayer, and if he could betray even his own daughter, it seemed there was little hope of his redemption. What's going to happen to him? Alicia asked. He'll be returned to prison, and may God have mercy on his soul. I once tried to see the best in him, but I can't see anything good in him now. He wanted to destroy us not because of anything we'd done to him, but because of greed, pure and simple. But he's gone too far now. It's one thing to betray someone else's family, but quite another to betray your own, the Duke said, shaking his head. Alicia agreed, and she could only hope Maximilian would too. Chapter 25 Maximilian cursed. He had caught his thumb on a thorn and it was bleeding. He raised it to his mouth, sucking at it, looking down at the roses he was pruning with a sigh. Even beauty has its thorns, he thought to himself, glancing back towards the house from the rose garden. To his surprise, he saw his mother hurrying across the lawn, and now she called to him, looking anxious as she approached. Maximilian, you've got a visitor, she said. Maximilian narrowed his eyes, curious as to who it could be. If it was Lily, he would refuse to see her. He was too angry to be courteous, and as his mother entered the rose garden, Maximilian turned back to his pruning. I don't want to see anyone, he replied, but his mother caught his arm, an imploring look on her face. Please, Maximilian, it's not Lily, it's her friend, Alicia. She wants to talk to you. Lily's terribly upset, she said. And so she should be after what she's done, Maximilian retorted. He had no doubt she was upset, but so was he. He felt betrayed, and he had the wound to prove it. Won't you talk to her? Won't you hear what she has to say? His mother asked. Maximilian sighed. He knew she would have no peace until he agreed, but the thought of another confrontation wearied him. But what does she want to say? Hasn't everything been said? he asked. His mother put her arms around him and kissed him on the cheek. I want you to be happy, Maximilian. Didn't Lily make you happy? I know she did a terrible thing, but it was her father. You know what Connor's like, she said. Maximilian nodded. He understood just what Connor was like, and he could accept the possibility of Lily having been taken in by him. Connor was a wicked man who had tried to bring down the dukedom twice. To use his own daughter in such an attempt was surely to sink to a new level of treachery. And in that, Maximilian could find sympathy with Lily's plight. She had made him happy, more so than any other woman ever had, even as Maximilian was reluctant to admit it now. I do, mother, and I feel a fool for having been caught up in his lies. I'll speak to her, but I doubt she'll change my mind. Maximilian said, and his mother smiled at him. Just speak to her, Maximilian. That's all you have to do, she replied. They made their way across the lawn and back to the house, where they found Alicia in the drawing room with the Duke and William. She looked up at Maximilian with a nervous expression on her face. You wanted to see me, he said, adopting what he hoped was a defensive tone. But if anything, Maximilian was curious. He did care about Lily, even as she had done a terrible thing. He could feel sympathy for her. He did feel sympathy for her. Lily hasn't sent me here to plead her case. She's in a terrible state. Everything she believed in, it's all been destroyed. But I wanted to come myself. I wanted to tell you she's sorry and ask you, well, to give her another chance. She loves you, and I think you love her too, Alicia said. Maximilian felt a sudden upsurge of emotion. He did love Lily, even as he could hardly bear to think of the betrayal he had suffered at her hands. But she had suffered betrayal too, 
and in Connor they had a common enemy, one now vanquished. Glancing at his mother, Maximilian sighed. He wanted to be angry, but all he could feel was pity. I... I do love her, but what she did, he said, shaking his head, as his father stepped forward and placed a hand on his shoulder. What Connor did, Maximilian? It was Connor who did this. He used Lily for his own wickedness, just like he used William, and all of us in turn. He's only ever wanted his own gain at the expense of others, and using his daughter in such a way shows he'll never change. Lily isn't the one to blame, and of all people, you yourself should know what it feels like to be misunderstood, the Duke said. Maximilian sighed. He felt torn, but his father was right. For too long, Maximilian had felt himself unjustly treated. He had played up to his reputation, delighted in it even. But it had not brought him happiness. Even when he had tried to change, there had been those who had not believed he could do so. They had thought him a rake, and that was that. But Lily had believed in that change. She had seen it for herself, and for that reason, she had held back publishing her scandal paper, willing to give him a second chance, even before the revelation about her father had come to light. I... yes, I do understand. But... Won't she go back to London now? There's nothing to keep her here, Maximilian replied as though clasping at a last reason not to give in to the feelings. But Alicia shook her head. Not if you stopped her. Please. She made a terrible mistake, and I know she'll regret it for the rest of her life. She loves you, Maximilian, and you love her too. Isn't that enough to leave the past behind? You've both made mistakes. Why not make a fresh start together? Alicia said. Maximilian had not thought about it like that. He had blamed Lily entirely, and yet the situation had been partly of his own making too. Had he not behaved in such a rakish way, there would have been no scandal to report, and Lily would have had no reason to ingratiate herself with him. Being a rake was necessary, he thought to himself. Think about it, Maximilian. Don't throw away your chance at happiness. We give you our blessing, the Duke said, and his mother nodded. Give Lily a chance, Maximilian. She's not to blame in all of this. She's a victim of Connor, and we all know what it feels like to be so, she said. Maximilian sighed. He would need time to think, but he was grateful to Alicia for what she had done. There was no doubting the strength of her friendship with Lily, and if the others could find it in their hearts to forgive her, perhaps he could too. I can't promise anything, he said, and Alicia nodded. Please, you don't have to decide yet, but don't let her leave. You could both be so happy together, she replied. Alicia left Burnley Abbey with mixed feelings. She had done her best to convince Maximilian of Lily's sorrow, even as he had not immediately followed her on an errand of mercy. There had been confusion in his eyes, and Alicia had the sense Maximilian felt torn between his head and his heart. I can only hope he makes the right decision, Alicia thought to herself. But when she arrived home, she found an uproar ensuing. I can't stay here any longer, Lily said as Alicia hurried up the drive to where a carriage was being loaded with her possessions. But, Lily, you can't just leave. What are you going to do? Alicia exclaimed. I'm going back to London. I need to make peace with my mother. I've written to her, telling her I'm sorry, but it's not enough. She was right about my father. She tried to warn me, but I wouldn't listen. I was stubborn like him. But it's no good. I was wrong about him. I was wrong about everything, Lily replied shaking her head sadly. To her surprise, Alicia now noticed a small bonfire kindled at the side of the house, where piles of paper were smouldering, their edges curled and burned. It was the scandal sheets, and Lily now tossed another pile into the flames. But that doesn't mean you have to leave at once. I'll miss you, Alicia exclaimed, and I'll miss you too. I'm so sorry for what I've done. I betrayed you too, and your parents. You gave me a place to stay and the hospitality of your home. But I was just using you. It's no good. I've got to go, Lily said. And she kissed Alicia hurriedly on the cheek as the last of her bags was placed in the carriage.
Alicia's parents now emerged from the house, and Alicia looked imploringly at her mother, who shook her head sadly. We've tried to talk her out of it, Alicia, but she won't listen, she said, and her father sighed. It doesn't have to be like this, Lily. You did nothing wrong. It's your father who should be ashamed. He should have protected you, but instead he used you for his own gain. You were a pawn in his game, he said, but Lily was not listening. She climbed into the carriage, pulling the compartment door closed, as Alicia stood desperately looking up at her. Lily, please. I saw Maximilian. I talked to him. I think, she stammered, even as she did not know what to think. Maximilian had given no indication of a change of heart. He had shown no suggestion of forgiving Lily, even as he had listened to what his parents and Alicia had said. In truth, Alicia did not know what might be, and she could only plead with Lily to stay a little longer and give Maximilian a chance. But it's impossible, Alicia. I've done something so terrible. I've got to leave. I can't stay here. Not now, Lily replied, and calling out to the carriage driver, she instructed him to drive on. Alicia stood back, and her mother put her arm around her as tears rolled down Alicia's cheeks. I tried to help her, mother, I really did, she said. I know you did, Alicia, but I don't think she wanted you to help her. She believes she's the author of her own downfall, and now all she can do is flee. Isn't that what so many of those she wrote about did? Alicia's mother replied. Alicia watched as the carriage pulled away. Lily looked a pitiable figure, her head bowed, her face etched with sorrow. But as the carriage pulled out of the gates, a sudden, unexpected sight came into view. It was Maximilian, riding at full gallop on a horse. He reined it in, the carriage driver slowing the horses as Maximilian blocked the way. Lily, I've got to talk to you, he cried. And Alicia gasped as the compartment door opened and Lily tentatively stepped out. Chapter 26 Lily had been determined to leave. There was nothing left for her in Lancashire, and back in London every certainty she had held to was gone. She felt lost and alone, even as she knew she had to be reconciled with her mother, if only to tell her how sorry she was for what had happened. Alicia had been kind, far more so than Lily deserved, but there was surely no possibility of her succeeding in convincing Maximilian to change his mind. She had burned the last of the scandal sheets, vowing to never write another word against anyone ever again. But what can he want? she asked herself, as Maximilian leaped down from the saddle and hurried to meet her. He was breathless, and now, much to her surprise, he came up to her and took hold of her hand. Lily, I had to see you. Alicia told me you were going to leave, but please, don't do so. Not just yet, he implored her. Lily stared at him in astonishment. Did he not want her to leave, had she not wronged irreparably? She had betrayed him in a most terrible manner, and she could only feel guilt for all she had done, and all she had intended to do in her father's name. But... I don't understand. Don't you want me to leave? What I did was terrible. I betrayed you. I don't blame you for hating me, she said, but he looked at her imploringly his hands clasped in hers. But I realised I was wrong too. You gave me a second chance when no one else would. You saw a different side to me, Lily. I behaved like a rake. That's why you sought to expose me. Your father manipulated you. I realise that now. It's not your fault. You grew up believing him to be good and honourable, and my family to be wicked, your father's betrayers, he said. Lily sighed. It was just as he said, but that was surely no excuse. She had set out to destroy him, even as she had found herself falling in love with him. But I... you don't have to forgive me. I don't deserve it, she said, but he shook his head. You forgave me, Lily. You saw beyond my faults, and you learned the truth about my family. That means a great deal. It means everything. 
I trusted you with the secret about William, and you've kept that secret now. If it had been as your father told you, perhaps we'd have deserved to be exposed. But you realise the truth, and I'll be forever grateful for that, he replied. Tears welled up in Lily's eyes. She was overwhelmed by the thought of his forgiveness, even as she could not yet bring herself to accept it. I'm so sorry, she said. And now he put his arms around her and kissed her on the top of her head. None of it matters now, Lily. Can't we leave the past behind us? Can't the rake and the scandal sheet writer become something different? He asked. Lily looked up at him and smiled. Do you mean, can we, a real courtship? She asked, and Maximilian nodded. That's just what I mean. Forget the pretense. It doesn't matter now. We can be together and, well, if you'll agree to it, he said. There was no doubt in Lily's mind as to her feelings for him. She loved him, and he had proved his love for her too. It was an unexpected love, entirely so. Lily had not meant to fall in love with Maximilian. She had come to Lancashire because of misguided hatred. She had wanted to see his downfall, and yet Maximilian had proved himself an entirely different man to the one she had wanted to find. He had a past, but so did she. And if he was willing to leave it behind, she was willing to do the same. I do agree, but only if it's truly what you want. I wouldn't blame you for being angry with me. But I'm glad... So glad you came after me, she said, glancing over her shoulder to where Alicia was standing with her parents. Whatever Alicia had said, it was her friend's words Maximilian had responded to, and she would be forever grateful to Alicia for bringing them back together. He held her tightly in his embrace, kissing her on the top of her head, her arms drawing him closer to her, holding him in the relief of what they had so nearly lost. It was Alicia who persuaded me, she wasn't going to let you leave without us speaking. She made me realise, well, she reminded me of my past. We all have a past, Lily, but it's what happens now that matters, isn't it? He said. Lily looked up at him and smiled. He was right. They could leave the past behind, setting out on a new course, happy in the knowledge of forgiveness, both for themselves and one another. It is, yes, and right now, it's all I want, a future together, she said. Lily, too, wanted to put the past behind her. There would be no more scandal sheets. She would not seek other people's ruin or be the source of gossip and scandal. Having tasted it for herself, Lily knew its devastating effects, and now she wanted things behind her and looked to a different future. Her father was gone, and so, too, was his hold over her. And that's what I want, too. You showed me a different way, Lily, and it's the only path I want to take he said. Lily felt the same, even as she had feared she would be forever forced to tread her own path alone. But all that was behind them now. They were forgiven, and had forgiven, and all that mattered was the love they shared. Alicia and her parents now came to congratulate them, and it was a happy party who made their way to Burnley Abbey to share the good news with Maximilian's family. How pleased I am, Lily. More than that, I'm overjoyed for you both. How happy it makes me to see two souls in love, the Duchess said, as she held Lily's hands in hers. I want to say again how sorry I am, Lily replied. But the Duchess shook her head. You'll learn more of the story in due course, but we all know what your father's truly like. I know it won't be easy to entirely disown him, and we wouldn't expect you to, but... She said. But Lily shook her head. Her father could so easily have told her the truth. He could have been happy for her in realising her feelings for Maximilian. He could have wanted what was best for her instead of pursuing his single-minded desire for revenge. There had been no apology, no attempt at reconciliation, only anger and a desire for revenge. Lily could forgive him, but only if he accepted he was wrong. It's hard, Your Grace. I don't know how I feel about him but it's my mother I feel sorry for. I was always convinced my father was in the right. She warned me about him, but I didn't listen. I want to see her. I want to tell her I was wrong, Lily said, and the Duchess nodded. 
There'll be time for that. But I want to promise you our support. We understand what Connor can be capable of. He's tricked us three times now, and I wonder, she said, her words trailing off. Lily feared it too. If her father could talk his way out of prison due to an apparent sickness, perhaps he could talk his way out of the dock too. A man who could manipulate his own daughter for his own gains was dangerous, and Lily feared she had not heard the last of her father far from it. We can only be vigilant, she said, and Maximilian's mother nodded. William and Anne congratulated them too, and the Duke made a toast to a happy future for a happy couple. At length, Lily and Maximilian stepped out onto the terrace, and arm in arm, Maximilian led her to the rose garden. I should have known you weren't entirely a rake, Lily said, and Maximilian looked at her in surprise. Is that so? And why would you think that? he asked, as the perfumed scent of the roses filled the air. Lily looked around her and smiled. There were blooms in every colour, trailing and entwining. It was magical, and reaching up, she pulled one of the flowers to her nose, breathing in the sweetness of its smell. Because a rake couldn't possibly create something as beautiful as this, she said. He took a small pair of scissors from his pocket and snipped the rose she was smelling at the stem. For you, he said, smiling at her as he led her by the arm to an arbour where orange and pink coloured flowers trailed overhead. Will you show me how to grow them? How to cultivate them and trail them? she asked. He nodded. I will, yes. This can be your garden too. A duchess needs a garden, he said, and to her surprise he went down on one knee, taking her hand in his and gazing up at her with hopeful longing. Maximilian, I... She stammered, for she had not imagined he would do such a thing so soon. I know I'm being foolish, but I'm so in love with you, Lily. I can't hold back. We've endured so much and we've come through it together. I'm so sorry for what's happened, and I'm so sorry I upset you as I did by my stubbornness. But we're past that now, and I want you to know I'll go on loving you, and I'll love you more and more each day. Why wait? Will you marry me? He said, and Lily gasped, even as she had no reason to hesitate in her decision. In Maximilian, Lily had found the unexpected. She had looked for a rake, but behind the façade was a man who she had so easily fallen in love with. He had put his former ways behind him, as had she, and together they had realised the love they shared and the future they desired. Turmoil and strife had beset them, but they had overcome so much and emerged all the stronger for it. There was no reason to hold back, and Lily nodded as Maximilian breathed a sigh of relief. I'll marry you. A thousand times I'll marry you. Yes, she exclaimed, and he rose to his feet, throwing his arms around her in an embrace. I could give you every rose in the garden, and it wouldn't speak of how I truly feel, Lily. I was such a fool to almost lose you, he said, and their lips met in a kiss. And I was a fool not to see the truth. We were both fools, but perhaps we can be fools for love now, she said and he nodded. If it means loving you, then yes, he replied. They sat beneath the rose arbour, and Lily rested her head on Maximilian's shoulder, his arm around her, the two of them surrounded by the sweet perfume of the blooms. What will your parents say? Lily asked, and Maximilian laughed. They'll be overjoyed. They never thought they'd see the day when I was married. It'll be quite the surprise for them. For everyone but I know they'll be happy. It's all they've ever wanted for me, to be happy, he said, and Lily smiled. She thought about her own mother, and a sudden pang of guilt ran through her. She had behaved terribly towards her, even as her mother had tried to warn her of the dangers her father posed. I wonder, could we go to London? I want to tell my mother our good news, but I want to tell her I'm sorry too, she said. Maximilian turned to her and nodded. And I want to meet her. Why don't you invite Alicia to come with us? She can act as chaperone. You'll need one now. I don't want anyone to say we're not doing things properly now. 
I won't be called a rake again, he said, and Lily smiled. She was glad he agreed, and glad too to think they could be a couple like any other. There would be no more rakish behaviour, no more scandal sheets, no more cause for whispers and gossip, only the love of two people stepping out on the great adventure of life. Then it's settled. We'll go to London and you'll meet my mother. We can make arrangements for the wedding too, Lily said, realising there was a great deal to think about. She was about to be thrust into an entirely new world. A world she had written about many times, but one she had never expected to be a part of. In time, Lily would be the Duchess of Lancaster, the thought of which was quite astonishing. Meeting your mother. I presume she's nothing like your father, Maximilian said, raising his eyebrows. And Lily blushed. No, she's nothing like him. I only wish I'd realised why sooner, she replied. Epilogue London, England, 1816 Lily and Maximilian did go to London. They were accompanied by Alicia and went with the blessing of both her parents and the Duke and Duchess. Everyone was thrilled at the news of the engagement and the drawing rooms and salons of the county, once so full of vitriol against the rakish air, now sang the praises of a fairy tale romance. In London, Lily's mother welcomed her with open arms, and it was a tearful reunion for them both. Lily, Maximilian and Alicia remained in London, making preparations for the wedding. There was a great deal to do, and Lily was enjoying being a bride-to-be. I think it's lovely, Lily. It really is, Alicia said, as Lily stepped down from a large red plush stool where the modiste had been pinning up her dress. She and Alicia had been shopping, and they had visited a dozen dress shops on Bond Street that morning, where Lily had tried on all manner of dresses, settling on a modest design, with lace sleeves and a high neckline. It really did look very pretty, and with just a few alterations it would be ready. I'll take it, Lily said, and the modiste looked up at her and smiled. It's a big decision to choose a dress, miss, she said, and Lily smiled. But an even bigger decision to choose a husband. I'm very happy with both, she said, and the modiste laughed. Having placed the order and changed back into her own dress, Lily and Alicia left the shop and climbed into their waiting carriage. As they emerged, Lily noticed a woman across the street casting furtive glances this way and that. She recognised her as Lady Montague Scott, a socialite, well known for her loose favours. Do you know her? Alicia asked, as Lily peered out of the carriage window with interest. I know a great deal about her, yes though I don't know her personally, Lily replied. Alicia raised her eyebrows, and Lily continued to watch as now. A gentleman came sidling up to Lady Scott, slipping his arm around her and kissing her on the cheek. It was a bold and brazen move, and Lily gasped, recognising the man as Sir Douglas Fairfax, a man whose wife was very much alive. Goodness, Alicia said, her eyes growing wide. But Lily turned to her and smiled, shaking her head, as she realised what she had been about to think. Oh, let them get on with it. I don't care. It's not my business to write about such things, she said as the carriage drove off. Alicia shook her head. You really have changed, haven't you, Lily? she said, and Lily nodded. She had promised her mother as much, but she had promised herself too. Making money out of other people's downfall had left a sour taste in her mouth and having experienced it for herself, she was no longer interested in the thought of inflicting it on others. There were others who would do so, but it was their business and not hers, and if a scandal now presented itself, she would do just as she had done then and remind herself it was none of her business. It's one thing to write about scandals, but quite another to find yourself at the heart of one, she replied. Maximilian had been called away on business that morning but when they arrived back at the house, he was waiting for her, a grave expression on his face. Lily had been excited to tell him all about her chosen dress, but as she put her arms around him, he sighed, taking her hands in hers and looking at her anxiously. Lily? I'm afraid I've got some bad news for you, he said, and she looked at him curiously. 
What's happened? she asked, and he led her into the drawing room where her mother and an official-looking gentleman were sitting by the hearth. The gentleman rose, holding out his hand to Lily, who took it, glancing at her mother in confusion. Is something wrong? Has something happened? she asked, looking back at Maximilian, who sighed. This is Mr. Wexfordy, Lily. He's the governor of Lambeth Jail. He's come to offer his condolences. It's your father, Lily. He's dead, Maximilian said. Lily faltered. She did not know what to say or how to feel. She had not seen her father since that fateful day at Burnley Abbey. He had been returned to prison and appeared before the magistrates in connection with the attempt on Maximilian's life. His prison sentence had been extended indefinitely, and Lily had heard nothing from him, nor had she made any attempt to contact him. She stared at Maximilian in disbelief. But he wasn't sick, was he? she asked. The governor offered his condolences. Consumption, Miss Edge? He died of consumption. He'll be buried tomorrow, he said, reiterating his sorrow at her loss once again. Lily sat down on a chair by the door, and Alicia put her arm around her. It's all right to be upset, Lily, she whispered. There had been a time when the death of her father would have meant the death of all Lily's hopes and ambitions. She had idolised him, but now... I didn't know him, not really. He wasn't the man I thought him to be. I can't mourn for someone I didn't know, she said, glancing at her mother who sighed. Your father was a man no one really understood. He wore many masks, Lily, and we were all taken in by them. We can only off him to the merciful hands of God, she said, and Lily nodded. She would not hate her father, but she hoped he could now be at peace. He had brought misery to many and had set out only for his own gain and revenge. She would not mourn him, but tears still welled up in her eyes at thought of what he could have been had bitterness not choked the goodness from him. Maximilian came to put his arm around her. I'll come with you tomorrow, he said, and Lily nodded. She would go to the funeral. She would see her father buried, and that would be the end of the matter. He would leave no lasting legacy, and there would be no one to shed a tear for him, even as Lily brushed her own away. It feels strange to think of him gone, she said as the prison governor took his leave of them. It does. He was a man who held sway over many, and always for ill, I'm afraid to say, her mother said. The two of them had made their peace, and Lily had told her mother how sorry she was for the things she had said and the way she had always sided with her father. But he had been a master at manipulation, and her mother had told her she held no animosity for the past. They would rebuild their relationship, and her mother could not have been gladder at the prospect of her marrying Maximilian. Then we say goodbye to him, Lily said, looking up at Maximilian, who nodded. I'll write to my father and tell him. I'm sure he'll be interested to know, he said and Lily could only imagine the relief at Burnley Abbey when the news of Connor's death arrived. For as much as it hath pleased Almighty God of his great mercy to take unto himself the soul of our dear brother here departed, we therefore commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, the curate was saying as they stood around the grave. It was raining that day, the grey clouds skidding across the sky above, and the four of them, Lily, her mother, Maximilian and Alicia, were standing in the far corner of the churchyard, in the place reserved for the burial of criminals. The prisoner governor had come out of respect and was standing a short distance behind the clergyman, whose white surplice stood out starkly against the dark clouds behind. I don't feel anything, Lily said, after the final commendation had been made. She tossed a handful of dirt into the grave, the others doing the same as they turned to walk away. Maximilian put his arm around her. Perhaps you've buried more than the dead today, Lily, he replied. Lily did feel as though she had closed a chapter of her story, and that of many others too. For as long as her father had remained alive, his shadow would have cast itself over them all, 
and the threat of exposure remained. Lily did not know why he had not revealed the truth about William and his lineage. Perhaps deep down, a sense of guilt having overtaken him. Or perhaps he had realised there was nothing more to be gained from it. She hoped it was because her father had wanted her to be happy. A final act of contrition over a secret he now took to his grave. I think I have. You must feel relief, she said, but Maximilian shook his head. I only feel whatever you feel, Lily. And if you're glad he's gone, I'll be glad too. But he was your father, and I know you can't entirely hate him. It would be impossible to do so, he said, and Lily nodded. She could not be glad at her father's death, but neither could she mourn him either. Lily preferred to look to the future and the happiness she would enjoy without the shadows of the past looming over her. I think I'm ready to go home now. We've got a wedding to get ready for, she said, and looking up at him she smiled, knowing a new chapter in their lives was beginning. Maximilian and Lily explored the lengths one will go to uncover the truth and find solace in the arms of an unlikely companion. But what about Alicia? Can a selfless soul find a happy ending in a world where love is constantly tested by deception? Read Alicia and Ernest's story now by clicking here. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video, and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.